Section forty eight of London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. Volume one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Street Folk, part forty eight. Of the Street Sellers of Conundrums. Among the more modern street sales are conundrums, generally vended both in the shops and the streets as nuts to crack, when not in the form of books. This is another of the broad sheets, and is sufficiently clever and curious in its way. In the centre, at the top, is the wonderful picture, with the following description. This picture, when looked at from a particular point of view, will not only appear perfect in all respects and free from distortion, but the figures will actually appear to stand out in relief from the paper. The wonderful picture, which is a rude imitation of a similar toy picture sold in a box, with eyepiece complete, at the shops, presents a distorted view of a church spire, a lighthouse, a donjon keep, castellated buildings backed by mountains, a moat on which are two vessels, an arch surmounted by a Britannia, a palm tree, I presume, and a rampart or pier, or something that way, on which are depicted two figures with the gestures of elocutionists. The buildings are elongated, like shadows at sunset or sunrise. What may be the particular point of view announced in the description of the wonderful picture is not described in the nuts, but the following explanation is given in a little book published simultaneously and entitled The Nutcrackers, A Key to Nuts to Crack or Enigmatical Repository. The wonderful picture. Cut out a piece of cardboard two and a half inches long Make a round hole about the size of a pea in the top of it. Place this level with the right-hand side of the engraving, and just one and a half inches distant from it. Then apply your eye to the little hole, and look at the picture, and you will find that a beautiful symmetry pervades the landscape. There is not the slightest appearance of distortion, and the different parts appear actually to stand up in relief on the paper. Below the wonderful picture are other illustrations, and the border of the broadsheet presents a series of what may be called pictorial engravings. The first is, reader's note, within a line rectangle, capital D-I-O, followed by capital C, C, then 1, lately presented to a wise man by a usurper, end reader's note, the answer being evidently dioceses. Number 26 is, reader's note, in a line rectangle, a horizontal line pointed at the right-hand end and the left-hand ending in a small circle, and on the next line, A4, and on the next, 26, the child's tidy, end reader's note. Pin 4 is the solution. Of the next hieroglyphic, for a second title to the nuts tells of 200 hieroglyphics, enigmas, conundrums, curious puzzles, and other ingenious devices, I cannot speak very highly. It consists of A-I-M-E-R, note, a figure of a hare at full speed, end note, and E-K-A, answer, America. In the body of the broadsheet are the enigmas and so on announced of each of which I give a specimen to show the nature of this street performance or entertainment. Enigma 107 is, I've got no wings, yet in the air I often rise and fall. I've got no feet, yet clogs I wear, and shoes and boots and all. As the answer is football, the last two lines should manifestly have been placed first. The conundrums are next in the arrangement, and I cite one of them. Why are there, strictly speaking, only 325 days in the year? Because, is the reply, 40 of them are lent and never returned. The riddles follow in this portion of the nuts to crack. Of these, one is not very difficult to be solved, though it is distinguished for the usual grammatical confusion of tenses. A man has three daughters, and each of these have a brother. How many children had he? The charades complete the series. Of these I select one of the best. I am a word of letters seven. I'm sinful in the sight of heaven. 
To every virtue I'm opposed, Man's weary life I've often closed. If to me you prefix two letters more, I mean exactly what I meant before. The other parts of the letterpress consist of anagrams, transpositions, and so on. When a clever patterer works conundrums, for the trade is in the hands of the pattering class, he selects what he may consider the best, and reads or repeats them in the street, sometimes with and sometimes without the answer. But he does not cripple the probable quickness of his sale by a slavish adherence to what is in type. He puts the matter, as it were, personally. What gentleman is it, one man told me he would ask, in this street that has eyes like a saucer, a back like a box, a nose like a penknife, and a voice like a fox? You can learn for a penny, or sometimes I'll go on with the patter thus, he continued. What lady is it that we have all seen and who can say truly, I am brighter than day, I am swifter than light, and stronger than all the momentum of might. More than once people have sung out, the Queen, for they seem to think that the momentum of might couldn't fit anyone else. It's thought, as is the answer, but it wouldn't do to let people think it's anything of the sort. It must seem to fit somebody. If I see a tailor's name on a door, as soon as I've passed the corner of the street, and sometimes in the same street, I've asked, why is Mr. So-and-so, the busy tailor of this, or the next street, never at home? Because he's always cutting out. I have the same questions for other tradesmen, and for gentlemen and ladies in this neighbourhood, and no gammon, all for a penny. Nuts to crack, a penny. A pair of nutcrackers to crack em, only one penny. Sometimes this man, who perhaps is the smartest in the trade, will take a bolder flight still, and when he knows the residence of any professional or public man, he will, if the illusion be complimentary, announce his name, or, if there be any satire, indicate by a motion of the head or a gesture of the hand the direction of his residence. My ingenuous, and certainly ingenious, informant obliged me with a few instances. In Whitechapel Parish I've said, it ain't in the print, it was only in the patter, why won't the Reverend Mr. Champney's lay up treasures on earth, because he'd rather lay up treasures in heaven. That's the reverend's gentleman not far from this spot, but in this sheet, with nearly a hundred engravings by the first artists, only a penny, I have other questions for other parsons, not so easy answered, nuts as is hard to crack. Why is the reverend Mr. Popjoy, or the honourable lawyer Bully, or Judge Wiggum? And then I just jerks my thumb, sir if it's where I know or think such people live. Why is the Reverend Mr. Popjoy, or the others, like two balloons, one in the air to the east, and the t'other in the air to the west, in this parish of St. George's, Hanover Square? There's no such question, and as it's a sort of a cock, of course there's no answer. I don't know one, but a gentleman's servant once sung out, "'Cause he's uppish, and a man in a leather apron once said, "'He's a-raising the wind.' which was nonsense, but I like that sort of interruption, and have said, you'll not find that answer in the nutcrackers, only a penny, and Lord knows, I told the truth when I said so, and it helps a sale, no fear of anyone's finding out all what's in the sheet before I'm out of the drag, not a bit, and you must admit that anyway it's a cheap penneth. That it is a cheap, harmless pennyworth is undeniable. The street sale of conundrums is carried on most extensively during a week or two before Christmas, and on summer evenings, when the day's work is, or ought to be, over, even among the operatives of the slop employers. As the conundrum patterer requires an audience, he works the quieter streets, preferring such as have no horse thoroughfare, as in some of the approaches from the direction of Golden Square to Regent Street. The trade is irregularly pursued, none following it all the year, and from the best information I could acquire, it appears that fifteen men may be computed as working conundrums for two months throughout the twelve, and clearing ten shillings and sixpence weekly per individual. The cost of the nuts to crack, when new, is fivepence a dozen to the seller, but old nuts often answer the purpose of the street seller, and may be had for about half the price. The cost of the nut crackers, two shillings to two shillings and sixpence. 
It may be calculated, then, that to realise the ten shillings and sixpence, fifteen shillings must be taken. This shows the street expenditure in nuts to crack and nut crackers to be ninety pounds yearly. Of the street sellers of comic exhibitions, magical delusions, and so on. The street sale of comic exhibitions, properly so called, is, of course, as modern as the last autumn and winter and it is somewhat curious that the sale of any humorous or meant-to-be-humorous sheet of engravings is now becoming very generally known in the street sale as a comic exhibition. Among these, as I have before intimated, are many caricatures of the Pope, the Church of Rome, Cardinal Wiseman, the Church of England, the Bishop of London, or any bishop or dignitary, or of any characteristic of the conflicting creeds. In many of these, John Bull figures personally, and so does the devil. The comic exhibition proper is certainly a very cheap pennyworth. Number one is entitled The Ceremonial of the Opening of the Great Exhibition in 1851, with illustrations of the contributions of all nations. The contributions, however, are reserved for numbers two and three. Two larger cuts at the head of the broadsheet may be considered geographical as regards the first, and allegorical as regards the second. Table Bay presents a huge feeder, evidently, and the Cape of Good Hope is a spare man, obsequiously bowing to the table and its guest, in good hope of a dinner. Of the Sandwich Islands and of Hungary, the exhibition is of the same description, the second larger cut shows the Crystal Palace ascending by the agency of a balloon, a host of people of all countries looking on. Then comes the procession from Palace Yard to Hyde Park. The first figure in this procession is described as beefeaters piping hot and well puffed out, though there is but one beefeater, with head larger than his body and legs ridiculously small, as have nearly all the sequent figures smoking a pipe as if it were a trombone, duly followed by Her Majesty's spiritual bodyguard, five beef-eaters drunk, and by Prince Albert blowing his own trumpet from the back of a very sorry steed, with mops and brooms and a cook, ooh, a housemaid and cook, as his supporters. Then follow figures grotesque enough, of which the titles convey the character. A famous well in town, nay peer ye, humorous estimates, Mr. Hume, a Jew d'esprit, Mr. Disraeli, an exemplification of cupidity in pumice stone, Lord Palmerston, old geese, and young ducks, old and angry looking, and young and pretty women, some gentlemen who patronise Moses in the minories, certainly no credit to the skill of a tailor. A Jew lion, Monsieur Julien, fine high screams, ice creams, and capers, chorister boys and ballet girls. Heyday, you don't take advantage here, Joseph Aidy, and something to give the milk a head, a man with a horse's head on a tray. These, however, are but a portion of the figures. The comic exhibition sheet contains ninety such figures independent of those in the two cuts mentioned as headings. Galleries of comicalities, or series of figures sometimes satirically, sometimes grotesquely given without any aim at satire, are also sold by the same parties, and are often announced as a threepenny gallery for a penny, and dirt cheap at threepence, as big as a newspaper. Another broadsheet sold this winter in the streets is entitled optical and magical delusions, and was announced as dedicated to and prepared for His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, the only original copy. The engravings are six in number, and are in three rows, each accompanying engraving being reversed from its fellow. Where the head is erect on one side, it is downward on the other. The first figure is a short length of a very plain woman, while on the opposite side is that of a very plain man, both pleased and smirking, in accordance with the line below. Oh, what joy when our lips shall meet! 
Categorical is a spectacled and hooded cat. Dogmatical is a dog with the hat, wig, and cane once held proper to a physician. Cross purposes is an austere lady in a monster cap, while her opposite husband is pointing bitterly to a long bill. The purport of these figures is shown in the following. Directions. Paste all over the back of the sheet, and put a piece of thick paper between to stiffen it. Then fold it down the center, so that the marginal lines fall exactly at the back of each other, which may be ascertained by holding it to the light. Press it quite flat. When cut separately, they will make three cards. Shave them close to the margin. Then take a needle full of double thread and pass it through the dot at each end of the card. Cut the thread off about three inches long. By twisting the threads between your four fingers and thumbs, so as to spin the card round backwards and forwards with a rapid motion, the figures will appear to connect and form a pleasing delusion. Then there are the magical figures, or rude street imitations of Dr. Paris' ingenious toy called the Thormoscope. Beside these are what, at the first glance, appear mere black and very black marks, defining no object, but a closer examination shows the outlines of a face, or of a face and figure. Of such there are sometimes four on a broadsheet, but they are also sold separately, both in the streets and the small stationers' shops. When the white or black portion of the paper is cut away, for both colours are so prepared, what remains, by a disposition of the light, throws a huge shadow of a grotesque figure on the wall, which may be increased or diminished, according to the motions of the exhibitor. The shadow figures sold this winter by one of my informants were of Mr. and Mrs. Manning, the Queen, Prince Albert, the Princess Royal, and the Prince of Wales. But you see, sir, observed the man, the Queen and the Prince does for any father and mother, for she hasn't her crown on, and the Queen's kids for anybody's kids. I mention these matters more particularly, as it certainly shows something of a change in the winter evening's amusements of the children of the working classes. The principal street customers for these penny papers were mechanics, who bought them on their way home for the amusement of their families. Boys, however, bought almost as many. The sale of these papers is carried on by the same men as I have described working conundrums. A superior patterer, of course, shows that his magical delusions and magical figures combine all the wonders of the magic lantern and the dissolving views, and all for one penny. The trade is carried on only for a short time in the winter, as regards the magical portion, and I am informed that, including the comic exhibitions, it extends to about half of the sum taken for conundrums, or to about forty-five pounds. Of the street sellers of playbills. The sellers of playbills carry on a trade which is exceedingly uncertain and is little remunerative. There are now rather more than two hundred people selling playbills in London, but the number has sometimes been as high as four hundred. Yes, indeed, a theatrical gentleman said to me, and if a dozen more theatres were opened to-morrow, why, each would have more than its twenty bill-sellers the very first night. Where they come from or what they are, I haven't a notion. The majority of the playbill sellers are either old or young, the sexes being about equally engaged in this traffic. Some of them have followed the business from their childhood. I met with very few indeed who knew anything of theatres beyond the names of the managers and of the principal performers while some do not even enjoy that small modicum of knowledge, and some can neither read nor write. The boys often run recklessly alongside the cabs which are conveying persons to the theatre, and so offer their bills for sale. One of these youths said to me when I spoke of the danger incurred, The cabman knows how to do it, sir, when I runs and patters, and so does his horse. An intelligent cabman, however, who was in the habit of driving parties to the Lyceum, told me that these lads clung to his cab as he drove down to Wellington Street in such a way, for they seemed never to look before them, that he was in constant fear lest they should be run over. Ladies are often startled by a face appearing suddenly at the cab window, and through my glass, said my informant, a face would look dirtier than it really is. 
and certainly a face gliding along with the cab as it were no accompanying body being visible on a winter's night while the sound of the runner's footsteps is lost in the noise of the cab has much the effect of an apparition i did not hear of one person who had been in any way connected with the stage even as a supernumerary resorting to playbill selling when he could not earn a shilling within the walls of a theatre these bill sellers for the most part confined themselves as far as i could ascertain to that particular trade the youths say that they sometimes get a job in errand going in the daytime but the old men and women generally aver that they can do nothing else an officer who some years back had been on duty at a large theatre told me that at that time the women bill sellers earned a trifle in running errands for the women of the town who attended the theatres but as they were not permitted to send any communication into the interior of the house their earnings that way were insignificant for they could only send in messages by any other dress woman entering the theatre subsequently in the course of my inquiries last year i met with a lame woman of sixty-eight who had been selling playbills for the last twelve years she had been for six or eight months before she adopted the trade the widow of a poor mechanic a carpenter she had first thought of resorting to that means of a livelihood owing to a neighbouring old woman having been obliged to relinquish her post from sickness when my informant succeeded her in this way she said many persons succeeded to the business as the recognised old hands were jealous of and uncivil to any additional newcomers but did not object to a successor these parties generally know each other they murmur if the haymarket hands for instance resort to the lyceum for any cause or vice versa thus overstocking the business but they offer no other opposition the old woman further informed me that she commenced selling playbills at astley's and then realized a profit of four shillings per week when the old amphitheatre was burnt down she went to the victoria but business was not what it was and her earnings were from sixpence to one shilling a week less and this she said although the victoria was considered one of the most profitable stations for the playbill seller the box-keeper there seldom selling any bill in the theatre the boxes too at this house more frequently buy them outside another reason why business was better at the victoria than elsewhere was represented to me by a person familiar with the theatres to be this many go to the victoria who cannot read or who can read but imperfectly and they love to make believe they are good scholards by parading the consulting of a playbill on my visit the bill sellers at the victoria were two old women each a widow for many years two young men besides two or three though there are sometimes as many as six or seven children the old women fell into the business as successors by virtue of their predecessors leaving it on account of sickness the children were generally connected with the older dealers the young men had been in this business from boyhood some sticking to the practice of their childhood unto manhood or towards old age the number at the victoria is now i am informed two or three more as the theatre is often crowded the old woman told me that she had known two and even four visitors to the theatre club for the purchase of a bill and then she had sometimes to get farthings for them a young fellow who said he believed he was only eighteen but certainly looked older told me that he was in the habit of selling playbills but not regularly as he sometimes had a job in carrying a board or delivering bills at a corner or the likes of that he favoured me with his opinion of the merits of the theatres he was practically acquainted with as regarded their construction for the purposes of the bill seller his mother who had been dead a few years had sold bills and had put him into the business his ambition seemed to be to become a general bill sticker he could not write but could read very imperfectly fire you see sir he said there's sets off at the market hay market now there's this there's only one front so you may look sharp about for there goes boxes pit and gallery the delphi's as good that way and so is the surrey but them ones crowded too much 
the lyceums built shocking awkward fie the boxes is in one street and the pit in another and the gallery in another it's true sir the pit's the best customer in most theatres i think ashley's and the wick is both spoiled that way ashley's particular as the gallery's a good step from the pit and boxes at the wick it's round the corner but the shilling gallery ain't so bad at ashley's saddler's wells i never tried it's out of the way and i can't tell you much about the limpic or the strand the lane is middlin i don't know that either plays or actors makes much difference to me perhaps it's rather verser than it's anything wery prime as everybody seems to know everything about it aforehand no sir i can't say sir that mr macready did me much good i sometimes run along by a cab because i've got a sixpence from a swell for doing it stunning but wery seldom and i don't much like it though when you're at it you don't think of no fear i makes three shillings or rather more a week at bill selling and as much other vays i never saw a play but once at the wick i'd rather be at a free and heasy i don't know as i knows any of the actors or actresses either he's or she's the sellers of playbills purchase their stock of the printer at three shillings and fourpence the hundred or in that proportion for half or quarter hundreds if a smaller quantity be purchased the charge is usually thirteen for sixpence though they used to be only twelve for sixpence these sellers are among the poorest of the poor after they have had one meal they do not know how to get another they reside in the lowest localities and some few are abandoned and profligate in the character they reckon it a good night to earn one shilling clear but upon an average they clear but three shillings per week they lose sometimes by not selling out their nightly stock what they have left they are obliged to sell for waste paper at twopence per pound christmas easter and whitsuntide are generally their best times they will then make ninepence per night clear the printer of the playbills prints but a certain number the demand being nearly ascertained week by week these are all sold by the printer or some purpose appointed to the regular customers in preference to others but the irregulars can get supplied though often not without trouble the profit on all sold is rather more than cent per cent as i have intimated when some theatres are closed the bill sellers are driven to others and as the demand is necessarily limited a superflux of sellers affects the profits and then two shillings and sixpence is considered a good week's work during the opera season i am told a few mechanics out of work will sell bills there and books of the opera making about six shillings a week and doing better than the regular hands as they have a better address and are better clad taking the profits at three shillings a week at cent per cent on the outlay and reckoning two hundred sellers including those at the saloons concert rooms and so on we find that sixty pounds is now expended weekly on playbills purchased in the streets of london of the street sellers of periodicals pamphlets tracts books etc these street sellers are a numerous body and the majority of them show a greater degree of industry and energy than is common to many classes of street folk they have been for the most part connected with the paper newspaper or publishing trade and some of them have known better days one intelligent man i met with a dealer in waste note paper end note had been brought up as a compositor but late hours and glaring gaslights in the printing office affected his eyes he told me and as a half-blind compositor was about of as little value he thought as a horse with a wooden leg he abandoned his calling for out-of-door labour another had been a gunsmith and when out of his apprenticeship was considered a don hand at hair triggers for hair triggers were more wanted then but an injury to his right hand and arm had disabled him as a mechanic and he had recourse to the streets a third had been an ink maker's young man and had got to like the streets by calling for orders and delivering bottles of ink at the shops of the small stationers and chandlers and so he had taken to them for a living of the book stall-keepers i heard of one man who had died a short time before and who once had been in the habit of buying better books for his own pleasure than he had afterwards to sell for his bread of the bookstall proprietors i have afterwards spoken more fully all the street sellers in question 
are what street estimation pronounces to be educated men they can all as far as i could ascertain read and write and some of them were keenish politicians both free traders and against free trade when they was a-talking of the better days when they was young nearly all are married men with families the divisions into which these street traffickers may be formed are odd number sellers steamboat news vendors railway news vendors though the latter is now hardly a street traffic the sellers of second editions which i have already given as a portion of the patterers board workers also previously described and for the same reason tract sellers of whom i have given the number character and so on and who are regarded by the other street sellers as the idlers beggars and pretenders of the trade the sellers of children's books and song books book auctioneers and book stall keepers end of section forty eight section forty nine of london labour and the london poor by henry mayhew volume one this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley the street folk part forty nine of the street sale of back numbers this trade is carried on by the same class of patras as work race cards second editions and so on the collectors of waste paper frequently find back numbers of periodicals in a lot they may have purchased at a coffee shop these they sell to warehousemen who serve the street sellers the largest lot ever sold at one time was some six or seven years ago of the pictorial times at least a ton weight a dealer states i lost the use of this arm ever since i was three months old my mother died when i was ten years of age and after that my father took up with an irish woman and turned me and my youngest sister she was two years younger than me out into the streets my youngest sister got employment at my father's trade but i couldn't get no work because of my crippled arm i walked about till i fell down in the streets for want at last a man who had a sweetmeat shop took pity on me his wife made the sweetmeats and minded the shop while he went out a-juggling in the streets in the ramo sammy line he told me as how if i would go round the country with him and sell a few prints while he was a-juggling in the public houses he'd find me in whittles and pay my lodging i joined him and stopped with him two or three year after that i went to work for a very large waste paper dealer he used to buy up all the old back numbers of the cheap periodicals and penny publications and send me out with them to sell at a farden apiece he used to give me fourpence out of every shilling and i done very well with that till the periodicals came so low and so many on em that they wouldn't sell at all sometimes i could make fifteen shillings on a saturday night and a sunday morning a selling the odd numbers of periodicals such as tales tales of the wars lives of the pirates lives of the highwaymen and so on i've often sold as many as two thousand numbers on a saturday night in the new cut and the most of them was works about thieves and highwaymen and pirates besides me there was three others at the same business altogether i dare say my master alone used to get rid of ten thousand copies of such works on a saturday night and a sunday morning our principal customers was young men my master made a good bit of money at it he had been about eighteen years in the business and had begun with two shillings and sixpence i was with him fifteen year on and off and at the best time i used to earn my thirty shillings a week full at that time but then i was foolish and didn't take care of my money when i was at the odd number business i bought a peep show and left the trade to go into that line of the sale of waste newspapers at billingsgate this trade is so far peculiar that it is confined to billingsgate as in that market alone the demand supplies a livelihood to the man who carries it on his principal sale is of newspapers to the street fishmongers as a large surface of paper is required for the purposes of a fish stall the waste trade for waste and not waste paper is the word always applied is not carried on with such facility as might be expected for i was assured that waste is so scarce that only a very insufficient supply of paper can at present be obtained i hope things will change soon sir 
said one collector gravely to me, or I shall hardly be able to keep myself and my family on my waist. This difficulty, however, does not affect such a street seller as the man at Billingsgate, who buys of the collectors, collecting, however, a portion himself at the neighbouring coffee shops, public houses, and so on, for the wants of a regular customer must, by some means or other, be supplied. The Billingsgate paper seller carries his paper round, offering it to his customers, or to those he wishes to make purchases. Some fishmongers, however, obtain their waste first-hand from the collectors, or buy it at a newsagent's. The retail price varies from twopence to threepence halfpenny the pound, but threepence halfpenny is only given for very clean and prime, and perhaps uncut, newspapers. For when a news vendor has, as it is called, overstocked himself, he sells the uncut papers at last to the collector or the waste consumer. This happens, I was told, twenty times as often with the weeklies as the dailies. For, said my informant, suppose it's a wet Sunday morning, and all news vendors as does pray, prays for wet Sundays, because then people stays at home and buys a paper or some number to read and pass away the time. Well, sir, suppose it's a soaker in the morning, the newsman buys a good lot, an extra nine or two extra nines, or the like of that, and then maybe, after all, it comes out a fine day, and so he's overstocked, in which case there's some for the waste. When they consider it a favourable opportunity, the workers carry waste to offer to the Billingsgate salesman, but the chief trade is in the hands of the regular frequenter of the market. From the best information I could obtain, it appears that from seventy to one hundred pounds weight of waste, about three quarters being newspapers, of which some are foreign, is supplied to Billingsgate Market and its visitants. Two numbers of the Times, with their supplements, one paper buyer told me, when cleverly damped, and they're never particularly dry, will weigh about a pound. The average price is not less than twopence halfpenny a pound, or from that to threepence. A single paper is a penny. At twopence halfpenny per pound, and eighty-five pounds a day, upwards of two hundred and seventy-five pounds is spent yearly in waste paper at Billingsgate, in the street or open-air purchase alone. Of the sale of periodicals on the steamboats and steamboat piers, in this traffic are engaged about twenty men, when the days are light until eight o'clock, from ten to fifteen if the winter be a hard winter, and if the river steamers are unable to run, none at all. This winter, however, there has been no cessation in the running of the boats, except on a few foggy days. The steamboat paper sellers are generally traders on their own account. All, I believe, have been connected with the news vendors' trade. Some few are the servants of news vendors sent out to deal at the wharfs and on board the boats. The trade is not so remunerative that any payment is made to the proprietors of the boats or wharfs for the privilege of selling papers there, as in the case of the railways, but it is necessary to obtain leave from those who have authority to give it. The steamboat paper seller steps on board a few minutes before the boat starts, when there are a sufficient number of voyagers assembled. He traverses the deck and dives into the cabins, offering his papers, the titles of which he announces, Punch, penny punch, real punch, last number for threepence, comic sheets a penny, all the London periodicals, guide to the Thames. From one of these frequenters of steamboats for the purposes of his business, I had the following account. I was a news agent's boy, sir, near a pier, for three or four year, then I got a start for myself, and now I serve up here. It's not such a trade as you might think. Still, it's bread and cheese and a drop of beer. I go on board to sell my papers. It's seldom I sell a newspaper. There's no call for it on the river, except at the foreign-going ships. A few, as is sold to them. But I don't serve none on em. People read the news for nothing, at the coffee shops when they breakfast, I suppose, and goes on as if they took in the Times, Cron, and Tizer pubs we calls the tizer, all to their own cheek. It's penny works I sell the most of. Indeed, it's very seldom I offer anything else, cause it's little use. Penny punch is his fair sale, and I calls it punch, just punch. It's dead now, I believe, but there's old numbers. Still, they'll be done in time. 
the real punch i sell from six to twelve a week i call that there as the real punch galleries of comicalities is a middling sale people take them home with them i think guides to the thames is good in summer they're illustrated but people sometimes grumbles and calls them catchpennies it ain't my fault if they're not all that's expected but people expects everything for a penny joe miller's and stoffelies note mephistopheles end note i've sold and said they was oppositions to punch that's a year or more back but they was old and to be had cheap i sell lloyd's and reynolds pennies fairish both of them so's the family herald and the london journal very fair i don't venture on any three halfpenny books on anything like a speck because people says at once a penny i'll give you a penny i sell seven out of eight of what i do sell to gents more than that perhaps for you'll not often see a woman buy nothing what's intended to improve her mind a young woman like a maid of all work buys sometimes and looks hard at the paper but i sometimes think it's to show she can read a summer sunday's my best time out and out there's new faces then and one goes on bolder i've known young gents buy just to offer to young women i'm pretty well satisfied it's a introduction i have met with real gentlemen they've looked over all i offered for sale and then said nothing i want my good fellow but here's a penny for your trouble i wish there was more of them i do sincerely sometimes i've gone on board and not sold one paper i buy in the regular way ninepence for a dozen sometimes thirteen to the dozen of penny pubs i don't know what i make for i keep no count perhaps i solve in a good week and a half in another i am informed that the average earnings of these traders altogether may be taken at fifteen shillings weekly calculating that twelve carry on the trade the year through we find that assuming each man to sell at thirty-three per cent profit though in the case of old works it will be cent per cent upwards of one thousand five hundred pounds are expended annually in steamboat papers of the sale of newspapers books and so on at the railway stations although the sale of newspapers at the railway termini and so on cannot strictly be classed as a street sale it is so far an open-air traffic as to require some brief notice and it has now become a trade of no small importance the privilege of selling to railway passengers within the precincts of the terminus is disposed of by tender at present the news vendor on the northwestern line i am informed pays to the company for the right of sale at the euston square terminus and the provincial stations as large a sum as one thousand seven hundred pounds per annum the amount usually given is of course in proportion to the number of stations and the traffic of the railway the purchaser of this exclusive privilege sends his own servants to sell the newspapers and books which he supplies to them in the quantity required the men thus engaged are paid from twenty shillings to thirty shillings a week and the boys receive from six shillings to ten shillings and sixpence weekly but rarely ten shillings and sixpence all the morning and evening papers are sold at the station but of the weekly press those are sent for sale which in the manager's judgment are likely to sell or which his agent informs him are asked for it is the same with the weekly unstamped publications the reason seems obvious if there be more than can be sold a dead loss is incurred for the surplusage as regards newspapers is only saleable as waste paper the books sold at railways are nearly all of the class best known as light reading or what some account light reading the price does not often exceed one shilling and among the books offered for sale in these places are novels in one volume published at one shilling sometimes in two volumes at one shilling each monthly parts of works issued in weekly numbers shilling books of poetry but rarely political or controversial pamphlets one man who understood this trade told me that a few of the pamphlets about the pope and cardinal wiseman sold at first but in a month or six weeks people began to say a shilling for that i'm sick of the thing the large sum given for the privilege of an exclusive sale shows that the number of books and papers sold at railway stations must be very considerable but it must be borne in mind that the price and consequently the profit on the daily newspapers sold at the railways is greater than elsewhere none are charged less than sixpence the regular price at a newsagent's shop being fivepence 
so that as the cost price is fourpence the profit is double nor is it unusual for a passenger by an early train who grows impatient for his paper to cry out a shilling for the times this however is only the case i am told with those who start very early in the morning for the daily papers are obtained for the railway stations from among the earliest impressions and can be had at the accustomed price as early as six o'clock although if there were to be exciting news and a great demand a larger amount may be given of the street booksellers the course of my inquiry now leads me to consider one of the oldest and certainly not least important of the street traffics that of the bookstalls of these there are now about twenty in the london streets but in this number i include only those which are properly street stalls many bookstalls as in such a locality as the london road are appendages to shops being merely a display of wares outside the bookseller's premises and with these i do not now intend to deal the men in this trade i found generally to be intelligent they have been for the most part engaged in some minor department of the bookselling or newspaper trade in the regular way and are unconnected with the street sellers in other lines of whose pursuits habits and characters they seem to know nothing the street bookstalls are most frequent in the thoroughfares which are well frequented but which as one man in the trade expressed himself are not so shoppy as others such as the city road the new road and the old kent road if there's what you might call a recess observed another street bookstall keeper that's the place for us and you'll often see us along with flower stands and pinners up the stalls themselves do not present any very smart appearance they are usually of plain deal if the stock of books be sufficiently ample they are disposed on the surface of the stall fronts up as i heard it described with the titles when lettered on the back like as they are presented in a library if the front be unlettered as is often the case with the older books a piece of paper is attached and on it is inscribed the title and the price sometimes the description is exceeding curt has poetry french religious latin note i saw an odd volume in spanish of don quixote marked latin but it was at a shop-seller's stall end note pamphlets and such like or where it seems to have been thought necessary to give a somewhat fuller appellation such titles are written out as locke's understanding what's his mind or pope's rape if the stock be rather scant the side of the book is then shown and is either covered with white paper on which the title and price are written or brushed or else a piece of paper is attached with the necessary announcement sometimes these announcements are striking enough as where a number of works of the same size have been bound together which used to be the case i am told more frequently than it is now or where there has been a series of stories in one volume one such announcement was smollett's peregrine pickle captain kidd pirate prairie rob of the bowl barnfield moor care you two shillings alongside this miscellaneous volume was wilberforce's practical view of christianity one shilling fenelon's aventure de telemaque plates ninepence Aris de predestinazione one shilling note the last mentioned work which at the first glance seemed as if it were an odd mixture of french and latin was a latin quarto end note coronis ad collationem hagiensum and so on and so on guglielmo amessio another work on another stall had the following description lord mount edgecombe's opera what is currency what scripture history thoughts on taxation only one shilling and threepence another was knickerbocker bacon one shilling as a rule however the correctness with which the work is described is rather remarkable at some few of the street stalls and at many of the shop stalls are boxes containing works marked all one penny or twopence threepence or fourpence among these are old court guides parliamentary companions railway plans and a variety of sermons and theological as well as educational and political pamphlets to show the character of the publications thus offered not perhaps as a rule but generally enough for sale i copied down the titles of some at one penny and twopence all these at a penny 
Letters to the Right Honourable Lord John Russell on State Education by Edward Baines, Jr. A pastoral letter to the clergy and members of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America. A letter to the Protestant dissenters of England and Wales by the Reverend Robert Ainsley. Friendly advice to conservatives. Elementary thoughts on the principles of currency and wealth and on the means of diminishing the burthens of the people by J. D. Bassett, Esquire, price two shillings and sixpence. The others were each published at one shilling. All these at twopence. Poems by Eleanor Tatlock, 1811, two volumes, nine shillings. Two sermons on the fall and final restoration of the Jews by the Reverend John Stuart. Thoughts and feelings by Arthur Brooke, 1820. The amours of Philander and Sylvia, being the third and last part of love letters between a nobleman and his sister. Volume the second, the seventh edition, London. From a cursory examination of the last mentioned twopenny volume, I could see nothing of the nobleman or his sister. It is one of an inane class of books, originated, I believe, in the latter part of the reign of Charles the Second. Such publications professed to be, and some few were, records of the court and city scandal of the day, but in general they were works founded on the reputation of the current scandal. In short, to adopt the language of patterers, they were cocks issued by the publishers of that period, and they continued to be published until the middle of the eighteenth century, or a little later. I notice this description of literature the more, particularly as it is still frequently to be met with in street sale. There's oft enough, one street bookseller said to me, works of that sort making up a lot at a sale, and in very respectable rooms, as if they were make-weights or to make up a sufficient number of books, and so they keep their hold in the streets. As many of my readers may have little, if any, knowledge of this class of street-sold works, I cite a portion of the epistle dedicatory and a specimen of the style of Philander and Sylvia to show the change in street as well as in general literature, as no such works are now published. To the Lord Spencer, my lord, when a new book comes into the world, the first thing we consider is the dedication, and according to the quality and humour of the patron, we are apt to make a judgment of the following subject. If to a statesman we believe it grave and politic, if to a gown man, law or divinity, if to the young and gay, love and gallantry, by this rule I believe the gentle reader, who finds your lordship's name prefixed before this, will make as many various opinions of it as they do characters of your lordship, whose youthful sallies have been the business of so much discourse, and which, according to the relator's sense or good nature, is either aggravated or excused, though the woman's quarrel to your lordship has some more reasonable foundation than that of your own sex, for your lordship, being formed with all the beauties and graces of mankind, all the charms of wit, youth, and sweetness of disposition, derived to you from an illustrious race of heroes, adapting you to the noblest love and softness, they cannot but complain on that mistaken conduct of yours that so lavishly deals out those agreeable attractions, squandering away that youth and time on many which might be more advantageously dedicated to some one of the fair, and by a liberty which they call not being discreet enough rob them of all the hopes of conquest over that heart which they believe can fix nowhere. They cannot caress you into tameness, or, if you sometimes appear so, they are still upon their guard with you, for, like a young lion, you are ever apt to leap into your natural wildness, the greatness of your soul disdaining to be confined to lazy repose, though the delicacy of your person and constitution so absolutely require it your lordship not being made for diversions so rough and fatiguing as those your active mind would impose upon it. The last sentence is very long, so that a shorter extract may serve as a specimen of the staple of this bookmaking. To Philander, false and perjured as you are, I languish for a sight of you, and conjure you to give it me as soon as this comes to your hands. Imagine not that I have prepared those instruments of revenge that are so justly due to your perfidy, but rather that I have yet too tender sentiments for you, in spite of the outrage you have done my heart, and that for all the ruin you have made I still adore you, and though I know you are now another's slave, 
yet i beg you would vouchsafe to behold the spoils you have made and allow me this recompense for all to say here was the beauty i once esteemed though now she is no more philander's sylvia having thus described what may be considered the divisional parts of this stall trade i proceed to the more general character of the class of books sold of the character of books of the street sale there has been a change and in some respects a considerable change in the character or class of books sold at the street stalls within the last forty or fifty years as i have ascertained from the most experienced men in the trade now sermons or rather the works of the old divines are rarely seen at these stalls or if seen are rarely purchased black letter editions are very unfrequent at street bookstalls and it is twenty times more difficult i am assured for street sellers to pick up anything really rare and curious than it was in the early part of the century one reason assigned for this change by an intelligent street seller was that black letter or any ancient works were almost all purchased by the second-hand booksellers who have shops and issue catalogues as they had a prompt sale for them whenever they could pick them up at book auctions or elsewhere ay indeed said another bookstall keeper anything scarce or curious when it's an old book is kept out of the streets if it's not particular decent sir note with a grin end note why it's reckoned all the more curious that's the word sir i know curious i can tell how many beans make five as well as you or anybody why now there's a second-hand bookseller not a hundred miles from hoban and a pleasant nice man he is and does a respectable business and he puts to the end of his catalogue they all have catalogues that's in a good way two pages that he calls facetiae they're titles and prices of queer old books in all languages indecent books indeed he sends his catalogues to a many clergymen and learned people and to any that he thinks wouldn't much admire seeing his facetiae he pulls the last leaf out and sends his catalogue looking finished without it those last two pages aren't at all the worst part of his trade among buyers that's worth money in one respect a characteristic of this trade is unaltered i allude to the prevalence of odd volumes at the cheaper stalls not the odd volumes of a novel but more frequently of one of the essayists the spectator especially one stallkeeper told me that if he purchased an old edition of the spectator in eight volumes he could more readily sell it in single volumes at fourpence each than sell the eight volumes altogether for two shillings or even one shilling and fourpence though this was but twopence a volume there's nothing in my trade said one street bookseller with whom i conversed on the subject that sells better or indeed so well as english classics i can't offer to draw fine distinctions and i'm just speaking of my own plain way of trade but i call english classics such work as the spectator tatler guardian adventurer rambler rasselas the vicar of wakefield peregrine pickle tom jones goldsmith's histories of greece rome and england they all sell quick enfield speaker mixed plays the sentimental journey no sir tristram shandy rather hangs on hand the pilgrim's progress but it must be sold very low robinson crusoe philip quarles telemachus gil Blas, and junius's letters i don't remember more at this moment such as are of good sale i haven't included poetry because i'm speaking of english classics and of course they must be oldish works to be classics concerning the street sale of poetical works i learned from street booksellers that their readiest sale was of volumes of shakespeare pope thompson goldsmith cooper burns byron and scott you must recollect sir said one dealer that in nearly all those poets there's a double chance for sale at bookstalls for what with old editions and new and cheap editions there's always plenty in the market and very low no i can't say i could sell milton as quickly as any of those mentioned nor hudibras nor young's night thoughts nor prior nor dryden nor gay's fables it's seldom that we have any works of hood or shelley or coleridge or wordsworth or more at street stalls you don't often see them i think at booksellers stalls for they're soon picked up poetry sells very fair take it altogether 
Another dealer told me that from twenty to thirty years ago there were at the street stalls a class of works rarely seen now. He had known them in all parts and had disposed of them in his own way of business. He specified the Messiah, Klopstocks, as of this class, the Death of Abel, the Castle of Otranto, but that scene occasionally still, he observed, the Old English Baron, and that scene still too, but nothing to what it were once, the Young Man's Best Companion, Zimmerman on Solitude, and Burke on the Sublime and Beautiful, but I have that yet sometimes. These works were of heavy sale in the streets, and my informant thought they had been thrown into the street trade because the publishers had not found them saleable in the regular way. I was dead sick of the death of Abel, observed the man, before I could get out of him. Occasionally are to be seen at most of the stalls works of which the majority of readers have heard, but may not have met with. Among such I saw Laura by Kapel Hloft, four volumes, one shilling and sixpence, Darwin's Botanic Garden, two shillings, Alfred, an epic poem, by H. J. Pye, poet laureate, tenpence, Coelebs, In Search of a Wife, two volumes in one, one shilling. The same informant told me that he had lived near an old man who died twenty-five years ago, or it might be more, with whom he was somewhat intimate. This old man had been all his life familiar with the street trade in books, which he had often hawked, a trade now almost unknown. His neighbour had heard him say that fifty to seventy years ago he made his two guineas a week without distressing himself, meaning, I was told, that he was drinking every Monday at least. This old man used to tell that in his day the whole duty of man and the tale of a tub and Pomfret's poems and Pamela and Sir Charles Grandison went off well, but Pamela the best. And I've heard the old man say, sir, I was further told, how he had to tread his shoes straight about what books he showed publicly. He sold Tom Paine on the sly. If anybody bought a book and would pay a good price for it, three times as much as was marked, he'd give the age of reason in. I never see it now, but I don't suppose anybody would interfere if it was offered. A sly trade's always the best for paying and for selling, too. The old fellow used to laugh and say his stall was quite a godly stall, and he wasn't often without a copy or two of the Anti-Jacobin Review, which was all for church and state and all that, though he had Tom Paine in a drawer. The books sold at the street stalls are purchased by the retailers either at the auctions of the regular trade, or at chance, or general auctions, or of the Jews or others who may have bought books cheap under such circumstances. Often, however, the stallkeeper has a market peculiarly his own. It is not uncommon for working men or tradesmen, if they become beaten down and poor, to carry a basketful of books to a stallkeeper and say, here, give me half a crown for these. One man had forty parts, each issued at one shilling, of a Bible offered to him at one penny a part by a mechanic who could not any longer afford to take them in, and was at last obliged to sell off what he had. Of course, such things are nearly valueless when imperfect. Very few works are bought for street stall sale of the regular booksellers. End of section 49「Section 50 of London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Street Folk, Part 50. Of the Experience of a Street Bookseller. I now give a statement, furnished to me by an experienced man, as to the nature of his trade and the class of his customers. Most readers will remember having seen an account in the life of some poor scholar, having read, and occasionally, in spite of the remonstrances of the stallkeeper, some work which he was too needy to purchase, and even of his having read it through at intervals. That something of this kind is still to be met with will be found from the following account. "'My customers, sir, are of all sorts,' my informant said. "'They're gentlemen on their way from the city that have to pass along here by the city road, bankers' clerks, very likely, or insurance office clerks, or such like. They're fairish customers, but they often screw me.' 
why only last month a gentleman i know very well by sight and i see him pass in his brougham in bad weather took up an old latin book if i remember right it was an odd volume of a french edition of horace and though it was marked only eightpence it was long before he would consent to give more than sixpence and i never should have got my price if i hadn't heard him say quite hastily when he took up the book the very thing i've long been looking for mechanics are capital customers for scientific or trade books such as suit their business and so they often are for geography and history and some for poetry but they're not so screwy i know a many such who are rare ones for searching into knowledge women buy very little of me in comparison to men sometimes an odd novel in one volume when it's cheap such as the pilot or the spy or the farmer of inglewood forest or the monk no doubt some buy the monk not knowing exactly what sort of a book it is but just because it's a romance but some young men buy it i know because they have learned what sort it's like old three vol novels won't sell at all if they're ever so cheap boys very seldom buy of me unless it's a work about pigeons or something that way i can't say that odd vols of annual registers are anything but a bad sale but odd vols of old mags magazines a year or half year bound together are capital old london mags or ladies or oxford and cambridges or town and countries or universals or monthly reviews or humorists or ramblers or europeans or any of any sort that's from forty to a hundred years old no matter what they are go off rapidly at from one shilling and sixpence to three shillings and sixpence each according to size and binding and condition odd numbers of mags are good for little at a stall the old mags in vols are a sort of reading a great many are very fond of lives of the princess charlotte are already penny enough so are queen caroline's but not so good dictionaries of all kinds are nearly as selling as the old mags and so are good latin books french are only middling not so well as you might think my informant then gave me a similar account to what i had previously received concerning english classics and proceeded old religious books they're a fair trade enough but they're not so plentiful on the stalls now and if they're black letter they don't find their way from the auctions or anywhere to any places but the shops or to private purchasers mrs rowe's knowledge of the heart goes off if old bibles and prayer books and hymn books are very bad note this may be accounted for by the cheapness of these publications when new and by the facilities afforded to obtain them gratuitously End note. annuals are dull in going off very much so though one might expect different i can hardly sell keepsakes at all children's books such as are out one year at two shillings and sixpence apiece very nicely got up sell finally next year at the stalls for from sixpence to tenpence genteel people buy them of us for presents at holiday times they'll give an extra penny quite cheerfully if there's price two shillings and sixpence or price three shillings and sixpence lettered on the back or part of the title page school books in good condition don't stay long on hand especially pinnocks there's not a few people who stand and read and read for half an hour or an hour at a time it's very trying to the temper when they take up room that way and prevent others seeing the works and never lay out a penny themselves but they seem quite lost in a book well i'm sure i don't know what they are some seem very poor judging by their dress and some seem shabby genteels i can't help telling them when i see them going that i'm much obliged and i hope that perhaps next time they'll manage to say thank you for they don't open their lips once in twenty times i know a man in the trade that goes dancing mad when he has customers of this sort who aren't customers i dare say one day with another i earn three shillings a year through wet days are greatly against us for if we have a cover people won't stop to look at a stall perhaps the rest of my trade earn the same this man told me that he was not unfrequently asked and by respectable people for indecent works but he recommended them to go to holywell street themselves he believed that some of his fellow traders did supply such works but to no great extent an elderly man who had known the street book trade for many years but was not concerned in it when i saw him told me that he was satisfied he had sold old books old plays often to charles lamb whom he described as a stuttering man who when a book suited him sometimes laid down the price and smiled and nodded 
and then walked away with it in his pocket or under his arm, without a word having been exchanged. When we came to speak of dates, I found that my informant, who had only conjectured that this was Lamb, was unquestionably mistaken. One of the best customers he ever had for anything old or curious, and in Italian, if he remembered rightly, as well as in English, was the late Reverend Mr. Scott, who was chaplain on board the Victory at the time of Nelson's death at Trafalgar. "'He had a living in Yorkshire, I believe it was,' said the man, "'and used to come up every now and then to town. I was always glad to see his white head and rosy face, and to have a little talk with him about books and trade, though it wasn't always easy to catch what he said, for he spoke quick and not very distinct.' but he was a pleasant old gentleman, and talked to a poor man as politely as he might to an admiral. He was very well known in my trade, as I was then employed. The same man once sold to a gentleman, he told me, and he believed it was somewhere about twenty-five years ago, if not more, a Spanish or Portuguese work, but what it was he did not know. It was marked one shilling and ninepence, being a good-sized book, but the stallkeeper was tired of having had it a long time, so that he gladly would have taken ninepence for it. The gentleman in question handed him half a crown, and, as he had not the change, the purchaser said, Oh, don't mind, it's worth far more than half a crown to me. When this liberal customer had walked away, a gentleman who had been standing at the stall all the time, and who was an occasional buyer, said, Do you know him? And on receiving an answer in the negative, he rejoined, That's Southey. Another stallkeeper told me that his customers, some of whom he supplied with any periodical in the same way as a news vendor, had now and then asked him, especially the ladies of the family, who glanced when they passed at the contents of his stall, why he had not newer works. I tell them, said the stallkeeper, that they haven't become cheap enough yet for the streets, but they would come to it in time. After some conversation about his trade, which only confirmed the statements I have given, he said laughingly, Yes, indeed, you all come to such as me at last. Why, last night I heard a song about all the stateliest buildings coming to the ivy, and I thought as I listened, it was the same with authors. The best that the best can do is the bookstall's food at last, and no harm, for he's in the best of company, with Shakespeare and all the great people. Calculating fifteen shillings weekly as the average earnings of the street bookstall keepers, for further information induces me to think that the street bookseller who earned eighteen shillings a week regularly cleared it by having a tidy pitch, and reckoning that to clear such an amount the bookseller takes at least one pound eleven shillings and sixpence weekly, we find five thousand four hundred and sixty guineas yearly expended in the purchase of books at the purely street stalls independently of what is laid out at the open-air stalls connected with bookshops. Of Street Book Auctioneers The sale of books by auction in the streets is now inconsiderable and irregular. The auctioning of books, I mean of new books, some of which were published principally with a view to their sale by auction, was, thirty to forty years ago, systematic and extensive. It was not strictly a street sale. The auctioneer offered his books to the public, nine cases out of ten, in town, in an apartment, now commonly known as a mock auction room, which was so far a portion of the street that access was rendered easier by the removal of the door and window of any room on a ground floor, and some of the bidders could and did stand in the street and take part in the proceedings. In the suburbs, which at that period were not so integral a portion of the metropolis as at present, the book auction sales were carried on strictly in the open air, generally in front of a public house, and either on a platform erected for the purpose or from a covered cart, the books then being deposited in the vehicle, and the auctioneer standing on a sort of stage placed on the propped-up shafts. In the country, however, the auction was often carried on in an inn, the works thus sold were generally standard works. The poems were those of Pope, Young, Thompson, Goldsmith, Falconer, Cooper, and so on. The prose writings were such works as The Pilgrim's Progress, The Travels of Mr. Lemuel Gulliver, Johnson's Lives of the Poets, The Vicar of Wakefield, the most popular of the works of Defoe, Fielding, and Smollett, and Hervey's Meditations Among the Tombs. 
at one time highly popular. These books were not correctly printed. They were printed, too, on inferior paper, and the frontispiece, when there was a frontispiece, was often ridiculous. But they certainly gave to the public what is called an impetus for reading. Some were published in London, chiefly by the late Mr. Tegg, who at one time, I am told, himself offered to public competition, by auction, the works he published. Others were printed in Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Newcastle-upon-Tyne, Ipswich, Bungie, and so on. One of my informants remembered being present at a street sale about twenty or thirty years ago. He perfectly remembered, however, the oratory of the auctioneer, of whom he purchased some books. The sale was in one of the streets in Stoke Newington, a door or two from a thoroughfare. My informant was there, as he called it, accidentally, and knew little of the neighbourhood. The auctioneer stood at the door of what appeared to have been a coach-house, and sold his books, which were arranged within, very rapidly. Byron, he exclaimed, Lord Byron's latest and best poems, sixpence, sixpence, eightpence, I take penny bids under a shilling, eightpence for the poems written by a lord, gone, yours, sir, to my informant. The auctioneer, I was told, spoke very rapidly and clipped many of his words. The work thus sold consisted of some of Byron's minor poems. It was in the pamphlet form and published, I have no doubt, surreptitiously for there was in those days a bold and frequent piracy of any work which was thought distasteful to the government, or to which the court of chancery might be likely to refuse the protection of the law of copyright. The auctioneer went on. Cooper, Cooper, published at three shillings and sixpence as printed on the back, superior to Byron, Cooper's task. No bidders? Thank you, sir. One and six, yours, sir. Young, Young's Night Thoughts, Life, Death and Immortality, great subjects, London edition, marked three shillings and sixpence, going, last bit of two shillings, gone. The purchaser then complained that the frontispiece, a man seated on a tombstone, was exactly the same as to a copy he had of Hervey's Meditations, but the auctioneer said it was impossible. I have thus shown what was the style and nature of the address of the street book auctioneer formerly to the public. If it were not strictly patter or pompous oration, it certainly partook of some of the characteristics of patter. At present, however, the street book auctioneer may be described as a true patterer. It will be seen from the account I have given that the books were then really sold by auction, knocked down to the highest bidder. This, however, was and is not always the case. Legally, to sell by auction necessitates the obtaining of a license at an annual cost of five pounds, and if the bookseller conveys his stock of books from place to place, a hawker's license is required as well, which entails an additional expenditure of four pounds. The itinerant bookseller evades, or endeavours to evade, the payment for an auctioneer's license by putting up his books at a high price, and himself decreasing the terms, instead of offering them at a low price and allowing the public to make a series of advances. Thus a book may be offered by a street auctioneer at half a crown, two shillings, eighteen pence, a shilling, ten pence, and the moment anyone assents to a specified sum, the volume handed to him, so that there is no competition, no bidding by the public one in advance of another. Auction, however, is resorted to as often as the bookseller dares. One experienced man in the bookstall trade calculated that twenty years ago there might be twelve book auctioneers in the streets of London, or rather of its suburbs. One of these was a frequenter of the Old Kent Road, another Newington Way, and a third resorted to any likely pitch in Pimlico, all selling from a sort of van. Of these twelve, however, my informant thought that there were never more than six in London at one time, as they were all itinerant and they have gradually dwindled down to two, who are now not half their time in town. These two traders are brothers, and sell their books from a sort of platform erected on a piece of waste ground, or from a barrow. The works they sell are generally announced as new, and are often uncut. They are all recommended as explanatory of every topic of the day, and are often set forth as spicy. Three or four years ago, a gentleman told me how greatly he was amused with the patter of one of these men, who was selling books at the entrance of a yard full of caravans, not far from the school for the blind, Lambeth. 
one work the street auctioneer announced at the top of his voice in the following terms as far as a good memory could retain them the rambler now you rambling boys now you young devils that's been staring those pretty girls out of countenance here's a very book for you and more shame for you and perhaps for me too but i must sell i must do business if any lady or gentleman will stand treat to a glass of brandy and water warm with i'll tell more about this rambler i'm too bashful as it is who bids fifteen pence thank you sir sold again the rambler was dr johnson's the last time one of my informants heard the patter of the smartest of the two brothers it was to the following effect here is the history of the real flying dutchman and no mistake no fiction i assure you upon my honour published at ten shillings who bids half a crown sixpence thank you sir ninepence going going any more gone a book stallkeeper who had sold goods to a book auctioneer and attended the sales told me he was astonished to hear how his own books old new books he called them were set off by the auctioneer why there was a vole lettered pamphlets and i think there was something about jack shepherd in it but it was all odds and ends of other things i know here's the real jack shepherd sings out the man and no gammon the real edition no spooniness here but set off with other interesting histories valuable for the rising generation and all generations this is the real jack this will put you up to the time of day nix my dolly pals bid away then he went on goldsmith's history of england continued by the first writers of the day to the very last rumpus in the palace and no mistake here it is genuine well sir the storekeeper continued the man didn't do well perhaps he cleared one shilling and sixpence or a little more that evening on books people laughed more than they bought but it's no wonder the trade's going to the dogs they're not allowed to have a pitch now i shouldn't be surprised if they was not all driven out of london next year it's contrary to act of parliament to get an honest living in the streets nowadays a man connected with the street book trade considered that if one of these auctioneers earned a guinea in london streets in the six days it was a good week half a guinea was nearer the average he thought looking at the weather and everything what amount is expended to enable this street dealer to earn his guinea or half guinea is so uncertain from the very nature of an auction that i can obtain no data to rely upon the itinerant book auctioneer is now confined chiefly to the provincial towns and especially the country markets the reason for this is correctly given in the statement above cited the street auction requires the gathering of so large a crowd that the metropolitan police consider the obstruction to the public thoroughfare warrants their interference the two remaining book auctioneers in london generally restrict their operations to the outskirts the small space which fronts the george inn in the commercial road and which lays a few yards behind the main thoroughfare and similar suburban retreats being favourite pitches the trade is as regards profits far from bad the books sold consisting chiefly of those picked up in cheap lots at the regular auctions so that what fetches sixpence in the streets has generally been purchased for less than a penny the average rate of profit may be taken at two hundred and fifty pounds per cent at the least exorbitant however as this return may appear still it should be remembered that the avocation is one that can be pursued only occasionally and that solely in fine weather books are now more frequently sold in the london streets from barrows this change of traffic has been forced upon the street sellers by the commands of the police that the men should keep moving hence the well-known light form of street conveyance is now fast superseding not only the book auctioneer but the book stall in the london streets of these book barrow men there is now about fifty trading regularly in the metropolis and taking on an average from three shillings to five shillings and sixpence a day of the street sale of song books and of children's books the sale of song books in the streets at one penny and a halfpenny each is smaller than it was two years ago one reason that i heard assigned was that the penny song books styled the universal song book the national the bijou and so on were reputed to be so much alike the same songs under a different title 
that people who had bought one book were averse to buy another. There's the Ross and the Sam Hall songbooks, said one man. The eighteenth series, and I don't know what, but I don't like to venture on working them, though they're only a penny. There's lots to be seen in the shop windows, but they might be stopped in the streets, for they ain't decent, especially the flash ones. One of the books which a poor man had found the most saleable is entitled The Great Exhibition Songbook, a collection of the newest and most admired songs, embellished with upwards of one hundred toasts and sentiments. The toasts and sentiments are given in small type, as a sort of border to the thirty-two pages of which the book consists. The toast on the title page is as follows. I'll toast England's daughters, let all fill their glasses, whose beauty and virtue the whole world surpasses. To show the nature of the songs in street demand, I cite those in the book. The Gathering of the Nations, Bloom is on the Rye, Wilt thou meet me there, love? Minna's Tomb, I'll love thee ever dearly, note Arnold, end note. When Phoebus wakes the rosy hours, Money is your friend, Julia and Caspar, note G. M. Lewis, end note. That pretty word, yes, note E. Mikey, end note. Farewell, Forget Me Not, The Queen and the Navy, note, music published by H. White, Great Marlborough Street, end note. I Resign Thee Every Token, note, music published by Duff and Co., end note. Sleep, Gentle Lady, A Serenade, note, H. J. Payne, end note. The Warbling Wagoner, The Keepsake, A Sequel to the Cavalier, There's Room Enough for All, note, Music at Mr. Davidson's, end note. Will you come to the Dale, Larry O'Brien, Woman's Love, Afloat on the Ocean, note, sung by Mr. Weiss in the opera of the Heart of Midlothian, music published by Jefferies, Soho Square, end note. Together, dearest, let us fly, note, sung by Mr. Braham in the opera of the Heart of Midlothian, music published by Jefferies, Soho Square, end note. The Peremptory Lover, Note, tune, John Anderson, my Joe, end note. There are forty-seven songs in addition to those whose titles I have quoted, but they are all of the same character. The Penny Song Books, which are partly indecent, and entitled the Sam Hall and Ross Songsters, are seldom or never sold in the streets. Many of those vended in the shops outrage all decency, some of these are styled the Coal Hole Companion, Cider Cellar Songs, Captain Morris's Songs, and so on. Note, the filthiest of all, end note. These are generally marked one shilling and sold at sixpence, and have a coloured folded frontispiece. They are published chiefly by H. Smith, Holywell Street. The titles of some of the songs in these works are sufficient to indicate their character. The Muff the Two Miss Thighs, George Robbins' Auction, The Woman That Studied the Stars, A Rummy Chaunt, note, frequently with no other title, end note, The Amiable Family, Joe Buggins' Wedding, Stop the Cart, The Mot That Can Feel for Another, The Irish Giant, Taylor Tim, The Squire and Patty. Some titles are unprintable. The children's books in best demand in the street trade are those which have long been popular, Cinderella, Jack the Giant Killer, Baron Munchausen, Puss and the Seven Leagued Boots, The Sleeping Beauty, The Seven Champions of Christendom, and so on and so on. There's plenty of Henry and Emma's, said a penny bookseller, and a present for Christmas, and pictorial alphabets, and good books for good boys and girls but when people buys really for their children, they buys the old stories. At least they does of me. I've sold penny hymns, note, hymn books, end note, sometimes, but when they're bought, or good books is bought, it's from charity to a poor fellow like me more than anything else. The trade, both in songs and in children's books, is carried on in much the same way as I have described of the almanacs and memorandum books but occasionally the singers of ballads sell books. Sometimes poor men, old or infirm, offer them in a tone which seems a whine for charity rather than an offer for sale. 
buy a penny book of a poor old man, very hungry, very hungry. Children do the same, and all far more frequently in the suburbs than in the busy parts of the metropolis. Those who purchase really for the sake of the books, say, one street seller told me, give me something that'll interest a child and set him a-thinking. They can't understand, poor little things, your fine writing. Do you understand that? Another man had said, Fairy tales, bring me nothing but fairies. They set children a-reading. The price asked is most frequently a penny, but some are offered at a halfpenny, which is often given, without a purchase, out of compassion, or to be rid of importunity. The profit is at least cent per cent. Of the street sellers of account books. The sale of account books is in the hands of about the same class of street sellers as the stationery, but one man in the trade thought the regular hands were more trusted, if anything, than street stationers. People, you see, he said, won't buy their accounts of raff. They won't have them of any but respectable people. The books sold are bought at four shillings the dozen, or fourpence halfpenny a piece, up to seventy shillings the dozen, or five shillings and ninepence, or six shillings a piece. It is rarely, however, that the street account bookseller gives four shillings and ninepence, and very rarely that he gives as much as five shillings and ninepence for his account books. His principal sale is of the smaller waste, or day books, kept by the petty traders, the average price of these being one shilling and ninepence. The principal purchasers are the chandlers, butchers, and so on, in the quieter streets, and more especially, a little way out of town, where there ain't so many cheap shops. A man, now a street stationer with a fixed pitch, had carried on the account book trade until an asthmatic affliction compelled him to relinquish it, as the walking became impossible to him and he told me that the street trade was nothing to what it once was. People, he said, aren't so well off, I think, sir, and they'll buy half a quire of outside foolscap, or outside post, for from fivepence to eightpence, and stitch it together and rule it and make a book of it. Rich tradesmen do that, sir. I bought of a stationer some years back, and he told me that he was a relation of a rich grocer, and had befriended him in his the grocer's youth, but he wouldn't buy account books, for he said the makeshift books that his shopman stitched together for him opened so much easier. People never want a good excuse for acting shabby. There are now, I am informed, twelve men selling account books daily, which they carry in a covered basket, or in a waterproof bag, or in fine weather under the arm. Some of these street sellers are not itinerant when there is a congregation of people for business, or indeed for any purpose. At other times they keep moving. The fixed localities are on market days at Smithfield and Mark Lane, and to Hungerford Market, an old man unable to travel, resorts daily. The chief trade, however, is in carrying or hawking these account books from door to door. A man having a connection does best on a round. If he be known, he is not distrusted, and sells as cheap, or rather cheaper, than the shopkeepers. The twelve account book sellers, with connections, may clear two shillings and sixpence a day each, taking for the realisation of such profit seven shillings per diem. Thus one thousand three hundred and ten pounds will be taken by these street sellers in the course of a year. The capital required to start is stock money, fifteen shillings, basket, three shillings and sixpence, waterproof bag, two shillings and sixpence, twenty-one shillings in all. Of the street sellers of guide-books and so on, this trade, as regards a street sale, has only been known for nine or ten years, and had its origination in the exertions of Mr. Hume, M.P., to secure to persons visiting the national exhibitions the advantage of a cheap catalogue. The guide-books were only sold, prior to this time, within any public exhibition, and the profits, as is the case at present, were the perquisite of some official. When the sale was a monopoly, the profit must have been considerable, as the price was seldom less than sixpence, and frequently one shilling. The guide-books, or as they are more frequently called catalogues, are now sold by men who stand at the entrance, the approaches, 
at a little distance on the line, or at the corners of the adjacent streets, at the following places, the National Gallery, the Vernon Gallery, the British Museum, Westminster Abbey, the House of Lords, the Society of Arts, occasionally, the Art Union, when open free, Greenwich Hospital, the Dulwich Gallery, Hampton Court, Windsor Castle and Kew Gardens. At any temporary exhibition also, the same trade is carried on, as it was largely when the, when the designs and so on for the decoration of the new Houses of Parliament were exhibited in Westminster Hall. There are, of course, very many other catalogues or explanatory guides sold to the visitors of other exhibitions, but I speak only of the street sale. There are now at the National Gallery three guidebook sellers plying their trade in the streets, eight at the British Museum, two at Westminster Abbey, one at the House of Lords, but only on Saturdays, when the house is shown, by orders obtained gratuitously at the Lord Chamberlain's office, or when appeals are on, one at the Vernon Gallery, two at Dulwich, but not regularly, as there are none at present, two at Hampton Court, one near each gate, and one, and sometimes three, at Windsor, generally sent out by a shopkeeper there. There used to be one at the Thames Tunnel, but it grew so bad at last, I was told, that a rat couldn't have picked up his grub at it, let alone a man. Among all these sellers I heard statements of earning a most wretched pittance, and all attributed it to the same cause. By the National Gallery, is a board on which is an announcement that the only authorised catalogue of the works of art can be obtained in the hall. There are similar announcements at other public places. One man who had been in this street trade, but had abandoned it, spoke of these boards, as he called them, with intense bitterness. They're the ruin of any trade in the streets, he said. You needn't think, because I'm out of it now, that I have a pleasure in abusing the regulations. No, sir, I look at it this way. Mr. Hume had trouble enough, I know, to get the public a cheap catalogue, and poor men were allowed to earn honest bread by selling them in the streets, and honest bread they would earn still if it weren't for the board. I declare solemnly, a man can't get a living at the trade. The publishers can't prepare their catalogues without leave, and when they've got leave and do prepare and print them, why isn't a man allowed to sell them in the streets, as I've sold second editions of the Globe, without ever the office putting out a notice that the only authorised copy was to be had within? God bless your soul, sir. It's shocking, shocking, poor men being hindered every way. Anybody that looks on the board looks on us as cheats and humbugs, and thinks that our catalogues are all takes in. But I've heard gentlemen, that I'm sure knew what they were talking about, say, in case they'd bought in the street first, and then seen the board and bought within after, so as to be sure of the real thing, I've heard gentlemen say, sir, why, what we've got in the street is the best after all. Free trade. There's plenty said about free trade, but that board, sir, or call it what you please, gives a monopoly against us. What I have said when I was starving on catalogues is this. Kick us out of the streets, commit us for selling catalogues as rogues and vagabonds, or give us a fair chance. If we may sell, why is the only authorised catalogue sold only within? I wish Mr. Hume, or Mr. Cobden either, only understood the rights of the matter. It's of no account to me myself now, and I think they'd soon set it to rights. Free trade, over the left, and with more hooks than one. I have no doubt that this representation and this opinion would have been echoed by the street catalogue sellers, but they were evidently unwilling to converse freely on this branch of the subject, knowing the object for which I questioned them, and that publicity would follow. I attribute this reluctance chiefly to the fact that all these poor men look forward to the opening of the great exhibition with earnest hope and anxiety that the influx of visitors will add greatly to their sale and profits, and they are unwilling to jeopardise their privilege of sale. One man told me that he believed from his own knowledge, for he had not always sold outside, that the largest buyers of these publications were country people, sightseeing in London, for they bought the book not only as an explanatory guide, but to preserve as a memento of their visit. Such customers, however, I heard from several quarters, the moment they saw a notice as to the only authorised copy, 
looked upon the street sellers as a systematized portion of the london sharpers seeking whom they might devour and so bought their catalogues within the best customers in the streets for the catalogues are i am assured the working classes who visit the national exhibitions on a holiday i've often i've heard them say one man stated i'd rather pay a poor man tuppence any day when i can spare it than rich people a penny i know what it is to fight for a crust at the national gallery the street sold catalogues are a penny threepence and sixpence in the hall the authorized copy is sold at fourpence and one shilling at the british museum the street charges are threepence and sixpence there were one penny catalogues of this institution but they have been discontinued for the last half year being found too meagre at the vernon gallery the charge is one penny but the sixpenny guide-book to the national gallery contains also an account of the pictures in the vernon gallery at westminster abbey the price is sixpence and the same at the house of lords at hampton court it is twopence fourpence and sixpence and at the same rate as regards the other places mentioned at hampton court i was told the street sellers were not allowed to approach the palace nearer than a certain space one man told me that he was threatened with being had in for trespassing and mr g blank would make him wheel a roller of course the man continued there's an authorized catalogue there the best sale of catalogues in the streets was at the exhibition of the works of art for the houses of parliament the sellers then about twenty in number among whom were four women cleared two shillings and two shillings and sixpence each daily at present i am assured that a good week is considered one in which five shillings is made but that three shillings is more frequently the weekly earning it must be borne in mind that at the two places most resorted to the national gallery and the british museum the street sale is only for four days in the week at the first mentioned and three days at the second you may think that more is made said one man but it isn't sweeping a good crossing is far better far bless your soul only stand a few minutes looking on any day and see what numbers and numbers of people pass in and out of a free admission place without ever laying out a penny why only last monday and wednesday note march the seventeenth and nineteenth both very rainy days end note i took only fivepence i didn't take more than fivepence and i leave you to judge the living i shall clear out of that and i know that the man with the catalogue at another place didn't take a penny it's sad work sir as you stand in the wet and cold with no dinner for yourself and no great hope of taking one home to your family these street sellers contrive whenever they can to mix up other avocations with catalogue selling as the public institutions close early one on every occasion sells second editions of the newspapers another has odd turns at portering a third sells old umbrellas in the streets some sold exhibition cards in the park on sundays until the sale was stopped another sells a little stationery and nearly the whole of them resort on favourable opportunities to the sale of books of the play or of the opera reckoning that there are regularly sixteen street sellers of guide-books they do not interfere with each other's stations and that each clears four shillings weekly we find eight hundred and thirty two pounds expended in this street traffic i have calculated only on the usual bookseller's allowance of twenty five per cent though in some instances these sellers are supplied on lower terms besides having in some of the catalogues thirteen to the dozen but the amount specified does not exceed the mark the greatest number of these guide-books which i heard of as having been sold in any one day was four dozen disposed of on a fine whit monday and for these the street seller only took six shillings and eightpence there are i was informed half as many more threepennies as sixpennies sold and three times as many pennies as the other two together the capital required to start is what may suffice to lay in a stock of books five shillings generally end of section fifty
Section fifty one of London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew, Volume One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Street Folk, Part fifty one. Of the street sellers of fine arts, these traders may be described as partaking more of the characteristics of the street stationers than of the paper workers, as they are not patterers. The trade is less exclusively than the paper trade in the hands of men. Those carrying on this branch of the street traffic may be divided into the sellers of pictures in frames and of engravings of all kinds in umbrellas. Under this head may also be ranked the street artists, though this is a trade associated with street life rather than forming an integrant part of it. I allude more particularly to the illustrated boards which are prepared for the purposes of the street patterers and are adapted for no other use. The same artist that executes the greater portion of the street art also prepares the paintings which decorate the exterior of shows. There are also the writers of manuscript music and the makers and sellers of images of all descriptions, but this branch of the subject I shall treat under the head of the street Italians. Under the same curious head I shall also speak of the artists whose skill produces the street-sold medallions in wax or plaster, they being of the same class as the image men. In both images and casts, and moulded productions of all kinds, the change and improvement that have taken place from the pristine rudeness of green parrots is most remarkable and creditable to the taste of working people who are the chief purchasers of the smaller articles of street art the artists who work for the street sellers are less numerous than the poets for the same trade indeed there is now but one man who can be said to be solely a street artist the inopportune illustrations of ballads of which specimens have already been given or of any of the street papers are the work of cheap wood engravers who give the execution of these orders to their boys but it is not often that illustrations are prepared expressly for anything but what i have described as gallows literature of these samples have also been furnished the one of a real murder and the other of a fabulous one or cock together with a sample in the case of mr patrick connor of the portraits given in such productions the cuts for the heading of ballads are very often such as have been used for the illustration of other works and are picked up cheap the artist who works especially for the street trade as in the case of the man who paints the patterer's boards must address his art plainly to the eye of the spectator he must use the most striking colors be profuse in the application of scarlet light blue orange not yellow i was told it ain't a good candlelight colour and must leave nothing to the imagination perspective and backgrounds are things of but minor consideration everything must be sacrificed for effect these paintings are in watercolours and are rubbed over with a solution of some gum resin to protect them from the influence of rainy weather two of the subjects most in demand of late for the patterer's boards were the sloanes and the mannings the treatment of jane wilbred was worked by twenty boardmen each with his illustration of the subject the illustrations were in six compartments in the first mr and mrs sloane are picking out the girl from a line of workhouse children she is represented as plump and healthy but with a stupid expression of countenance in another compartment sloane is beating the girl then attenuated and wretched looking with a shoe while his wife and miss devoe note a name i generally heard pronounced among the street people as it is spelt to an english reader End note. look approvingly on the next picture was sloane compelling the girl to swallow filth the fourth represented her as in the hospital with her ribs protruding from her wasted body just as i've worked sarah simpole said a patterer who was confined in a cellar and fed on tater peels sarah was a coxer and a ripper then came the attack of the people on sloane one old woman dressed after the fashion of mrs gamp prodding him with a huge and very green umbrella the sixth and last was as usual the trial i have described the sloane's board first 
as it may be more fresh in the remembrance of any reader observant of such things. In the Manning's board there were the same number of compartments as in the Sloan's, showing the circumstances of the murder, the discovery of the body of Connor, the trial, and so on. One standing patterer who worked a Manning's board told me that the picture of Mrs. Manning, beautifully dressed for dinner in black satin, with a low front, firing a pistol at Connor, who was washing himself, while Manning, in his shirt-sleeves, looked on in evident alarm, was greatly admired, especially out of town. "'The people said,' observed the patterer, "'Oh, look at him a-washing hisself. He's a-doing it so natural, and ain't a-thinking he's a-going to be murdered. But was he really so ugly as that? Law, such a beautiful woman, to have to do with him.' you see sir connor weren't flattered and perhaps mrs manning was i have heard the same sort of remarks both in town and country i pat as hard on the women such times as i points them out on my board in murders or any crimes i says when there's mischief a woman's always the first look at mrs manning there on that wery board the work of one of the first artists in london it's a faithful likeness taken from life at one of her examinations look at her she fires the pistol, as you can see, and her husband was her tall. I said, too, that Sloane was Mrs. Sloane's tall. It answers best, sir, in my opinion, going on that patter. The men likes it, and the women doesn't object, for they'll say, well, when a woman is bad, she is bad, and is a disgrace to her sex. There's the board before them, when I runs on that line of patter, and when I appeals to the lustration, it seems to cooper the thing. They must believe their eyes." When there is a run on any particular subject, there are occasionally jarrings, I was informed by a board man, between the artist and his street customers. The standing patterers want something more original than their fellows, especially if they are likely to work in the same locality, while the artist prefers a faithful copy of what he has already executed. The artist, moreover, and with all reasonableness, will say, Why, you must have the facts! Do you want me to make Eliza Chesney killing Rush? The matter is often compromised by some change being introduced, and by the characters being differently dressed. One man told me that in town and country he had seen Mrs. Jermy shot in the following costumes, in light green well-wit, sky-blue satin, crimson silk, and white muslin. It was the same with Mrs. Manning. For the last six or eight years, I am told, the artist in question has prepared all the boards in demand. Previously, the standing patterers prepared their own boards, when they fancied themselves capable of such a reach of art, or had them done by some unemployed painter, whom they might fall in with at a lodging-house or elsewhere. This is rarely done now, I am told, not perhaps more than six times in a twelve-month, and when done it is most frequently practised of cock-boards, for, as was said to me, if a man thinks he's getting up a fakement likely to take, and wants a board to help him on with it, he'll try and keep it to himself, and come out with it quite fresh. The charge of the popular street artist for the painting of a board is three shillings or three shillings and sixpence, according to the simplicity or elaborateness of the details. The board itself is provided by the artist's employer. The demand for this peculiar branch of street art is very irregular, depending entirely upon whether anything be up or not, that is, whether there has or has not been perpetrated any act of atrocity which has riveted, as it is called, the public attention. And so great is the uncertainty felt by the street folk, whether the most beautiful murder will take or not, that it is rarely the patterer will order or the artist will speculate, in anticipation of a demand, upon preparing the painting of any event, until satisfied that it has become popular. A deed of more than usual daring, deceit, or mystery may be at once hailed by those connected with murder patter as one that will do, and some speculation may be ventured upon, as it was, I am informed, in the cases of Toil, Rush, and the Mannings, but these are merely exceptional. Thus, if the artist have a dozen boards ordered for this ten days, he may have two or one or none for the next ten. So uncertain, it appears, is all that depends, without intrinsic merit, on mere popular applause. 
I am unable to give, owing to the want of account books and so on, which I have so often had to refer as characteristic of street people, a precise account of the average number of boards thus prepared in a year. Perhaps it may be as close to the fact as possible to conclude that the artist in question, who, unlike the majority of the street poets, is not a street seller, but works as a professional man for, but not in, the streets, realises on his boards a profit of seven shillings and sixpence weekly. The pictorial productions for street shows will be more appropriately described in the account of street performers and showmen. This artist, as I have shown concerning some of the street professors of the sister art of poesy, has the quality of knowing how to adapt his works exactly to the taste of his patrons, the sellers, and of their patrons, the buyers in the streets. Of the street sellers, of engravings, etc., in umbrellas, etc. The sale of prints, pictures, and engravings, I heard them designated by each term, in umbrellas in the streets, has been known, as far as I could learn from the street folk, for some fifteen years, and has been general from ten to twelve years. In this traffic the umbrella is inverted, and the stock is disposed within its expanse. Sometimes narrow tapes are attached from rib to rib of the umbrella, and within these tapes are placed the pictures, one resting upon another. Sometimes a few pins are used to attach the larger prints to the cotton of the umbrella, the smaller ones being fitted in at the side of the bigger. "'Pins is best, sir, in my opinion,' said a little old man who used to have a print umbrella in the new cut, "'for the public has a more unbroken a display. I use very fine pins, though they're dearer, for people as has a penny to spare likes to see things nice, and big pins makes big holes in the pictures. This trade is most pursued on still summer evenings, and the use of an inverted umbrella seems so far appropriate that it can only be so used in the street in dry weather. I used to keep a sharp lookout, sir, said the same informant, for wind or rain, and many's the time them devils are boys. God forgive me, they's only poor children, but they is devils has come up to me and has said, one in particular, standing afore the rest, it will thunder in five minutes, old bloke, so hup with your humbarella and go home. Hup with it, just as it is. It'll show stunning and sell as you goes. Oh, they're a shocking torment, sir. Nobody can feel it like people in the streets. Shocking. The engravings thus sold are of all descriptions. Some have evidently been the frontispieces of sixpenny or lower-priced works. These works sometimes fall into hands of the waste collectors, and any illustrations are extracted from the letterpress, and are disposed of by the collectors, by the gross or dozen, to those warehousemen who supply the small shopkeepers and the street sellers. Sometimes, I was informed, a number of engravings, which had for a while appeared as frontispieces, were issued for sale separately. Many of these were and are found in the street umbrellas more especially the portraits of popular actors and actresses. Mr. J. P. Kemble as Hamlet, Mr. Fawcett as Captain Cop, Mr. Young as Iago, Mr. Liston as Paul Pry, Mrs. Siddons as Lady Macbeth, Miss O'Neill as Belvedere, and so on and so on. In the course of an inquiry into the subject nearly a year and a half ago, I learned from one umbrella man that, six or seven years previously, he used to sell more portraits of Mr. Edmund Keane as Richard III than of anything else. Engravings, too, which had first been admired in the annuals, when half a guinea was the price of the literary souvenir, the forget-me-not, friendship's offering, the bijou, and so on and so on, are frequently found in these umbrellas, and amongst them are not unfrequently seen portraits of the aristocratic beauties of the day, from waste flowers of loveliness, and old court magazines, which go off very fair. The majority of these street-sold engravings are coloured, in which state the street-sellers prefer them, thinking them much more saleable, though the information I received hardly bears out their opinion. 
the following statement from a middle-aged woman further shows the nature of the trade and the class of customers i've sat with an umbrella she said these seven or eight years i suppose it is my husband's a penny lot seller with just a middling pitch note the vendor of a number of articles sold at a penny a lot end note and in the summer i do a little in engravings when i'm not minding my husband's lots for he has sometimes a day and oftener a night with portering and packing for a tradesman that's known him long well sir i think i sell most coloured master tom's wasn't bad last summer master tom's was pictures of cats sir you must have seen them and i had them different colours if a child looks on with its father very likely it'll want pussy and if the child cries for it it's almost a sure sale and more i think indeed i'm sure with men than with women women knows the value of money better than men for men never understand what housekeeping is i have no children thank god or they might be pinched poor things miss kitty's was the same sale tom's is he's and kitty's is she cats i've sometimes sold to poor women who was tiresome they must have just what would fit over their mantelpieces that was papered with pictures note my readers may remember that some of the descriptions i have given long previous to the present inquiry of the rooms of the poor fully bear out this statement End note. i seldom venture on anything above a penny i mean to sell at a penny i've had toms and kitties at tuppence though fashions isn't worth umbrella room the poorest needlewoman won't be satisfied with them from an umbrella queens and alberts and waleses and the other children isn't nearly as good as they was there's so many fine portraits of her majesty or the others given away with the first number of this or of that that people's overstocked if a working man can buy a newspaper or a number why of course he may as well have a picture with it they gave away glasses of gin at the opening of that baker's shop there and it's the same doctrine note the word she used end note i never offer penny theatres or comic exhibitions or anything big they spoils the look of the umbrella and makes better things look mean i sell only to working people i think seldom to boys and seldomer to girls seldom to servant maids and hardly ever to women of the town i have taken sixpence from one of them though i think boys buy pictures for picture books i never had what i suppose was old pictures to a few old people i've known children sell fairly when they're made plump and red-cheeked and curly-haired they sees a resemblance of their grandchildren perhaps and buys young married people does so too but not so oft i think i don't remember that ever i have made more than one shilling and tenpence on an evening i don't sell or very seldom indeed at other times and only in summer and when it's fine if i clear five shillings i count that a good week it's a great help to the lot selling i seldom clear so much oftener four shillings the principal sale of these pictures in the streets is from umbrellas occasionally a street stationer or even a miscellaneous lot seller when he has met with a cheap lot especially of portraits of ladies will display a collection of prints pyramidally arranged on his stall but these are exceptions sometimes too an umbrella print seller will have a few pictures in frames on a sort of stand alongside the umbrella the pictures for the umbrellas are bought at the warehouse or the swag shops of which i have before spoken at these establishments prints are commonly supplied from threepence to five shillings the dozen the street sellers buy at fivepence and sixpence the dozen to sell at a penny apiece and at threepence to sell at a halfpenny none of the pictures thus sold are prepared expressly for the streets in so desultory and as one intelligent street seller with whom i conversed on the subject described it so weathery a trade it is difficult to arrive at exact statistics from the best data at my command it may be computed that for twelve weeks of the year there are thirty umbrella print sellers all exceptional traders therein included each clearing six shillings weekly and taking twelve shillings thus it appears that two hundred and sixteen pounds is yearly expended in the streets in this purchase many of the sellers are old or infirm 
one who was among the most prosperous before the changes in the streets of lambeth was dwarfish and was delighted to be thought a character of the street sellers of pictures in frames from about eighteen ten or somewhat earlier down to eighteen thirty or somewhat later the street sale of pictures in frames was almost entirely in the hands of the jews the subjects were then nearly all scriptural the offering up of isaac jacob's dream the crossing of the red sea the death of sisera and the killing of goliath from the sling of the youthful david but the jew traders did not at all account it necessary to confine the subjects of their pictures to the records of the old their best trade was in the illustrations of the new testament perhaps the stoning of st stephen was their most saleable picture in a frame there were also the nativity the slaying of the children by order of herod note with the quotation of st matthew chapter two verse seventeen then was fulfilled that which was spoken by jeremy the prophet end note the sermon on the mount the beheading of john the baptist the entry of christ into jerusalem the raising of lazarus the betrayal on the part of judas the crucifixion and the conversion of st paul there were others but these were the principal subjects all these pictures were colored and very deeply colored st stephen was stoned in the lightest of sky-blue short mantles the pictures were sold in the streets of london mostly in the way of hawking but ten times as extensively i am told in the country as in town indeed at the present time many a secluded village alehouse has its parlour walls decorated with these scriptural illustrations which seem to have superseded the pictures placed for ornament and use the twelve good rules the royal game of goose mentioned by goldsmith as characteristic of a village inn these jew pictures are now yielding to others most of these articles were varnished and two shillings or two shillings and sixpence each was frequently the price asked one shilling and sixpence being taken if no better could be done and sometimes one shilling a smaller amount per single picture was always taken if a set were purchased these productions were prepared principally for street sale and for hawkers the frames were narrower and meaner looking than in the present street pictures of the kind they were stained like the present frames in imitation of maple but far less skilfully sometimes they were a black japan sometimes a sorry imitation of mahogany in the excitement of the reform bill era the street pictures in frames most in demand were earl grey earl spencer's or lord althorpe lord brougham's and lord john russell's o'connell's also sold well as did william the fourth queen adelaide i was told went off middling not much more than half as good as william towards the close of king william's life the portraits of the princess victoria of kent were of good sale in the streets and her royal highness was certainly represented as a young lady of undue plumpness and had hardly justice done to her portraiture the duchess of kent also i was informed sold fairish in the streets in a little time the picture in a frame of the princess victoria of kent with merely an alteration in the title became available as queen victoria the first of great britain and ireland since that period there have been the princes and princesses her majesty's offspring who present a strong family resemblance the street pictures so to speak are not unfrequently of a religious character pictures of the virgin and child of the saviour seated at the last supper of the crucifixion or of the different saints generally coloured the principal purchasers of these religious pictures are the poorer irish i remember seeing in the course of an inquiry among street performers last summer the entire wall of a poor street dancer's one room except merely the space occupied by the fireplace covered with small coloured pictures in frames the whole of which the proprietor told me with some pride he had picked up in the streets according as he could spare a few pence among them were a crucifix of bone and a few medallions of a religious character in plaster or wax this man was of italian extraction but i have seen the same thing in the rooms of the roman catholic irish 
though never to the same extent. The general subjects now most in demand for street sale are Lola Montes, Louis Philippe and his Queen, The Sailor's Return, The Soldier's Return, and The Parting of the Same Individuals, Smugglers in Different Situations, Poachers also, Turpin's Ride to York, The Diverse Feats Attributed to Jack Shepherd, but less popular than Turpin's Ride, Courtship, Marriage, The One a Couple Caressing and the Other Bickering, Father Matthew in Very Black Large Boots, Napoleon Bonaparte crossing the Alps, and his farewell to his troops at Fontainebleau, scenes of piracy. None of these subjects are modern. Lola Montes, a bold-faced woman in a riding habit, being the newest. Why, said one man familiar with the trade, there hasn't been no Louis Napoleon in a frame picture for the streets, nor Cobden's, nor Fergus O'Connor's, nor Sir John Franklin's, what is wanted for us is something exciting. The prices of frame pictures, as I sometimes heard them called, made expressly for street sale, vary from one penny to one shilling a pair. The one penny a pair are about six inches by four, very rude, and on thin paper, and with frames made of lathwood, stained, but put together very compactly. The cheaper sorts are of prints bought at the swag shops or of waste dealers, sometimes roughly coloured and sometimes plain. The greatest sale is of those charged from twopence to fourpence the pair. Some of the higher-priced pictures are painted purposely for the streets, but are always copies of some popular engraving, and their sale is not a twentieth of the others. These frame pictures were and are generally got up by a family, the girls taking the management of the paperwork, the boys of the wood. The parents have, many of them, been paper stainers. This division of labour is one reason of the exceeding cheapness of this street branch of the fine arts. These working artists, or whatever they are to be called, also prepare and frame for street sale the plates given away in the first instance with a number of a newspaper or a periodical, and afterwards to be had for next to nothing. The prevalence of such engravings has tended greatly to diminish the sale of the pictures prepared expressly for the streets. Ten years ago this trade was ten times greater than it is now. The principal sale still is, and always was, at the street markets on Saturday evenings. They are sold piled on a small stall, or carried under the arm. To sell ten shillings worth on a Saturday night is an extraordinary sale, and two shillings and sixpence is a bad one and the frame picturer must have middling patter to set them off at all tuppence a pair he'll say only tuppence a pair who'll be without an ornament to his dwelling there are now about fifty persons engaged in this sale on a saturday night of whom the majority are the artists or preparers of the pictures on a monday evening there are about twenty sellers and not half that number on other evenings but some take a round in the suburbs if these people take ten shillings weekly for frame pictures the year through, one thousand and forty pounds is yearly expended in this way. I estimate the average number at twenty daily. Their profits are about cent per cent. Boys and working people buy the most. The trade is often promoted by a raffle at a public house. Many mechanics, I was told, now frame their own pictures. Of the street sellers of manuscript and other music this trade used to be more extensively carried on in the streets than it is at present the reasons i heard assigned for the decadence were the greater cheapness of musical productions generally and the present fondness for lithographic embellishments to every polka waltz quadrille ballad and so on and so on people now hate i do believe a bare music sheet one street seller remarked. The street manuscript music trade was certainly and principally piratical. An air became popular, perhaps, on a sudden, as it was pointed out to me in the case of Jump Jim Crow. At a musical publisher's, such an affair in the first bloom of its popularity would have been charged from two shillings to three shillings and sixpence twenty-five years ago, and the street seller at that time often also a bookstall keeper would employ or buy of those who offered them for sale and who copied them for the purpose 
a manuscript of the demanded music, which he could sell cheap in comparison. A man who, until the changes of which I have before spoken, kept a second-hand bookstall in a sort of arched passage in the new cut, Lambeth, sold manuscript music, and was often sadly bothered, he said, at one time, by the musical propensities of a man who looked like a journeyman tailor. This man, whenever he had laid out a trifle at the bookstall, looked over the music, and often pulled a small flute from his pocket, and began to play a few bars from one of the manuscripts, and this he continued doing, to the displeasure of the stallkeeper, until a crowd began to assemble, thinking perhaps that the flute-player was a street musician. He was then obliged to desist. Of the kind of music he sold, or of its mode of production, this street bookseller knew nothing. He purchased it of a man who carried it to his stall, and as he found it sell tolerably well, he gave himself no further trouble concerning it. The supplier of the manuscript penciled on each sheet the price it was to be offered at, allowing the stallkeeper from fifty to a hundred and fifty per cent profit, if the price marked was obtained. "'I haven't seen anything of him, sir.' said the street bookseller, for a long while. I dare say he was some poor musicianer, or singer, or a reduced gentleman, perhaps, for he always came after dusk, or else on bad dark days. Although but partially connected with street art, I may mention, as a sample of the music sometimes offered in street sale, that a bookstall keeper three weeks ago showed me a pile of music which he had purchased from a waste collector about eight months before, at twopence halfpenny the pound. Among this was some manuscript music, which I specify below, and which the bookstall keeper was confident, on very insufficient grounds, I think, had been done for street sale. The music had, as regards three-fourths of it, evidently been bound, and had been torn from the boards of the book, as only the paper portion is purchased for waste. Some, however, were loose sheets, which had evidently never been subjected to the process of stitching. I now cite some of the titles of this street sale. Le Petit Tambour, Sujet d'un grand rondeau pour le piano forte, composé par L. Zerbini, manuscript. Di Tonti Palpiti, the celebrated cavatina by Rossini, and so on. Twenty short lessons or preludes in the most convenient keys for the harp, composed and respectfully dedicated to Lady Anne Collins, by John Baptist Mayer, price five shillings. An Cota Cool, given in the ancient Irish character, The Slender Coat, manuscript. Chailan Bio Chruite Namu, also in Irish, The Pretty Girl Milking the Cow, manuscript. There are now no persons regularly employed in preparing manuscript music for the streets, but occasionally a person skilled in music writing will, when he or she, I was told, had nothing better in hand, do a little for the street sale, disposing of the manuscripts to any street stationer or bookseller. If four persons are this way employed, receiving four shillings a week each the year through, which I am assured is the extent, we find upwards of forty pounds thus earned, and about twice that sum taken by the street retailers. End of section 51。section 52 of London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew, volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Street Folk, part 52. Of the Capital and Income of the Street Sellers of Stationery, Literature, and the Fine Arts. I now proceed to give a summary of the capital and income of the above classes. I will first, however, endeavour to give a summary of the number of individuals belonging to the class. This appears to be made up, so far as I am able to ascertain, of the following items. 120 sellers of stationery, 20 sellers of pocket books and diaries, 50 sellers of almanacs and memorandum books, 12 sellers of account books, 31 card sellers, six secret paper sellers, two hundred and fifty sellers of songs and ballads, ninety running patterers, twenty standing patterers, eight sellers of cocks, principally elopements, 
fifteen selling conundrums comic exhibitions and so on two hundred selling playbills and books for the play forty back number sellers four waste paper sellers at billingsgate forty sellers of tracts and pamphlets twelve news vendors and so on at steamboat piers two book auctioneers seventy bookstall keepers and book barrow men sixteen sellers of guide books thirty sellers of song books and children's books forty dealers in pictures in frames thirty vendors of engravings in umbrellas and four sellers of manuscript music making altogether a total of one thousand one hundred and ten many of the above street trades are however only temporary as for instance the street sale of playing cards continues only fourteen days in the year pocket books and diaries four weeks others again are not regularly pursued from day to day as the sale of prints and engravings in umbrellas which affords employment for but twelve weeks out of the fifty-two and conundrums for two months one trade however namely that of comic exhibition papers gelatin and engraved cards of the exhibition is entirely now in the streets in the broadsheet trade again the running patterers work what are called cocks when there are no incidents happening to incite the public mind hence making due allowances for such variations we may fairly assume that the street sellers belonging to this class number at least one thousand the following statistics will show the whole amount of capital and the gross income of this branch of street traffic capital or value of the stock in trade of the street sellers of stationery literature and the fine arts street sellers of stationery forty stalls four shillings each eighty boxes three shillings and sixpence each and stock money for one hundred and twenty sellers ten shillings each thirty two pounds no shillings no pence street sellers of pocket books and diaries stock money for twenty vendors ten shillings each ten pounds no shillings no pence street sellers of almanacs and memorandum books stock money for fifty vendors one shilling per head two pounds ten shillings no pence street sellers of account books twelve baskets three shillings each twelve waterproof bags two shillings and sixpence each stock money for twelve sellers fifteen shillings each twelve pounds six shillings no pence street sellers of cards stock money for twenty sellers one shilling and sixpence each two pounds five shillings no pence street seller of stenographic cards stock money for one seller no pound one shilling six pence street sellers of long songs twenty poles to which songs are attached twopence each stock money for twenty sellers one shilling each one pound three shillings and fourpence street sellers of wall songs pinners up thirty canvas frames to which songs are hung two shillings each stock money for thirty sellers one shilling each four pounds ten shillings no pence street sellers of ballads chaunters two fiddles seven shillings each stock money for two hundred chaunters one shilling each ten pounds fourteen shillings no pence street sellers of dialogues litanies and so on standing patterers twenty boards with appendages for pictures five shillings and sixpence each twenty paintings for boards three shillings and sixpence each stock money for twenty vendors one shilling each ten pounds no shillings no pence street sellers of executions and so on running patterers stock money for ninety sellers one shilling each four pounds ten shillings no pence street sellers of cocks stock money for eight sellers one shilling each no pounds eight shillings no pence street sellers of conundrums and nuts to crack stock money for fifteen sellers one shilling each no pounds fifteen shillings no pence street sellers of exhibition papers magical delusions and so on stock money for fifteen sellers one shilling each no pounds fifteen shillings no pence street sellers of secret papers stock money for six vendors one shilling each no pounds six shillings no pence street sellers of playbills and books of the play stock money for two hundred vendors two shillings each twenty pounds no shillings no pence street sellers of back numbers stock money for forty sellers five shillings each ten pounds no shillings no pence 
Street sellers of waste paper at Billingsgate. Stock money for four sellers, five shillings each. One pound, no shillings, no pence. Street sellers of tracts and pamphlets. Stock money for forty sellers, sixpence each. One pound, no shillings, no pence. Street sellers of newspapers, second edition. Stock money for twenty sellers, two shillings and sixpence each. Two pounds, ten shillings, no pence. Street sellers of newspapers and so on, on board steamboats. Stock money for twelve sellers, five shillings each, three pounds, no shillings, no pence. Street sellers of books by auction. Stock money for two sellers, two pounds each, two barrows, one pound each, two boards for barrows, three shillings each, six pounds, six shillings, no pence. Street sellers of books on stalls and barrows. Twenty stalls, four shillings each, fifty barrows, one pound each, fifty boards for barrows, three shillings each. Stock money for seventy sellers, two pounds each, two hundred and one pounds, ten shillings, no pence. Street sellers of guide books, stock money for sixteen sellers, five shillings each, four pounds, no shillings, no pence. Street sellers of song books and children's books, stock money for thirty vendors, one shilling each, one pound, ten shillings, no pence. Street sellers of pictures in frames, forty stalls, two shillings and sixpence each. Stock money for forty sellers, five shillings each, fifteen pounds, no shillings, no pence. Street sellers of engravings in umbrellas, umbrellas, two shillings and sixpence each. Stock money for thirty sellers, two shillings each, three pounds, no shillings, no pence. Street sellers of manuscript music, stock money for four sellers, one shilling and sixpence each, no pounds, six shillings, no pence. Total capital invested in the street sale of stationary literature and the fine arts, four hundred and eleven pounds five shillings and ten pence. Income or average annual takings of the street sellers of stationary literature and the fine arts. Street sellers of stationery. There are one hundred and twenty vendors of stationery who sell altogether during the year. 224,640 quires of writing paper at threepence per quire, 149,760 dozen envelopes at a penny halfpenny per dozen, 37,440 dozen pens at threepence per dozen, 24,960 bottles of ink at a penny each, 112,320 black lead pencils at a penny each, 24,960 pennyworths of wafers, and 49,920 sticks of sealing wax at a halfpenny per stick, amounting altogether to £4,992. Street sellers of pocket books and diaries. During the year, 1,440 pocket books at sixpence each and 960 diaries at sixpence each are sold in the streets by 20 vendors, amounting to £60. Street sellers of almanacs and memorandum books. There are sold during the year in the streets of London 280,800 memorandum books at one penny each and 4,800 almanacs at one penny each among 50 vendors altogether amounting to £1,190. Street sellers of account books. There are now 12 itinerants vending account books in various parts of the metropolis, each of whom sells daily upon an average four account books at one shilling and ninepence each. The number sold during the year is therefore 14,976, and the sum expended thereon amounts to £1,310. Street sellers of gelatin, engraved, and playing cards. There are 20 street sellers vending gelatin and engraved cards during the day, and 30 selling playing cards for 14 days at night. These vendors get rid of among them in the course of the year 43,200 gelatin and 14,400 engraved cards at one penny each, and 3,360 packs of playing cards at threepence per pack so that the money spent in the streets on the sale of engraved, gelatin, and playing cards during the year amounts to £282. Street Seller of Stenographic Cards There is only one individual working stenographic cards in the streets of London, and the number he sells in the course of the year is 7,448 cards, at one penny each, amounting to £31 four shillings. 
street sellers of long songs i am assured that if twenty persons were selling long songs in the street last summer during a period of twelve weeks it was the outside as long songs are now for fairs and races and country work calculating that each cleared nine shillings in a week and to clear that took fifteen shillings we find there is expended in long songs in the streets annually one hundred and eighty pounds street sellers of wall songs pinners up on fine summer days the wall song sellers of whom there are thirty take two shillings on an average on short wintry days they may not take half so much and on very foggy or rainy days they take nothing at all reckoning that each wall song man now takes ten shillings and sixpence weekly seven shillings being the profit we find there is expended yearly in london streets in the ballads of the pinners up eight hundred and ten pounds street sellers of ballads chaunters there are now two hundred chaunters who also sell the ballads they sing the average takings of each are three shillings per day altogether amounting to four thousand six hundred and eighty pounds street sellers of executions and so on running patterers some represent their average weekly earnings at twelve shillings and sixpence the year through some at ten shillings and sixpence and others at less than half of twelve shillings and sixpence reckoning however that only nine shillings weekly is an average profit per individual and that fourteen shillings be taken to realize that profit we find there is expended yearly on executions fires deaths and so on in london three thousand two hundred and seventy six pounds street sellers of dialogues litanies and so on standing patterers if twenty standing patterers clear ten shillings weekly each the year through and take fifteen shillings weekly we find there is yearly expended in the standing patter of london streets seven hundred and eighty pounds street sellers of cocks elopements love letters and so on there are now eight men who sell nothing but cocks each of whom dispose daily of six dozen copies at a halfpenny per copy or altogether during the year one hundred and seventy nine thousand seven hundred and twelve copies amounting to three hundred and seventy four pounds eight shillings street sellers of conundrums nuts to crack and so on from the best information i could acquire it appears that fifteen men may be computed as working conundrums for two months throughout the twelve and clearing ten shillings and sixpence weekly per individual the cost of the nuts to crack when new is fivepence a dozen to the seller but old nuts often answer the purpose of the street seller and may be had for about half the price the cost of the nut crackers is two shillings to two shillings and sixpence it may be calculated then that to realize the ten shillings and sixpence above mentioned fifteen shillings must be taken this shows the street expenditure in nuts to crack and nut crackers to be yearly ninety pounds street sellers of exhibition papers magical delusions and so on this trade is carried on only for a short time in the winter as regards the magical portion and i am informed that including the comic exhibitions it extends to about half of the sum taken for conundrums or to about fifteen pounds street sellers of secret papers supposing that six men last year each cleared six shillings weekly we find expended yearly in the streets on this rubbish ninety-three pounds street sellers of playbills and books taking the profits at three shillings a week at cent per cent on the outlay and reckoning two hundred sellers including those at the saloons concert rooms and so on there is expended yearly on the sale of playbills purchased in the streets of london three thousand one hundred and twenty pounds street sellers of back numbers there are now forty vendors in the streets of london each selling upon an average three dozen copies daily at a halfpenny each or during the year three hundred and thirty six thousand nine hundred and sixty odd numbers hence the sum expended annually in the streets for back numbers of periodicals amounts to upwards of seven hundred pounds street sellers of waste paper at billingsgate there are four individuals selling waste paper at billingsgate one of whom informed me that from seventy to one hundred pounds weight of waste about three-fourths being newspapers is supplied to billingsgate market and its visitants the average price is not less than twopence halfpenny a pound or from that to threepence 
A single paper is one penny. Reckoning that eighty-five pounds of waste paper are sold a day at twopence halfpenny per pound, we find that the annual expenditure in waste paper at Billingsgate is upwards of two hundred and seventy-five pounds. Street sellers of tracts and pamphlets. From the information I obtained from one of this class of street sellers, I find that there are forty individuals gaining a livelihood in selling tracts and pamphlets in the streets. Full one half are men of colour. The other half consists of old and infirm men and young boys. The average takings of each is about one shilling a day the year through. The annual street expenditure in the sale of tracts and pamphlets is thus upwards of six hundred and twenty pounds. Street sellers of newspapers, second edition. There are twenty who are engaged in the street sale of newspapers, second edition, each of whom take weekly, for a period of six weeks in the year, one pound five shillings so that, adopting the calculation of my informant, and giving a profit of a hundred and fifty per cent, the yearly expenditure in the streets in second editions amounts to one hundred and fifty pounds. Street sellers of newspapers and so on at steamboat piers. I am informed that the average earnings of these traders altogether may be taken at fifteen shillings weekly. Calculating that twelve carry on the trade the year through, we find that assuming each man to sell at 33% profit, though in the case of old works it will be often cent per cent, the sum expended annually in steamboat papers is upwards of £1,500. Street Sellers of Books by Auction There are at present only two street sellers of books by auction in London, whose clear weekly earnings are ten shillings and sixpence each. Calculating their profits at £250 per cent, their weekly receipts will amount to thirty-five shillings each per week, giving a yearly expenditure of ninety-one pounds. Street Sellers of Books on Stalls and Barrows The number of bookstalls and barrows in the streets of the metropolis is seventy. The proprietors of these sell weekly upon an average forty-two volumes each. The number of volumes annually sold in the streets is thus one million three hundred and seventy-five thousand nine hundred and twenty and reckoning each volume sold to average ninepence, we find that the yearly expenditure in the sale of books in the street amounts to £5,733. Street Sellers of Guidebooks The street sellers of guidebooks to public places of amusement are sixteen in number. The profit of each is four shillings weekly at twenty-five per cent, hence the takings must be twenty shillings thus making the annual expenditure in the street sale of such books amount to £832. Street Sale of Song Books and Children's Books There are thirty street sellers who vend children's books and song books, and dispose of among them two dozen each daily, or during the year 224,640 books at one penny each. Hence, the sum yearly expended in the street sale of children's books and song books is £936. Street sellers of pictures in frames. If we calculate 40 persons selling pictures in frames and each taking 10 shillings weekly, we find the annual amount spent in the streets in the sale of these articles is £1,040. Street sellers of prints and engravings in umbrellas. The street sale of prints and engravings in umbrellas lasts only twelve weeks. There are thirty individuals who gain a livelihood in the sale of these articles during that period. The average takings of each seller is twelve shillings weekly, so that the annual street expenditure upon prints and engravings is two hundred and sixteen pounds. Street Sellers of Manuscript Music There are only four sellers of manuscript music in the streets, who take on an average four shillings each weekly. Hence, we find the annual expenditure in this article amounts in round numbers to forty pounds. Total sum expended yearly in the streets on stationary literature and the fine arts, thirty-three thousand four hundred and forty-six pounds, twelve shillings. End of section fifty-two. Section 53 of London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Street Folk, Part 53. An Epitome of the Pattering Class. I wish, before passing to the next subject, the street sellers of manufactured articles, 
of one of whom the engraving here given furnishes a well-known specimen. I wish, I say, as I find some mistakes have occurred on the subject, to give the public a general view of the patras, as well as to offer some few observations concerning the means of improving the habits of street people in general. The patras consist of three distinct classes, namely those who sell something and patter to help off their goods, those who exhibit something and patter to help off the show, and those who do nothing but patter with a view to illicit alms. Under the head of patras who sell may be classed paper workers, quack doctors, cheap jacks, grease removers, wager patterers, ring sellers, dealers in corn salve, dealers in razor paste, French polish, plating balls, candle shades, rat poisons, and blacking, book auctioneers. The second class of patras includes jugglers, showmen, clowns, and fortune tellers, besides several exhibitors who invite public notice to the wonders of the telescope or microscope. The third and last class of patras are those who neither sell nor amuse, but only victimize those who get into their clutches. These, to use their own words, do it on the bounce. Their general resort is an inferior public house, sometimes a brothel or a coffee shop. One of the tricks of these worthies is to group together at a window, and if a well-dressed person pass by, to salute him with the contents of a flower bag. One of their pals, better dressed than the rest, immediately walks out, declares it was purely accidental, and invites the gentleman in to be brushed. Probably he consents, and still more probably if he be good-natured, he is plied with liquor, drugged with snuff for the occasion, and left in some obscure court, utterly stupefied. When he awakes, he finds that his watch, purse, and so on are gone. A casual observer, or even a stranger, may be induced to contract a wayside acquaintance with the parties to whom I allude, says one of the pattering class, from whom I have received much valuable information. And if he be a visitor of fairs and races, that acquaintance, though slight, may sometimes prove expensive. But casual observers cannot, from the complexity and varied circumstances of the characters now under notice, form anything like a correct view of them. I am convinced that no one can but those who have visited their haunts, and indeed lived among them for months together. They are not to be known, any more than the great city was to be built, in a day. This advantage, if so it may be called, has fallen to my lot. The three classes of patras above enumerated must not be confounded. The two first are essentially distinct from the last. At least they do something for their living. And though the pattering street tradesmen may generally overstep the bounds of truth in their glowing descriptions of the virtues of the goods they sell, still it should be remembered that they are no more dishonest in their dealings than the enterprising class of shopkeepers who resort to the printed mode of puffing off their wares. Indeed, the street sellers are far less reprehensible than their more wealthy brother puffers of the shops, who cannot plead want as an excuse for their dishonesty. The recent revelations made by the Lancet as to the adulteration of the articles of diet sold by the London grocers show that the patterers who sell practice far less imposition than some of our merchant princes. A tradesman in Tottenham Court Road, whose address the Lancet advertises gratis, thus proclaims the superior quality of his finest white pepper. One package of this article, which is the interior part of the kernel of the finest pepper, being equal in strength to nearly three times the quantity of black pepper, which is the inferior small shriveled berries, and often little more than husks, it will be not only the best, but the cheapest for every purpose. This super-excellent pepper, sold in packages price one penny, was found on analysis to consist of finely ground black pepper and a very large quantity of wheat flour. Indeed, the Lancet has demonstrated that as regards tea, coffee, arrowroot, sugar, and pepper sold by pattering shopkeepers, the rule invariably is that those are articles which are the most puffed, and warranted free from adulteration 
and to which the attention of families and invalids is particularly directed as being of the finest quality ever imported into this country are uniformly the most scandalously adulterated of all we should therefore remember while venting our indignation against pattering street sellers that they are not the only puffers in the world and that they at least can plead poverty in extenuation of their offence whereas it must be confessed that shopkeepers can have no other cause for their acts but their own brutalizing greed of gain the class of patterers with whom we have here to deal are those who patter to help off their goods but while describing them it has been deemed advisable to say a few words also on the class who do nothing but patter as a means of exciting commiseration to their assumed calamities these parties it should be distinctly understood are in no way connected with the puffing street sellers but in the exaggerated character of the orations they deliver they are mostly professional beggars or bouncers that is to say cheats of the lowest kind and will not work or do anything for their living this at least cannot be urged against the pattering street sellers who as was before stated do something for the bread they eat further to show the extent and system of the lodging and routes throughout the country of the class of lurkers and so on here described as all resorting to those places i got a patterer to write me out a list from his own knowledge of diverse routes and the extent of accommodation in the lodging houses i give it according to the patterer's own classification brighton is a town where there is a great many furnished cribs let to needies nightly lodgers that are mulled up that is to say associated with women in the sleeping rooms surrey and sussex wandsworth six dossing cribs or lodging houses nine beds one hundred and eight needies or nightly lodgers croydon nine dossing cribs or lodging houses eight beds one hundred and forty four needies or nightly lodgers reigate five dossing cribs or lodging houses six beds sixty needies or nightly lodgers cuckfield two dossing cribs or lodging houses eight beds thirty two needies or nightly lodgers Horsham, three dossing cribs or lodging houses, seven beds, fifty two needies or nightly lodgers. Lewis, seven dossing cribs or lodging houses, six beds, eighty four needies or nightly lodgers. Kingston, twelve dossing cribs or lodging houses, eight beds, one hundred and ninety two needies or nightly lodgers. Brighton, sixteen dossing cribs or lodging houses, nine beds, two hundred and twenty eight needies or nightly lodgers bristol a few years back an old woman kept a padding ken here she was a strong methodist but had a queer method there was thirty standing beds besides makeshifts and furnished rooms which were called cottages it's not so bad now the place was well known to the monkry and you was reckoned flat if you hadn't been there the old woman when any female old or young who had no tin came into the kitchen made up a match for her with some men fellows half drunk had the old women there was always a broomstick at hand and they was both made to jump over it and that was called a broomstick wedding without that ceremony a couple weren't looked on as man and wife in course the man paid in such case for the dos bed readers note another table of accommodation details again the first figure is for dossing cribs or lodging houses the second for beds and the third for needies or nightly lodgers End reader's note. Kensington, six dossing cribs, seven beds, eighty-four needies. Brentford, twelve dossing cribs, eight beds, one hundred and ninety-two needies. Hounslow, six dossing cribs, five beds, sixty needies. Colebrook, two dossing cribs, seven beds, twenty needies. Windsor, seven dossing cribs, ten beds, one hundred and forty needies. Maidenhead, four dossing cribs, five beds, forty needies. Reading, twelve dossing cribs, nine beds, two hundred and sixteen needies. Oxford, fourteen dossing cribs, seven beds, one hundred and ninety six needies. Banbury, ten dossing cribs, twelve beds, two hundred and forty needies. Marlborough, eight dossing cribs, seven beds, one hundred and twelve needies. Bath, ten dossing cribs, eight beds, one hundred and sixty needies. 
Bristol, 20 Dossing Cribs, 11 Beds, 440 Needies. Counties of Kent and Essex. Here is the best places in England for skipper birds. Note, parties that never go to lodging houses but to barns or outhouses, sometimes without a blanket. End note. The Kent farmers permit it to their own travellers, or the travellers they know. In Essex it's different. There a farmer will give a shilling rather than let a traveller sleep on his premises, for fear of robbery. Keyhole whistlers, the skipper birds are sometimes called, but they're regular travellers. Kent's the first county in England for them. They start early to good houses for victuals when gentlefolk are not up. I've seen them doze and sleep against the door. They like to be there before anyone cuts their cart. Note, exposes their tricks, end note. Travellers are all early risers. It's good morning in the country when it's good night in town. Kent. Deptford. 18 dossing cribs, 9 beds, 324 needies. Greenwich. 6 dossing cribs, 8 beds, 26 needies. Woolwich. 9 dossing cribs, 8 beds, 144 needies. Gravesend. 6 dossing cribs, 7 beds, 84 needies. Chatham. 20 dossing cribs, 10 beds, 400 needies. Maidstone, 5 dossing cribs, 7 beds, 70 needies. Sittingbourne, 3 dossing cribs, 6 beds, 36 needies. Sheerness, 4 dossing cribs, 5 beds, 40 needies. Faversham, 3 dossing cribs, 5 beds, 30 needies. Canterbury, 11 dossing cribs, 8 beds, 176 needies. Dover, 12 dossing cribs, 9 beds, 216 needies. Ramsgate, 4 dossing cribs, 5 beds, 40 needies. Margate, 6 dossing cribs, 6 beds, 72 needies. Essex, Stratford, 10 dossing cribs, 9 beds, 180 needies. Ilford, 3 dossing cribs, 7 beds, 52 needies. Barking, 4 dossing cribs, 6 beds, 48 needies. Billericay, 5 dossing cribs, 7 beds, 70 needies. Orsett, 2 dossing cribs, 8 beds, 32 needies. Rayleigh, 3 dossing cribs, 9 beds, 54 needies. Rochford, 3 dossing cribs, 8 beds, 48 needies. Lee, 4 dossing cribs, 8 beds, 64 needies. Pretty well, 2 dossing cribs, 7 beds, 28 needies. South End, 3 dossing cribs, 8 beds, 48 needies. Malden, 5 dossing cribs, 9 beds, 90 needies. Witham, 4 dossing cribs, 8 beds, 64 needies. Colchester, 15 dossing cribs, 10 beds, 300 needies. Windsor, at Ascot race time I've paid many one shillings just to sit up all night. Colchester, life in London at the Bugle, called hell upon earth sometimes. Barnet, five dossing cribs, one bed, eighty needies. Watford, six dossing cribs, eight beds, ninety needies. Hemel Hempstead, three dossing cribs, five beds, thirty needies. Uxbridge, six dossing cribs, seven beds, eighty-four needies. Tring, two dossing cribs, six beds, twenty-four needies. Dunstable, six dossing cribs, five beds, sixty needies. Stony Stratford, three dossing cribs, six beds, thirty-six needies. Northampton, thirteen dossing cribs, nine beds, two hundred and thirty-four needies. Toaster, four dossing cribs, seven beds, fifty-six needies. Daventry, five dossing cribs, nine beds, ninety needies. Coventry, sixteen dossing cribs, nine beds, two hundred and eighty-eight needies. Birmingham, fifty dossing cribs, eleven beds, one thousand one hundred needies. Hearts and Bedfordshire, Edmonton, 14 dossing cribs, 7 beds, 196 needies. Waltham Abbey, 3 dossing cribs, 6 beds, 36 needies. Chesant Street, 2 dossing cribs, 7 beds, 28 needies. Hoddesdon, 3 dossing cribs, 8 beds, 48 needies. Hartford, 9 dossing cribs, 9 beds, 162 needies. Ware, 7 dossing cribs, 10 beds, 140 needies. Puckeridge, two dossing cribs, five beds, twenty needies. Buntingford, three dossing cribs, eight beds, forty-eight needies. Royston, four dossing cribs, ten beds, forty needies. Hitchin, seven dossing cribs, nine beds, one hundred and twenty-six needies. Luton, six dossing cribs, eight beds, ninety-six needies. 
Bedford, nine dossing cribs, seven beds, 126 needies. St. Albans, eight dossing cribs, six beds, 96 needies. Suffolk and Norfolk, Ipswich, 24 dossing cribs, eight beds, 384 needies. Hadley, eight dossing cribs, seven beds, 112 needies. Halstead, five dossing cribs, six beds, 60 needies. Stowmarket, four dossing cribs, seven beds, 56 needies. Woodbridge, six dossing cribs, five beds, 60 needies. Sudbury, four dossing cribs, seven beds, 56 needies. Bury St. Edmunds, eight dossing cribs, eight beds, 128 needies. Thetford, three dossing cribs, six beds, 36 needies. Attleborough, two dossing cribs, five beds, 20 needies. Wyndham, one dossing crib, 11 beds, 22 needies. Norwich, 40 dossing cribs, 9 beds, 720 needies. Yarmouth, 16 dossing cribs, 8 beds, 256 needies. Of the Screevers, or Writers of Begging Letters and Petitions. Screeving, that is to say, writing false or exaggerated accounts of afflictions and privations, is a necessary corollary to pattering, or making pompous orations in public, and I here subjoin a brief description of the business, for although the screevers, economically considered, belong properly to the class who will not work, yet as they are intimately connected with the street trade of begging, I have thought it best to say a few words on the subject here, reserving a more comprehensive and scientific view of the subject till such time as I come to treat of the professional beggar, under the head of those who are able but unwilling to labour for their livelihood, in contradistinction to the involuntary beggars, who belong more properly to those who are willing but unable to work. The subjoined information has been obtained from one who has had many opportunities of making himself acquainted with the habits and tricks of the class here treated of, Indeed, at one part of his life he himself belonged to the profession. In England and Wales, the number of vagrants committed to prison annually amounts to 19,621, and as many are not imprisoned more than a dozen times during their lives, and a few never at all. The number of tramps and beggars may be estimated at the very lowest at 22,000 throughout England and Wales. The returns from Scotland are indeterminate. Of this wretched class, many are aged and infirm, others are destitute orphans, while not a few are persons whose distress is real and who suffer from temporary causes. With this excusable class, however, I have not now to do. Of professional beggars, there are two kinds, those who do it on the blob, by word of mouth, and those who do it by screeving, that is, by petitions and letters, setting forth imaginary cases of distress. Of these documents there are two sorts, slums, letters, and fakements, petitions. These are seldom written by the persons who present or send them, but are the production of a class of whom the public little imagine either the number or turpitude. I mean the professional begging letter writers. Persons who write begging letters for others sometimes, though seldom, beg themselves. They are in many cases well supported by the fraternity for whom they write. A professional of this kind is called by the cadgers, their man of business. Their histories vary as much as their abilities. Generally speaking, they have been clerks, teachers, shopmen, reduced gentlemen, or the illegitimate sons of members of the aristocracy, while others, after having received a liberal education, have broken away from parental control and commenced the profession in early life, and will probably pursue it to their graves. I shall take a cursory view of the various pretenses set forth in these begging documents, says my informant, and describe some of the scenes connected with their preparation. The documents themselves are mournful catalogues of all the ills that flesh is heir to. I address myself first to that class of petitions which represent losses by sea, or perhaps shipwreck itself. These documents are very seldom carried by one person, unless indeed he is really an old sailor and to the credit of the navy be it spoken, this is very seldom the case. When the imposition under notice has to be carried out, it is, for the most part, conducted by half a dozen worthless men dressed in the garb of seamen. 
and known as turnpike sailors one of their number having really been at sea and therefore able to reply to any nautical inquiries which suspicion may throw out this person mostly carries the document and is of course the spokesman of the company generally speaking the gang have a subscription book sometimes only a fly-leaf or two to the document to receive the names of contributors it may not be out of place here to give a specimen drawn from memory of one of those specious but deceitful fakements upon which the swells especially those who have been in the service come down with a counter sovereign if they granny the morley perceive the signature of a brother officer or friend the document is generally as follows these are to certify to all whom it may concern that the thunderer captain johnson was returning on her homeward bound passage from china laden with tea fruit and so on and having beside twenty passengers chiefly ladies and a crew of thirty hands exclusive of the captain and other officers that the said vessel encountered a tremendous gale off the banks of newfoundland and was dismasted and finally wrecked at midnight on such a day including the hour latitude and other particulars that the above-named vessel speedily foundered and only the second mate and four of the crew the bearers of this certificate escaped a watery grave these after floating several days on broken pieces of the ship were providentially discovered and humanely picked up by the brig invincible captain smith and landed in this town and harbour of portsmouth in the county of hants that we the master of customs and two of her majesty's justices of the peace for the said harbour and county do hereby grant and afford to the said here follows the names of the unfortunate mariners this our vouchment of the truth of the said wreck and their connection therewith and do empower them to present and use this certificate for twenty-eight days from the date hereof to enable them to get such temporal aid as may be adequate to reaching their respective homes or any seaport where they may be re-engaged and this certificate further showeth that they are not to be interrupted in the said journey by any constabulary or other official authority provided that is to say that no breach of the peace or other cognizable offence be committed by the said petitioners as witness our hands john harris m c one pound no shillings no pence james flood j p one pound no shillings no pence captain w hope r n j p one pound ten shillings no pence given at portsmouth this tenth day of october eighteen fifty god save the queen rev w wilkins one pound no shillings no pence an officer's widow no pounds ten shillings no pence an old sailor no pounds five shillings no pence a friend no pounds two shillings sixpence i have already hinted at the character and description of the persons by whom these forgeries are framed it would seem from the example given that such documents are available in every seaport or other considerable town but this is not the case it is true that certain kinds of documents especially sham hawkers licenses may be had in the provinces at prices suited to the importance of their contents or to the probable gains of their circulation but all the regular bang-up fakes are manufactured in the start metropolis and are sent into the country to order carefully packed up and free from observation the following note sent to carroty pole at mrs finder's lodging house facing the horse and trumpet beer shop hand street westminster london with speed may tend to illuminate the uninitiated as to how such fakements are obtained dear pole i hope this will find you and george in good health and spirits things is very bad here your sister liza has been confined and got a fine strapping boy they was very bad off when it happened they say in my country it never rains but it pours and so it was pole for my william has got a month along with cockney harry for a glim lurk and they come out next monday and i have pawned my new shift and every individual thing to get them a breakfast and a drop of rum the morning they comes out they won't have no paper to work and i don't know what they will do tailor tom lent me a shilling which i send enclosed and you must pawn something for another shilling and get joe the laurier to write a fake for william not a glim lost by fire but a break 
say as he had a horse fell down with the mad staggers and broke all his plates and dishes and we are starving you can say that the children he's got the measles they have been ill that's no lie and we want to raise a little money to get another animal to draw the cart put a few monikers names to it and make it dirty and date it some time back do not neglect and don't fail to pay the post no more at present from your loving sister jane n blank at mr john h blank the sweep next door to the five bells grinstead colchester essex good-bye the person from whom the above letter was obtained was in the lodging-house when it arrived and had it given to him to read and retain for reference lawyer joe was soon sent for and the following is an outline of the scene that occurred given in my informant's own words i had called at the house whither the above letter had been addressed to inquire for a man whom i had known in his and my own better days the kitchen door or rather cellar door was thrust open and in came carroty pole herself well pole asked the deputy how does the world use you b blank bad was the reply where's lawyer joe oh he's just gone to mother linstead's for some tea and sugar here he comes joe i've got a job for you how much do you charge for screeving a break oh half a bull half a crown now i'll give you a deuce of dinas two shillings cause don't you see the poor b blank is in stir prison well well i shan't stand for a tanner have you got paper yes and a queen's head and all the pen and ink were found a corner of the table cleared and operations commenced he writes a good hand exclaimed one as the screever wrote the petition i wish i could do it said another if you could you'd soon be transported said a third while the whole kitchen in one chorus immediately on its completion proclaimed that it was d blank d well done adding to that not one swell in a score would view it in any other light than a ream genuine concern lawyer joe was up to his trade he folded the paper in official style creased it as if it was long written and often examined attached the signatures of the minister and church wardens and dipping his finger under the fireplace smeared it with ashes and made the whole the best representation of a true account of a horse in the mad staggers and a child in the measles that could be desired by the oldest and best cadger on the monkery these professional writers are in possession of many autographs of charitable persons and as they keep a dozen or more bottles of different shades of ink and seldom write two documents on exactly the same sort of paper it is difficult to detect the imposition a famous lurker who has been previously alluded to in this work was once taken before a magistrate at york whose own signature was attached to his fakement the imitation was excellent and the lurker swore hard and fast to the worthy justice that he the justice did write it in his own saddle-room as he was preparing to ride and gave him five shillings too the effrontery and firmness of the prisoner's statement gained him his discharge it is not uncommon in extensive districts say for instance a section of a county taking in ten or a dozen townships for a school of lurkers to keep a secretary and remit his work and his pay at the same time in london this functionary is generally paid by commission and sometimes partly in food beer and tobacco the following is a fair estimate of the scale of charges friendly letter no shillings sixpence long ditto no shillings ninepence petition one shilling no pence ditto with re monikers genuine signatures one shilling and sixpence ditto with gammy monikers forged names two shillings and sixpence very heavy dangerous three shillings manuscript for a broken down author ten shillings no pence part of a play for ditto seven shillings and sixpence to this i may add the prices of other articles in the begging line loan of one child without grub no shillings nine pence two ditto one shilling no pence ditto with grub and godfrey's cordial no shillings nine pence if out after twelve at night for each child extra no shillings two pence for a school of children say half a dozen two shillings and sixpence loan of any garment per day no shillings two pence going as a pal to vindicate any statement one shilling no pence such is an outline open to circumstantial variation of the pay received for the sort of accommodation required there is a very important species of lurking or screeving which has not yet been alluded to 
it is well known that in the colliery districts an explosion of fire damp frequently takes place when many lives are lost and the men who escape are often so wounded as to render amputation of a leg or arm the only probable means of saving them from the grave of course the accident with every particular as to date and locality goes the round of the newspapers such an event is the sort of godsend to the begging letter writer if he is anything of a draughtsman so much the better he then procures a sheet of vellum and heads it with a picture of an explosion and exhibiting men boys and horses up in the air and a few nearer the ground minus a head a leg or an arm with a background of women tearing their hair and a few little girls crying such a fakement professionally filled up and put into the hands of an experienced lurker will bring the amanuensis or screever two guineas at least and the proceeds of such an expedition have in many cases averaged sixty pounds per week the lurker presenting this would have to take with him three or four countrymen dressed in the garb of colliers one at least knowing something of underground work these he would engage at a bob a knob one shilling each and if he made a good day give them a toothful of rum beside as such men are always left outside the jigger door of the houses they are of course ignorant of the state of the subscription list a famous lurker to whom we've previously referred nicholas a blank kept a man of business to himself and gave him from five shillings to ten shillings and sixpence per day nicholas who was tolerably educated could write very well but as his secretary could imitate twelve different hands he was of course no trifling acquisition it would not be easy to trace the history of all or even many of the men who pursue the begging letter trade as professional writers many of the vagrant tribe write their own letters but the vast majority are obliged to have assistance of course they are sometimes detected by the fact that their conversation does not tally with the rhetorical statement of the petition the few really deserving persons well born and highly educated who subsist by begging are very retired and cautious in their appeals they write concisely and their statements are generally true to a certain extent or perhaps rigidly so in relation to an earlier part of their history these seldom live in the very common lodging houses the most renowned of the tribe who write for others and whose general trade lies in forged certificates of bankruptcy seizure of goods for rent and medical testimonies to infirmity is an irishman brought up in london and who may be seen almost every night at the bar of a certain public house in drury lane he lives or did live at one of the model lodging houses very few persons know his occupation they suppose that he is connected with the press several years ago this person says one who knew this trade well was regularly hard up and made a tender of his services to a distinguished m p who took a lively interest in the emancipation of the jews he offered to visit the provinces hold meetings and get up petitions the honourable member tested his abilities and gave him clothes and a ten pound note to commence operations i saw him says my informant the same night and he mooted the subject to me over a glass of whisky punch not that i care said he if all the b blank y jews were in h blank l l but i must do something but how asked my informant will you get up the meetings and then the signatures you know meetings was the reply don't mention it i can get millions of signatures the pretended jewish advocate never left london he got from ireland a box of old documents relative to bygone petitions for repeal and so on and on these he put a frontispiece suited to his purpose got them sent to bath and bristol and thence transmitted to his employer who praised his perseverance and sent more money to the post office of one of the above named towns this was countermanded to London, and jovially spent at Tom Springs in Hoban. Hitherto, the movements of the begging letter writer, self-considered, have been chiefly dwelt upon. There is another class of the fraternity, however, of whom some notice must here be taken, namely, those who, to meet cases of great pretension and consequent misgivings on the part of the noblemen or gentry to whom fakements are presented, become referees to professional beggars these referees are kept by local schools of beggars in well-furnished apartments at respectable houses and well dressed their allowance varies from one pound to three pounds per week but the most expert and least suspected dodge 
is referring to some dignified person in the country, a person, however, who exists nowhere but in imagination. Suppose, says my informant, I am a beggar. I apply to you for relief. Perhaps I state that I am in prospect of lucrative employment, if I could get enough money to clothe myself. You plead the number of impositions. I consent to that fact, but offer you references as to the truth of my statement. I refer you to the Honourable and Reverend Mr. Erskine at Cheltenham. Any name or place will do. You promise to write and tell me to call in a few days. Meanwhile, I assume the name of the gentleman to whom I have referred you, and write forthwith to the postmaster of the town in question, requesting that any letter coming there, directed to the Honourable and Reverend Mr. Erskine, may be forwarded to my present address. I thus discover what you have written, frame a flattering reply, and address it to you. I send it under cover to a pal of mine at Cheltenham, or elsewhere, who posts it. I call half an hour after you receive it, and, being satisfied, you give me a donation, and perhaps introduce me to some of your friends. Thus I raise a handsome sum, and the fraud is probably never found out. One of the London lurkers who has good means of forming a calculation on the subject assures me that the average earnings of lurkers in London alone, including those who write for them, cannot be less than £6,000 per annum. Two of the class were lately apprehended at the instance of the Duke of Wellington. On their persons was found fifteen sovereigns, one five-pound note, a silver watch with gold guard, and two gold watches with a ribbon attached to each. Their subscription book showed that they had collected six hundred and twenty pounds during the current year. A man named Mackenzie, who was transported at the last Bristol Assizes, had just received a cheque for one hundred pounds from a nobleman lately deceased. Most of the professionals of this class include a copy of the Court Guide among their stock in trade. In this, all the persons known to be charitable have the mark, reader's note, a small circle divided into four quarters, end reader's note, set against their names. I have been furnished with a list of such persons, accompanied with comments, from the notebook of an old stager, thirty years on the monkery, and as he adds, never quodded but twice. The late Queen Dowager, Honourable William Ashley, the Bishop of Norwich, Sergeant Talford, Charles Dickens, Samuel Rogers, the poet, Samuel Warren, author of extracts from the diary of a physician, Honourable G.C. Norton, the beak, magistrate, but good for all that, Reverend E. Holland, Hyde Park Gardens, the late Sir Robert Peel, Countess of Essex, only good to sickness or distressed authorship, Marquis of Breadalbane, good on anything religious, the editor of The Sun, Madame Celeste, Marquis of Blandford, Duke of Portland, Duke of Devonshire, Lord John Bentinck, deceased, God Almighty wouldn't let him live, he was too good for this world, Lord Skelmersdale, Lord John Manners, Lord Littleton, Mrs. Elder, Exeter, Lady Emily Ponsonby, a devilish pretty wench, Miss Burdett Coutts, F. Stewart, Esquire, Bath, Mrs. Groves, Salisbury, Mrs. Mitchell, Dorchester, Mrs. Taggart, Bayswater. Her husband is a Unitarian minister, not so good as she, but he'll stand a bob if you look straight at him and keep to one story. Archdeacon Sinclair at Kensington, but not so good as Archdeacon Pott, as was there afore him. He was a good man. He couldn't refuse a dog, much more a Christian, but he had a butler, a regular knock, who was a B-blank and a half. Good weight. Lady Cottenham used to be good, but she is coopered, spoilt, now, without you as a slum, any one as she knows, and then she won't stand above a bull. Five shillings. End of section 53section fifty four of london labour and the london poor by henry mayhew volume one this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley the street folk part fifty four of the probable means of reformation i shall now conclude this account of the patterers lurkers and screevers with some observations from the pen of one who has had ample means of judging as to the effect of the several plans now in operation for the reformation or improvement of the class in looking over the number of institutions writes the person alluded to 
designed to reform and improve the classes under review, we are, as it were, overwhelmed with their numerous branches, and though it is highly gratifying to see so much good being done, it is necessary to confine this notice to the examination of only the most prominent, with their general characteristics. The churches, on many considerations, personal feelings being the smallest but not unknown, demand attention first. I must treat this subject, for your work is not a theological magazine, without respect to doctrine, principle, or legislation. The object of erecting churches in poor neighbourhoods is to benefit the poor. Why is it, then, that the instruction communicated should exercise so little influence upon the vicious, the destitute, and the outcast? Is it that Christian ordinances are less adapted to them than to others? Or rather, is it not that the public institutions of the clergy are not made interesting to the wretched community in question? The great hindrance, in my opinion, to the progress of religion among the unsettled classes is that having been occasionally to church or chapel and heard nothing but doctrinal lectures or feverish mental effusions, they cannot see the application of these to everyday trade and practice, and so they arrive at the conclusion that they can get as much or more good at home. Our preachers seem to be afraid of ascertaining the sentiments, feelings, and habits of the more wretched part of the population, and without this their words will die away upon the wind, and no practical echo answer their addresses. It will perhaps relieve the monotony of this statement if I give an illustration communicated to me by a person well qualified to determine the merits of the question. Your readers will probably recollect the opposition experienced by Dr. Hampton, on his promotion to the bishopric of Hereford. Shortly after the affair was settled, his lordship accepted an invitation to preach on behalf of the schools connected with the ten new churches of Bethnal Green. The church selected for the purpose was the one on Friars Mount. It was one July Sunday in 1849, and, as I well remember, the morning was very wet. But supposing the curiosity or better motives of the public would induce a large congregation, I went to the church at half-past ten. The free seats occupying the middle aisle were all filled, and chiefly with persons of the lowest and worst classes, many of whom I personally knew, and was agreeably surprised to find them in such a place. I sat in the midst of the group, and at the elbow of a tall, attenuated beggar known by the name of Lath and Plaster, of whom it is but justice to say that he repeated the responsive parts of the service very correctly. It is true he could not read, but having learned a few prayers in the Downs, Tothill Fields Prison, he always said em night and morning if he wasn't drunk, and then he said em twice next day, cause, reasoned he, I likes to rub off as I goes on. In course of time the bishop made his appearance in the pulpit. His subject was neglected education, and he illustrated it from the history of Eli. I thought proper to hang back and observe the group as they passed out of the church. There was Taylor Tom and Brummagan Dick, and Keat Street Nancy, and Davy the Duke, and Stationer George, and at least two dozen more, most of whom were miserably clad, and several apparently without a shirt. They were not, however, without half-pence, and as I was well known to several of the party, and flattered as being a very knowledgeable man, I was invited to the cat and bagpipes afterwards to have a share of what was going. I was anxious, continues my informant, to learn from my companions their opinion of the right reverend prelate. They thought, to use their own words, he was a jolly old brick, but did they think he was sound in opinion about the Trinity, or was he, as alleged, a Unitarian? They did not even understand the meaning of these words. All they did understand was that a top sawyer parson at Oxford called Dr. Pussy had made himself disagreeable, and that some of the bishops and nobility had joined him, and that these had persecuted Dr. Hampton, because he was more cleverer than themselves, and that Lord John Russell, who, generally speaking, was a regular muff, had acted like a man in this instance, and he ought to be commended for it, and added the man who pronounced the above sentiment, it's just a picture of ourselves. To other ears than mine, the closing remark would have appeared impertinent, but I tumbled to it immediately, 
it was a case of oppression and whether the oppressors belonged to oxford university or to scotland yard militated nothing against the aphorism it's just a picture of ourselves it seems to me that these poor creatures understood the circumstances better than they did the sermon and my inference is that whether from the parochial pulpit or the missionary exhortation or in the printed form of a tract those who wish to produce a practical effect must themselves be practical men i who have been in the christian ministry and am familiar unhappily with the sufferings of men of every grade among the outcast would say if you wish to do these poor outcasts real good you must mould your language to their ideas get hold of their common phrases those which tell so powerfully when they are speaking to each other let them have their own fashion of things and where it does not interfere with order and decency use yourselves language which their unpolished minds will appreciate and then having gained their entire confidence and perhaps their esteem you may safely strike home though it be as with a sledgehammer and they will even love you for the smart the temperance movement next claims attention and i doubt not that much crime and degradation has been prevented by total abstinence from all intoxicating drinks but i would rather raise the tone of moral feeling by intelligent and ennobling means than by those spasmodic efforts which are without deliberation and often without permanency the object sought to be obtained however is good so is the motive and i leave to others to judge what means are most likely to secure it i may also allude as another means of reformation to the ragged schools which are now studying the localities of the poorest neighbourhoods the object of these schools is one would hope to take care of the uncared for and to give instruction to those who would be otherwise running wild and growing up as a pest to society a few instances of real reform stand however in juxtaposition with many of increased hardihood i as a man seeing those who resort to ragged schools cannot understand the propriety of insulting an honest though ragged boy by classing him with a young thief or the hope of improving the juvenile female character where the sexes are brought in promiscuous contact and left unrestrained on their way home to say and do everything subversive of the good instruction they have received note it is right i should here state that these are my informant's own unbiased sentiments delivered without communication with myself on the subject i say thus much because my own opinions being known it might perhaps appear as if i had exerted some influence over the judgment of my correspondent End note. the most efficient means of moral reform among the street folk appear to have been consulted by those who in westminster and other places have opened institutions cheaper but equally efficient as the mechanics institutes of the metropolis in these for one farthing per night three halfpence a week or sixpence a month lectures exhibitions newspapers and so on are available to the very poor these and such as these i humbly but earnestly would commend to public sympathy and support believing that under the auspices of heaven they may deliver the outcast and poor from their own mistaken views and practices and make them ornamental to that society to which they have long been expensive and dangerous another laudable attempt to improve the condition of the poorer class is by the erection of model lodging-houses the plan which induced this measure was good and the success has been tolerable but i am inclined to think the management of these houses as well as their internal regulation is scarcely what their well-meaning founders designed the principal of these buildings is in george street st giles's the building is spacious and well ventilated there is a good library and the class of lodgers very superior to what might be expected this latter circumstance makes the house in question scarcely admissible to the catalogue of reformed lodging houses for the very poor the next model lodging house in importance is the one in charles street drury lane this from personal observation having lodged in it more than four months says my informant i can safely say so far as social reform is concerned is a miserable failure the bedrooms are clean but the sitting-room though large is the scene of dirt and disorder noise confusion and intemperance abound from morning till night there is a model lodging-house in westminster the private property of lord kinnaird it is generally well conducted his lordship's agent visits the place once a week 
there is an almost profuse supply of cooking utensils and other similar comforts. There are, moreover, two spacious reading rooms, abundance of books and periodicals, and every lodger on payment of sixpence is provided with two lockers, one in his bedroom and the other below stairs. The money is returned when the person leaves the house. There is divine service every day, conducted by different missionaries, and twice on Sundays. Attendance on these services is optional, and as there are two ways of ingress and egress, the devout and undevout need not come in contact with each other. The kitchen is very large and detached from the house. The master of this establishment is a man well fitted for his situation. He is a native of Saffron Walden in Essex, where his father farmed his own estate. He received a superior education, and has twice had a fortune at his own disposal. He did dispose of it, however, and, after many roving years as a traveller, lurker, and patterer, he has settled down in his present situation and maintained it with great credit for a considerable period. The beds in this house are only threepence per night, and no small praise is due to Lord Kinnaird for the superiority of this model over others of the same denomination. Such are a few of the principal of these establishments, giving every credit to their founders, however, for purity and even excellence of motive, I doubt if model lodging-houses, as at present conducted, are likely to accomplish much real good for those who get their living in the streets. Ever and anon they are visited by dukes and bishops, lords and ladies, who march in procession past every table, scrutinise every countenance, make their remarks upon the quantity and quality of food, and then go into the lobby, sign their names, jump into their carriages, and drive away, declaring that, after all, there is not so much poverty in London as they supposed. The poor inmates of these houses, moreover, adds my informant, are kept in bondage, and made to feel that bondage, to the almost annihilation of old English independence. It is thought by the managers of these establishments, and with some share of propriety, that persons who get their living by any honest means may get home and go to bed, according to strict rule at a certain prescribed hour. In one house it is ten o'clock, in the others eleven. But many of the best conducted of these poor people, if they be street folk, are at those very hours in the height of their business, and have therefore to pack up their goods and carry home with their cumbersome and perhaps heavy load, a distance usually varying from two or three to six or seven miles. If they are a minute beyond time, they are shut out, and have to seek lodgings in a strange place. On their return next morning they are charged for the bed they were prevented from occupying, and if they demur, they are at once expelled. Thus the model lodgers are kept, as it were, in leading strings, and triumphed over by lords and ladies, masters and matrons, who, while they pique themselves on the efforts they are making to better the conditions of the poor, are making them their slaves, and driving them into unreasonable thraldom, while the rich and noble managers, reckless of their own professed benevolence, are making the poor poorer by adding insult to wretchedness. If my remarks upon these establishments appear, adds the writer of the above remarks, to be invidious, it is only in appearance that they are so. I give their promoters credit for the best intentions, and as far as sanitary and moral measures are concerned, I rejoice in the benefit while suggesting the improvement. Everything even moderately valuable has its counterfeit. We have counterfeit money, counterfeit virtue, counterfeit modesty, counterfeit religion, and last but not least, counterfeit model lodging houses. Many private adventurers have thus dignified their domiciles, and some of them highly merit the distinction, while with others it is only a cloak for greater uncleanliness and grosser immorality. There has come to my knowledge the case of one man who owns nearly a dozen of these dens of infamy, in one of which a poor girl under fifteen was lately ruined by a grey-headed monster who, according to the pseudo-model regulations, slept in an adjoining bed. The sham model houses, to which I more particularly allude, says my correspondent, are in Shorts Gardens, Drury Lane, Mill Yard, Cable Street, Keat Street, Flower and Dean Street, Thrall Street, Spitalfields, Plough Court, Whitechapel, and Union Court, Hoban. All of these are, without exception, tuppenny brothels, headquarters of low-lived procuresses, and resorts of young thieves and prostitutes. Each of the houses is managed by a deputy, who receives an income of eight shillings and twopence per week, out of which he has to provide coke, candles, soap, and so on, 
course it is impossible to do this from such small resources, and the men consequently increase their salaries by taking in couples for a little while, purchasing stolen goods and other nefarious practices. Worse than all, the person owning these houses is a member of a strict Baptist church and the son of a deceased minister. He lives in great splendour in one of the fashionable streets in Pimlico. It still remains for me, my correspondent continues, to contemplate the best agency for promoting the reformation of the poor. The city mission, if properly conducted, as it brings many good men in close contact with the outcast and poor, might be made productive of real and extensive good. Whether it has done so, or done so to any extent, is perhaps an open question. Our town missionary society sprang up when our different Christian denominations were not fully alive to the apprehension of their own duties to their poorer brethren who were lost to principle, conscience, and society. That the object of the London City Mission is most noble needs no discussion and admits of no dispute. The method of carrying out this great object is by employing agents who are required to give their whole time to the work without engaging in any secular concerns of life. And regarding the operation of the work so done, I must say that great good has resulted from the enterprise. At the commencement of the labours of the mission in any particular locality, great opposition was manifested, and a great amount of prejudice, with habits of the most immoral kind, openly carried on without any public censure, had to be overcome. The statements of the missionaries have from time to time been published, and lie recorded against us as a nation of the glaring evils and ignorance of a vast portion of our people. It is principally owing to the city missionaries that the other portions of society have known what they now do of the practices and habits of the poor. It is principally due to their exertions that schools have been established in connection with their labours, and the ragged schools, one of the principal movements of the last few years, are mainly to be attributed to their efforts. A man, says my informant in conclusion, can receive little benefit from a thing he does not understand. The talk which will do for the Senate will not do for the cottage, and the argument which will do for the study will not do for the man who spends all his spare time in a public house. These remarks will apply to the distribution of tracts, which should be couched in the very language that is used by the people to whom they are addressed. Then the ideas will penetrate their understanding. Some years back I met with an old sailor in a lodging house in Westminster, who professed a belief that there had once been a god, but that he was either dead or grown old and diseased. He did not dispute the inspiration of the Bible. He believed that there had been revelations made to our forefathers when God was alive and active, but that now the Almighty did not fash trouble himself about his creatures at all. I endeavoured to instruct the man in his own rude language and ideas, and after he had thus been made to comprehend the doctrine of the atonement, he said, I see it all plain enough, though I've liked to drop a drink, and been a devil among the gals and all that, in my time, if I'll humble myself I can have it all wiped off. And as the song says, we may be happy yet, because as the saying is, it's all square with God Almighty. Whether the sailor permanently reformed I'm unable to say, for I lost sight of him shortly after. At any rate, he understood the subject and was thus qualified to profit by it. And what can the teachers of Christianity among the British heathen, herded together in courts and alleys, tell their poor ignorant hearers better than the old sailor's aphorism? You have indeed gone astray from your greatest and best friend, but if you so desire, you may be happy yet, because it's all square with God Almighty. Before quitting this subject, I would add, if you really wish to do these poor creatures good, you must remember that your instructions are not intended for so-called fashionable society, but for those who have a fashion of their own. If you lose sight of this fact, your words will die away upon the wind, and no echo in the hearts of these poor people will answer your addresses. The above observations are from the pen of one who has not only had the means, but is likewise possessed of the power of judging as to the effect of the several plans now in course of operation for the reformation and improvement of the London poor. I have given the comments in the writer's own language, because I was anxious that the public should know the opinions of the best informed of the street people themselves on this subject, and I trust I need not say that I have sought in no way to influence my correspondent's judgment.
I now subjoin a communication from a clergyman in the country, touching the character of the tramps and lurkers frequenting his neighbourhood, together with some suggestions concerning the means of improving the condition of the London poor. These I append because it is advisable that in so difficult a matter, the sentiments of every one, having sufficient experience, judgment, and heart to fit him to speak on the subject, should be calmly attended to, so that, amid much counsel, there may be at least some little wisdom. The subject of the welfare of our poorer brethren was one which engaged much of my attention twenty years ago, when studying for the bar at Lincoln's Inn, before I entered into orders, and the inquiries and so on, then made by me in reference to London, are recalled by many of your pages. I have pursued the same course according to my limited means and opportunities, for my benefice, like thousands of others, is but one hundred pounds a year, in this neighbourhood, and there are very many of my clerical brethren also, deeply anxious and exerting their means for the country poor. The details given in your numbers as to the country tramps and patterers I can fully corroborate from personal experience and knowledge, so far as the country part of it. We never give money to beggars here on any pretense whatever. We never give clothes. We never give relief to a naked or half-naked man if we can avoid it. The imposture is too barefaced. Medicine I do give occasionally to the sick, or pretended sick, and see them take it. Every beggar may have dry bread, or three or four tracts to sell, but never both. I know we are even thus often imposed on, but it is better to run this risk than to turn away, by chance, a starving man, and I do see the mendicants often sit down on a field near, and eat the dry bread with ravenous look. The tramps sometimes come to church on Sunday, and then beg, but we never give even bread on Sunday, because on that day they can get help at the Union workhouse, and it only tempts idlers. Sometimes we are days without a beggar, and then there will be ten to twenty per day, and then all at once the stream stops. There are no tramp lodging-houses in my parish, which is a village of six hundred or seven hundred people. Most of the burglaries hereabouts seem connected with some inroad of tramps into the neighbourhood. The lodging-houses are very bad in some of the small towns near, but somehow the magistrates cannot get to them put down. The gentry are alive here to the evil of crowded cottages and so on, and are using efforts to build better and more decent ones but the evil results from the little landowners who have an acre or two or less, and build rows of cottages on them of the scantiest dimensions, at high rents, ten per cent on the cost of building. The rents of the gentry and nobility are very moderate to the poor, namely, scarcely two per cent, beyond the yearly repairs, on the market value of the cottage. In 1832 I succeeded in getting land allotments for the poor here, and most of the parishes round have followed our example since. The success to the poor has always depended on the rent being a real rent, such as is paid by the land round about, and on the rules of good management, and of payment of rent being rigidly enforced. The character of the poor of England must be raised as well as their independence. They must not be left to lean on charity. I am sure that the sterling worth of the English character can only be raised by that means to the surface of society among the poor. The English is a fine material, but the poor neither value nor are benefited by mawkish nonsense or excessive feeling. I believe this parish was one of the most fearfully demoralized twenty years ago. It was said there was not one young female cottager of virtuous character. There was not one man who was not or had not been a drunkard, and theft, fighting, and so on, and so on, were universal. It is greatly better now, totally different, and I attribute the change to the land allotments, the Provident Society, the Village Horticultural Society, the Lending Library, the Clothing Club, the Coal Club, the Cultivating a Taste for Music, and so on, and so on, as subsidiary to the more directly pastoral work of a clergyman and the schools, and so on. I am probably visionary in my ideas, but the perusal of your pages has led me to think that, were I a clergyman of a parish where the street folks lived, I should aim at some schemes of this style in addition to the Benefit Society and Loan Society, the last most important, 
as proposed by yourself one to get music taught at a halfpenny a week or something of the kind a ragged school music room if the people would learn gratis would be still better as a step to a superior music class at one penny per week two to get the poor to adorn their rooms plentifully with a better class of pictures of places of people of natural history and of historical and religious subjects just as they might like and a circulating library for pictures if they preferred change this i find takes with the village poor provide these things excessively cheap for them at nominal prices just high enough to prevent them being sold at a profit by the poor three to establish a monthly or fortnightly sheet or little book for the poor at a halfpenny or some trifle full of pictures such as they would like but free from impropriety it might be called the coster's barrow or some name which would take their fancy and contain pictures for those who cannot read and reading for those who can its contents should be instructive and yet lively as for instance the history of london bridge history of a codfish travels of whelks dreams of st paul's old history of england voice from the bottom of the coal exchange roman tales true tale of trafalgar and so on and so on all very short articles at which perhaps they might be angry or praise or abuse or do anything but still would read or hear and talk about if possible the little work might have a corner called the next world's page or any name of the kind with nothing in it but the lord's prayer or the creed or the ten commandments or a parable or miracle or discourse of christ's in the exact words of scripture without any commentary which could neither annoy the roman catholics nor others those parts in which the douay version differs from ours might be avoided and the romanists be given to understand that they would always be avoided the more difficult question of cheap amusements instead of the demoralizing ones now popular is one which as yet i cannot see my way through but it is one which must be grappled with if any good is to be done i write thus adds my correspondent because i feel you are a fellow worker so far as your labours show it for the cause of god's poor and therefore will sympathise in anything another worker can say from experience on the same subject such are the opinions of two of my correspondents each looking at the subject from different points of view the one living among the people of whom he treats and daily witnessing the effects of the several plans now in operation for the moral and physical improvement of the poor and the other in frequent intercourse with the tramps and lurkers on their vagrant excursions through the country as well as with the resident poor of his own parish the former living in friendly communion with those of whom he writes and the latter visiting them as their spiritual adviser and material benefactor i would however before passing to the consideration of the next subject here pause to draw special attention to the distinctive features of the several classes of people obtaining their livelihood in the streets these viewed in regard to the causes which have induced them to adopt this mode of life may be arranged in three different groups namely one those who are bred to the streets two those who take to the streets three those who are driven to the streets the class bred to the streets are those whose fathers having been street sellers before them have sent them out into the thoroughfares at an early age to sell either watercresses lavender oranges nuts flowers apples onions and so on as a means of eking out the family income of such street apprenticeship several notable instances have already been given and one or two classes of juvenile street sellers as the lucifer match and the blacking sellers still remain to be described another class of street apprentice is to be found in the boys engaged to wheel the barrows of the costers and who are thus at an early age tutored in all the art and mystery of street traffic and who rarely abandon it at maturity these two classes may be said to constitute the natives of the streets the tribe indigenous to the paving stones imbibing the habits and morals of the gutters almost with their mother's milk to expect that children thus nursed in the lap of the kennel should when men not bear the impress of the circumstances amid which they have been reared 
is to expect to find costermongers heroes instead of ordinary human beings. We might as well blame the various races on the face of the earth for those several geographical peculiarities of taste which constitute their national characteristics. Surely there is a moral acclimatization as well as a physical one, and the heart may become inured to a particular atmosphere in the same manner as the body. And even as the seed of the apple returns, unless grafted, to its original crab, so does the child, without training, go back to its parent stock, the vagabond savage. For the bred and born street seller, who inherits a barrow, as some do coronets, to be other than he is, it has here been repeatedly enunciated, is no fault of his, but of ours, who could and yet will not move to make him otherwise. Might not the finest gentleman in Europe have been the greatest blackguard in Billingsgate, had he been born to carry a fish-basket on his head instead of a crown, and by a parity of reasoning, let the roughest rough outside the London fish-market have had his lot in life cast by the grace of God, King, Defender of the Faith, and surely his shoulders would have glittered with diamond epaulettes instead of fish-scales. I say thus much to impress upon the reader a deep and devout sense that we who have been appointed to another state are by the grace of God what we are, and from no special merit of our own, to which, in the arrogance of our self-conceit, we are too prone to attribute the social and moral differences of our nature. Go to a lady of fashion, and tell her she could have even become a fish-fag, and she will think you some mad ethnologist if indeed she had ever heard of the science. Let me not, however, while thus seeking to impress the reader's mind with a sense of the antecedents of the human character, be thought to espouse the doctrine that men are merely the creatures of events. All I wish to enforce is that the three common causes of the social and moral differences of individuals are to be found in race, organization, and circumstances that none of us are entirely proof against the influence of these three conditions, the ethnological, the physiological, and the associative elements of our idiosyncrasy. But while I admit the full force of external nature upon us all, while I allow that we are in many respects merely patients, still I cannot but perceive that in other respects we are self-agents, moving rather than being moved by events often stemming the current of circumstances, and at other times giving to it a special direction, rather than being swept along with it. I am conscious that it is this directive and controlling power, not only over external events, but over the events of my own nature, that distinguishes me as well from the brute of the fields, as it does my waking from my sleeping moments. I know, moreover, that in proportion as a man is active or passive in his operations, so is his humanity or brutality developed. That true greatness lies in the superiority of the internal forces over the external ones, and that as heroes or extraordinary men are heroes, because they overcome the sway of one or other or all of the three material influences above named, so ordinary people are ordinary simply because they lack energy principle, will, call it what you please, to overcome the material elements of their nature with the spiritual. And it is precisely because I know this that I do know that those who are bred to the streets must bear about them the moral impress of the kennel and the gutter, unless we seek to develop the inward and the controlling part of their constitution. If we allow them to remain the creatures of circumstances, to wander through life principleless, purposeless, conscienceless, if it be their lot to be flung on the wide waste of waters without a guiding star above, or a rudder or compass within, how can we, the well-fed, dare to blame them, because wanting bread they prey and live upon their fellow creatures? I say thus much because I feel satisfied that a large portion of the street folk, and especially those who have been bred to the business, are of improvable natures, that they crave knowledge as starving men for the staff of life, that they are most grateful for instruction, 
that they are as deeply moved by any kindness and sympathy when once their suspicion has been overcome as they are excited by any wrong or oppression and i say it moreover because i feel thoroughly convinced of the ineffectiveness of the present educational resources for the poor we think if we teach them reading and writing and to chatter a creed that we have armed them against the temptations the trials and the exasperations of life believing because we have put the knife and fork in their hands that we have really filled with food the empty bellies of their brains we exercise their memories make them human parrots and then wonder that they do not act as human beings the intellect the conscience the taste indeed all that refines enlightens and ennobles our nature we leave untouched to shrivel and wither like unused limbs the beautiful the admirable the true the right are as hidden to them as at their first day's schooling we impress them with no purpose animate them with no principle they are still the same brute creatures of circumstances the same passive instruments human waifs and strays left to be blown about as the storms of life may whirl them of the second group or those who take to the streets i entertain very different opinions this class is distinguished from that above mentioned in being wanderers by choice rather than wanderers by necessity in the early chapters of this work i strove to point out to my readers that the human race universally consisted of two distinct classes the wanderers and the settlers the civilized and the savage those who produced their food and those who merely collected it i sought further to show that these two classes were not necessarily isolated but that on the contrary almost every civilized tribe had its nomadic race like parasites living upon it these nomadic races i proved moreover to have several characteristics common to the class one of the most remarkable of which was their adoption of a secret language with the intent of concealing their designs and exploits strange to say i then observed that despite its privations dangers and hardships those who have once taken to a wandering life rarely abandon it there are countless instances i added of white men adopting all the usages of an indian hunter but there is not one example of the indian hunter or trapper adopting the steady and regular habits of civilized society that this passion for a roving life to use the common expression by which many of the street people themselves designate it is a marked feature of some natures there cannot be a doubt in the mind of any one who has contemplated even the surface differences of human beings and nevertheless it is a point to which no social philosopher has yet drawn attention to my mind it is essentially the physical cause of crime too restive and volatile to pursue the slow process of production the wanderers and consequently the collectors of subsistence must in a land where all things are appropriated live upon the stock of the producers the nomadic or vagrant class have all an universal type whether they be the bushmen of africa or the tramps of our own country and mr knapp the intelligent master of the wandsworth and clapham union to whom i was referred at the time of my investigations touching the subject of vagrancy as having the greatest experience upon the matter gave me the following graphic account which as i said at the time of its first publication had perhaps never been surpassed as an analysis of the habits and propensities of the vagabond class ignorance to use the gentleman's own words is certainly not their prevailing characteristic indeed with a few exceptions it is the reverse the vagrants are mostly distinguished by their aversion to continuous labor of any kind he never knew them to work their great inclination is to be on the move and wandering from place to place and they appear to receive a great deal of pleasure from the assembly and conversation of the casual ward they are physically stout and healthy and certainly not emaciated or sickly they belong especially to the able-bodied class being as he says full of health and mischief they are very stubborn and self-willed they are a most difficult class to govern and are especially restive under the least restraint they can ill brook control 
and they find great delight in thwarting the authorities. They are particularly fond of amusements of all kinds. He never knew them love reading. They mostly pass under fictitious names. They are particularly distinguished by their libidinous propensities. They are not remarkable for a love of drink. He considers them to be generally a class possessing the keenest intellect and of a highly enterprising character. They seem to have no sense of danger and to be especially delighted with such acts as involve any peril. They are likewise characterized by their exceeding love of mischief. They generally are of a most restless and volatile disposition. They have great quickness of perception, but little power of continuous attention or perseverance. They have a keen sense of the ridiculous, and are not devoid of deep feeling. In the summer they make regular tours through the country, visiting all places that they have not seen. They are perfectly organized, so that any regulation affecting their comforts or interests becomes known among the whole body in a remarkably short space of time. Every day my inquiries add some fresh proof to the justice of the above enumeration of the several phenomena distinguishing this class. To the more sedate portion of the human family, the attractions of a roving life are inexplicable. Nevertheless, there can be no doubt that to the more volatile, the mere muscular exercise and the continual change of scene, together with the wild delight which attends the overcoming of any danger, are sources of pleasure sufficient to compensate for all the privations and hardships attending such a state of existence. Mr. Ruxton, one of the many who have passed from settlers to wanderers, has given us the following description of the enjoyments of a life in the wilderness. Although liable to an accusation of barbarism, I must confess that the very happiest moments of my life have been spent in the wilderness of the far west, and I never recall but with pleasure the remembrance of my solitary camp in the Bayou Solade, with no friend near me more faithful than my rifle, and no companions more sociable than my good horse and mules, or the attendant coyote, which nightly serenaded us. Seldom did I ever wish to change such hours of freedom for all the luxuries of civilized life, and, unnatural and extraordinary as it may appear, yet such is the fascination of the life of the mountain hunter, that I believe not one instance could be adduced of even the most polished and civilized of men, who had once tasted the sweets of its attendant liberty and freedom from every worldly care, not regretting the moment when he exchanged it for the monotonous life of the settlements, nor sighing and sighing again once more to partake of its pleasures and allurements. To this class of voluntary wanderers belong those who take to the streets, glad to exchange the wearisomeness and restraint of a settled occupation for the greater freedom and license of a nomad mode of life. As a class, they are essentially the non-working, preferring, as I said before, to collect rather than produce what they eat. If they sell, they do so because for sundry reasons they fear to infringe the law, and as traders their transactions certainly are not marked by an excess of honesty. I am not aware that any of them are professional thieves, for these are the more daring portion of the same vagrant fraternity, though the majority assuredly are habitual cheats, delighting in proving their cleverness by imposing upon simple-minded citizens, viewing all society as composed of the same dishonest elements as their own tribes, and looking upon all sympathy and sacrifice, even when made for their own benefit, as some artful dodge or trick by which to snare them. It should be remembered, however, that there are many grades of vagrants among us, and that though they are all essentially non-producing and consequently predatory, still many are in no way distinguished from a large portion of even our wealthy tradesmen, our puffing grocers and slop-sellers. To attempt to improve the condition of the voluntary street sellers by teaching of any kind would be to talk to the wind. We might as well preach to Messrs. Moses Nickel and Co. in the hope of Christianizing them. Those who take to the streets are not like those who are bred to it. An uneducated class, they are intelligent and knowing enough, 
and it is this development of their intellect at the expense of their conscience which gives rise to that excessive admiration of mere cleverness which makes skill the sole standard of excellence with them they approve admire venerate nothing but what is ingenious wrong with them is mere folly right cunning and those who think the simple cultivation of the intellect the great social panacea of the time have merely to study the characteristics of this class to see how a certain style of education can breed the very vice it seeks to destroy years ago i wrote and printed the following passage and every year since my studies have convinced me more and more of its truth man if deprived of his intellect would be the most miserable and destitute if of his sympathy the most savage and cunning of all the brute creation consequently we may infer that according as solely the one or the other of these powers is expanded in us so shall we approximate in our nature either to the instinct of the brute or to the artifice of the demon and that only when they are developed in an equal degree can man be said to be educated as man we should remember that the intellect simply executes it is either the selfish or moral propensity that designs the intellectual principle enables us to perceive the means of attaining any particular object it is the selfish or else the moral principle in us that causes us originally to desire that object the two latter principles are the springs the former is merely the instrument of all human action they are masters whereas the intellect is but the servant of the will and hence it is evident that in proportion as the one or the other of these two predominant principles as either the selfish or the moral disposition is educed in man and thus made the chief director and stimulus of the intellectual power within him so will the cultivation of that power be the source of happiness or misery to himself and others the third and last class namely those who are driven to the streets is almost as large as any luckily those who take to that mode of life are by far the least numerous portion of the street folk and if those who are bred to the business are worthy of our pity assuredly those who are driven to it are equally if not more so with some who are deprived of the means of obtaining a maintenance for themselves the sale of small articles in the streets may perhaps be an excuse for begging but in most cases i am convinced it is adopted from a horror of the workhouse and a disposition to do at least something for the food they eat often is it the last struggle of independence the desire to give something like an equivalent for what they receive over and over again have i noticed this honourable pride even in individuals who from some privations or affliction that rendered them utterly incompetent to labour for their living had a just claim on our sympathies and assistance the blind the cripple the maimed the very old the very young all have generally adopted a street life because they could do nothing else with many it is the last resort of all the smallness of the stock money required for a shilling it has been shown is sufficient to commence several street trades is one of the principal causes of so many of those who are helpless taking to the street traffic moreover the severity of the poor laws and the degradation of pauperism and the aversion to be thought a common beggar by all except the very lowest are i have no doubt strong incentives to this course there are many callings which are peculiar as being followed principally by the disabled the majority of the blind are musicians or bootlace or tape sellers the very old are sellers of watercresses lucifers pincushions ballads and pins and needles stay laces and such small articles as are light to carry and require but a few pence for the outlay the very young are sellers of flowers oranges nuts onions blacking lucifers and the like many of those who have lost an arm or a leg or a hand turn showmen or become sellers of small metal articles as knives or nutmeg graters and many who have been born cripples may be seen in the streets struggling for self-support 
but all who are driven to the streets have not been physically disabled for labor some have been reduced from their position as tradesmen or shopmen others again have been gentlemen's servants and clerks all dragged down by a series of misfortunes sometimes beyond their control and sometimes brought about by their own imprudence or sluggishness as we have seen many are reduced to a state of poverty by long illness and on their recovery are unable from want of clothes or friends to follow any other occupation but a still larger class than all are the beaten out mechanics and artisans who from want of employment in their own trade take to make up small things as clothes horses tinware cutlery brushes pails caps and bonnets on their own account the number of artisans in the london streets speaks volumes for the independence of the working men of this country as well as for the difficulty of their obtaining employment at their own trades those who are unacquainted with the sterling pride of the destitute english mechanic know not what he will suffer before becoming an inmate of a workhouse or sinking to the debasement of a beggar that handicraftsmen do occasionally pass into lurkers i know well but these i am convinced have gradually been warped to the life by a long course of tramping aided by the funds of their societies and thus becoming disused to labour have after forfeiting all claims upon the funds of their trade adopted beggary as a means of subsistence but that this is the exception rather than the rule the following is sufficient to show the destitute mechanics said the master of the wandsworth and clapham union to me are entirely a different class from the regular vagrants they have different habits and indeed different features during the whole of my experience i never knew a distressed artisan who applied for a night's shelter commit an act of theft and i have seen them he added in the last stage of destitution occasionally they have sold the shirt and waistcoat off their backs before they applied for admittance into the workhouse while some of them have been so weak from long starvation that they could scarcely reach the gate and indeed had to be kept for several days in the infirmary before their strength was recruited sufficiently to continue their journey the poor mechanic said another of my informants will sit in the casual ward like a lost man scared it's shocking to think a decent mechanic's houseless when he's beat out he's like a bird out of a cage he doesn't know where to go or how to get a bit i shall avail myself of another occasion to discuss the means of improving the condition of the street people end of section fifty four Section 55 of London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Street Folk, Part 55. Of the Street Sellers of Manufactured Articles. These traders consist of 1. The vendors of metal articles, 2. Of chemical articles, 3. Of china, glass, and stone articles, 4 of linen cotton and other textile fabrics and five of miscellaneous articles in this classification i do not include second-hand articles nor yet the traffic of those who make the articles they sell and who are indeed street artisans rather than street sellers under the first head are included the vendors of razors table and pen knives tea trays dog collars key rings articles of hardware small coins and medals pins and needles jewellery snuffers candlesticks articles of tinware tools card counters herring toasters trivets gridirons pans tray stands as in the roasting of meat and dutch ovens of the second description are the vendors of blacking black lead lucifer matches corn salves grease removing compositions china and glass cements plating balls rat and beetle poisons crackers detonating balls and cigar lights under the third head come all street sold articles of china glass or stone manufacture including not only crockery but vases chimney ornaments and stone fruit 
the fourth head presents the street vending of cotton silken and linen manufactures such as sheetings shirtings a variety of laces sewing cotton threads and tapes articles of haberdashery and of millinery artificial flowers handkerchiefs and pretended smuggled goods among the fifth class or the miscellaneous street sellers are those who vend cigars pipes tobacco and snuff boxes and cigar cases accordions spectacles hats sponge combs and hair brushes shirt buttons and coat studs lots rhubarb wash leather paper hangings dolls bristol and other toys sawdust firewood and pin cushions there are many other manufactured articles sold in the streets but their description will be more proper under the head of street artisans the street sellers of manufactured articles present as a body so many and often such varying characteristics that i cannot offer to give a description of them as a whole as i have been able to do with other and less diversified classes among them are several distinct and peculiar street characters such as the pack men who carry their cotton or linen goods in packs on their backs and are all itinerants then there are duffers who vend pretended smuggled goods handkerchiefs silks tobacco or cigars also the sellers of sham sovereigns and sham gold rings for wagers the crockery ware and glass sellers known in the street trade as crocks are peculiar from their principle of bartering they will sell to anyone but they sell very rarely and always clamour in preference for an exchange of their wares for wearing apparel of any kind they state if questioned that their reason for doing this is at least i heard the statement from some of the most intelligent among them that they do so because if they sold outright they required a hawker's license and could not sell or swap so cheap some of the street sellers of manufactured articles are also patterers among these are the cheap jacks or cheap johns the grease and stain removers the corn salve and plate ball vendors the sellers of sovereigns and rings for wagers a portion of the lot sellers and the men who vend poison for vermin and go about the streets with live rats clinging to or running about their persons this class of street sellers also includes many of the very old and the very young the diseased crippled maimed and blind these poor creatures sell and sometimes obtain a charitable penny by offering to sell such things as boxes of lucifer matches cakes of blacking boot stay and other laces pins and sewing and knitting needles tapes cotton bobbins garters pincushions combs nutmeg graters metal skewers and meat hooks hooks and eyes and shirt buttons the rest of the class may be described as merely street sellers toiling struggling plodding itinerant tradesmen of the street sellers of manufactured articles in metal these street sellers are less numerous than might be imagined when according to my present division the class is confined to the sellers of articles which they do not manufacture the metal wares thus sold i have already enumerated and i have now to describe the characteristics of the sellers the result of my inquiries leads me to the conclusion that the street vendors of any article which is the product of the skill of the handicraftsman have been almost always in their first outset in a street life connected in some capacity or other with the trade the manufactures of which they vend one elderly man long familiar with this branch of the street trade expressed to me his conviction that when a mechanic sought his livelihood in the streets he naturally gave his mind to sell what he understood now in my own case continued my informant i was born and bred a tin man and when i was driven to a street life i never thought of selling anything but tins how could i if i wished to do the thing square and proper it would be like trying to speak another language if i'd started on slippers and i knew a poor man who was set up in the streets by a charitable lady on a stock of gentlemen's slippers what could i have done why no better than he told me he did he was a potter down at Deptford, and knew of nothing but flower-pots, and honey-jars for grocers, and them red sorts of pottery. Poor fellow, he might have died of hunger, only the cholera came quickest. But when I'm questioned about my tins, I'm my own man, 
and it's a great thing i'm satisfied in a street trade when there's so many cheap shops and the police and all again you to understand the goods you're talking about this statement i may repeat is undoubtedly correct so far as that a beaten-out mechanic when driven to the streets in the first instance offers to the public wares of which he understands the value and quality afterwards in the experience or vagaries of a street life other commodities may be or may appear to be more remunerative and for such the mechanic may relinquish his first articles of street traffic why sir i was told there was one man who left razors for cabbages cause one day a costermonger what lived in the same house with him and was taken ill asked him to go out with a barrow of summer cabbages the costermonger's boy went with him and they went off so well that joe the former razor seller managed to start in the costering line he was so encouraged the street trade in metal manufactured articles is principally itinerant perhaps during the week upwards of three-fourths of those carrying it on are itinerant while on a saturday night perhaps all are stationary and almost always in the street markets the itinerant trade is carried on and chiefly in the suburbs by men women and children but the children are always or almost always the offspring of the adult street sellers the metal sold in the street may be divided into street hardware street tinware and street jewellery i shall begin with the former the street sellers of hardware are i am assured in number about one hundred including single men and families for women take their share in the business and children sell smaller things such as snuffers or bread baskets the people pursuing the trade are of the class i have above described with the exception of some ten or twelve who formerly made a living as servants to the gaming booths at epsom ascot and so on and so on and managed to live out of the races somehow most of the year since the gaming booths have been disallowed they have taken to the street hardware all these street sellers obtain their supplies at the swag shops of which i shall speak hereafter the main articles of their trade are tea boards waiters snuffers candlesticks bread baskets cheese trays britannia metal teapots and spoons iron kettles pans and coffee pots the most saleable things i am told by a man who has been fifteen years in this and similar street trades are at present eighteen inch tea boards bought at the swags at from ten shillings and sixpence a dozen to four shillings each twenty-four inch boards from twenty shillings the dozen to five shillings each bread baskets four shillings and sixpence the dozen and britannia metal teapots ten shillings the dozen these teapots have generally what is called loaded bottoms the lower part of the vessel is filled with composition so as to look as if there was great weight of metal and as if the pot would melt for almost the eighteen pence which is asked for it and very often got i learned from the same man however and from others in the trade that it is far more difficult now than it was a few years ago to sell rubbish there used to be also but not within these six or eight years a tolerable profit realized by the street sellers of hardware in the way of swap it was common to take an old metal article as part payment for a new one and if the old article were of good quality it was polished and tinkered up for sale in the saturday evening street markets and often went off well this traffic however has almost ceased to exist as regards the street sellers of hardware and has been all but monopolized by the men who barter crocks for wearing apparel or any old metal some hardware men who have become well known on their rounds for the principal trade is in the suburbs sell very good wares and at moderate profits it's a poor trade sir is the hardware said one man carrying it on and street trades are mostly poor trades for i've tried many a one of them i was brought up a clown i may say my father died when i was a child and i might have been a clown still but for an accident a rupture that's long ago i can't say how long but i know that before i was fifteen i many a time wished i was dead and i have many a time since why the day before yesterday from nine in the morning to eleven at night i didn't take a farthing some days i don't earn a shilling and i have a mother depending on me who can do little or nothing i'm a teetotaler and if i wasn't we shouldn't have a meal a day i never was fond of drink and if i'm ever so weary and out of sorts and worried for a meal's meat i can't say i ever long for a drop to cheer me up 
sometimes I can't get coffee, let alone anything else. Oh, I suffer terribly. Day after day I get wet through and have nothing to take home to my mother at last. Our principal food is bread and butter and tea. Not fish, half so often as many poor people, I suppose, because we don't care for it. I know that our living, the two of us, stands to less than one shilling a day, not sixpence apiece. Then I have two rents to pay. No, sir, not for two places, but I pay two shillings a week for a room, a tidy bit of a chamber, furnished, and one shilling a week rent, I call it rent, for a loan of five shillings. I've paid a shilling a week for four weeks on it, and must keep paying until I can hand over the five shillings, with one shilling for rent added to it, all in one sum. If I could tip up the five shillings, the day after I'd paid the last week's one shilling, I must pay another shilling. The man who lends does nothing else. He lives by lending, and by letting out a few barrows to costermongers and other street people. I wish I could take a farewell sight of them. The principal traffic carried on by these street sellers is in the suburbs. Women constitute their sole customers, or nearly so. Their profits fluctuate from 20% to 100%. The bread baskets, which they buy at four shillings and sixpence the dozen, they retail at sixpence each, for it is very difficult, I have frequently been told, to get a price between sixpence and one shilling. This, however, relates only to those things which are not articles of actual necessity. Half of these street sellers, I am assured, take on an average from twenty shillings to twenty-five shillings weekly the year through. A quarter take fifteen shillings, and the remaining quarter from seven shillings and sixpence to ten shillings. Calculating an average taking of fifteen shillings each per week throughout the entire class, men, women, and children, we find three thousand nine hundred pounds expended in street-sold hardwares. Ten years ago, I am told, the takings were not less than two thousand pounds. The following is an extract from accounts kept not long ago by a street seller of hardware. His principal sale was snuffers, knives and forks, iron candlesticks, padlocks and bed screws. His stock cost him thirty-five shillings on the Monday morning, and his first week was his best, which I here subjoin. Monday, receipts eight shillings, profits three shillings, no pence. Tuesday, receipts five shillings, profits two shillings and threepence. Wednesday, receipts four shillings, profits one shilling and sixpence. Thursday, always a slack day, receipts three shillings, profits none. Friday, a better day about the docks, when people are paid, receipts seven shillings, profits three shillings. Saturday morning and evening, receipts twenty-three shillings, profits six shillings one penny. Total, receipts fifty shillings, profits fifteen shillings and ten pence. The following is the worst week in the account books. The street seller, after this, about half a year ago, sold his stock to a small shopkeeper and went into another business. Monday, very cold, a common bed screw, receipts, no shillings, four pence, profits, no shillings, a penny farthing. Tuesday, no receipts, no profits. Wednesday, receipts, one shilling, no pence, profits, no shillings, five pence. Thursday, sold cheap, receipts one shilling one penny, profits no shillings three pence. Friday, no receipts, no profits. Saturday, receipts one shilling and seven pence, profits no shillings and eight pence. Total, receipts four shillings no pence, one shilling and five pence farthing. Of the cheap johns or street hand sellers. This class of street salesmen, who are perhaps the largest dealers of all in hardware, are not so numerous as they were some few years ago. The excise laws, as I have before remarked, having interfered with their business. The principal portion of those I have met are Irishmen, who, notwithstanding, generally hail from Sheffield, and all their sales are effected in an attempt at the Yorkshire dialect, interspersed, however, with an unmistakable brogue. The brogue is the more apparent when Cheap John gets a little out of temper. If his sales are flat, for instance, he'll say, By J blank S, I don't believe you've any money with you, or that you've lift any at home, at all, at all. Bad cess to you. There are, however, many English Cheap Johns, 
but few of them are natives of Sheffield or Birmingham, from which towns they invariably hail. Their system of selling is to attract a crowd of persons by an harangue after the following fashion. Here I am, the original cheap John from Sheffield. I've not come here to get money, not I. I've come here merely for the good of the public, and to let you see how you've been imposed upon by a parcel of pompous shopkeepers who are not content with less than one hundred per cent for rubbish. They got up a petition, which I haven't time to read to you just now, offering me a large sum of money to keep away from here. But no, I had too much friendship for you to consent, and here I am, cheap John, born without a shirt one day while my mother was out in a haystack. Consequently, I've no parish, for the cows eat up mine, and therefore I've never no fear of going to the workhouse. I've more money than the parson of the parish. I've in this cart a cargo of useful and cheap goods, can supply you with anything from a needle to an anchor. Nobody can sell as cheap as me, seeing that I gets all my goods upon credit, and never means to pay for them. Now then, what shall we begin with? Here's a beautiful guard chain. If it isn't silver, it's the same colour. I don't say it isn't silver, nor I don't say it is. In that affair, use your own judgment. Now, in the regular way of trade, you shall go into any shop in town, and they will ask you one pound eighteen shillings and sixpence for an article not half so good. So what will you say for this splendid chain? Eighteen and sixpence without the pound? What, that's too much? Well then, say seventeen, sixteen, fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve, eleven, ten shillings. What, none of you give ten shillings for this beautiful article? See how it improves a man's appearance. Hanging the chain round his neck. Any young man here present wearing this chain will always be shown into the parlour instead of the tap room, into the best pew in church when he and... But the advantages the purchaser of this chain will possess, I haven't time to tell. What, no buyers? Why, what's the matter with you? Have you no money or no brains? But I'll ruin myself for your sakes. Say nine shillings for this splendid piece of jewellery. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. A shilling. Will anybody give a shilling? Well, here, elevenpence, tenpence, ninepence, eightpence, sevenpence, sixpence, eightpence, sixpence. Is there ever a buyer at sixpence? Now I'll ask no more and I'll take no less. Sell it or never sell it. The concluding words are spoken with peculiar emphasis, and after saying them, the cheap John never takes any lower sum. A customer, perhaps, is soon obtained for the guard chain, and then the vendor elevates his voice. Sold to a very respectable gentleman, with his mouth between his nose and chin. A most remarkable circumstance. I believe I've just one more. This is better than the last. I must have a shilling for this. Sixpence? To you, sir. Sold again to a gentleman worth thirty thousand pounds a year. Only the right owner keeps him out of it. I believe I've just one more. Yes, here it is. It's brighterer, longerer, stronger, and betterer than the last. I must have at least tenpence for this. Well then, nine, eight, seven, six. Take this one for a sixpence. Sold again to a gentleman, his father's pet and his mother's joy. Pray, sir, does your mother know you're out? Well, I don't think of any more, but I'll look. Yes, here is one more. Now this is better than all the rest. Sold again to a most respectable gentleman whose mother keeps a chandler's shop and whose father turns the mangle. In this manner the cheap John continues to sell his guard chain until he has drained his last customer for that particular commodity. He has always his remark to make relative to the purchaser. The cheap John always takes care to receive payment before he hazards his jokes which I need scarcely remark are ready-made, and most of them ancient and worn threadbare, the joint property of the whole fraternity of cheap johns. After supplying his audience with one particular article, he introduces another. Here is a carving knife and fork, none of your wasters, capital buckhorn handle, manufactured of the best steel in a regular workmanlike manner, fit for carving in the best style, from a sparrow to a bullock. I don't ask seven shillings and sixpence for this, although go over to Mr. Blank, the ironmonger, and he will have the impudence to ask you fifteen shillings for a worse article. The cheap johns always make comparisons as to their own prices and the shopkeepers, and sometimes mention their names. I say five shillings for the carving knife and fork. Why, it's an article that will almost fill your children's bellies by looking at it, and will always make one pound of beef go as far as six pounds carved by any other knife and fork. Well, 
Four shillings, three shillings, two shillings, one shilling and eleven pence, one shilling and ten pence, one shilling and nine pence, one shilling and eight pence, one shilling and seven pence, eighteen pence. I ask no more, nor I'll take no less. The salesman, throughout his variety of articles, indulges in the same jokes and holds out the same inducements. I give a few. This is the original teapot, producing one, formerly invented by the Chinese, the first that ever was imported by those celebrated people. Only two of them came over in three ships. If I do not sell this today, I intend presenting it to the British Museum or the Great Exhibition. It is mostly used for making tea, sometimes by ladies, for keeping a little drop on the sly. It is an article constructed upon scientific principles, considered to require a lesser quantity of tea to manufacture the largest quantity of tea water than any other teapot now in use, largely patronised by the teetotalers. Now here's a fine pair of bellows. Any of you want to raise the wind? This is a capital opportunity if you'll try. I'll tell you how. Buy these of me for three shillings and sixpence, and go and pawn them for seven shillings. Will you buy em, sir? No? Well, then, you be blowed. Let's see, I said three shillings and sixpence. It's too little, but as I've said it, they must go. Well, three shillings, and so on, and so on. Capital article to chastise the children or a drunken husband. Well, take em for a shilling. I ask no more, and I'll take no less. These men have several articles which they sell singly, such as tea trays, copper kettles, fire irons, guns, whips, to all of which they have some preamble. But their most attractive lot is a heap of miscellaneous articles. I have here a pair of scissors. I only want half a crown for them. What, you won't give a shilling? Well, I'll add something else. Here's a most useful article, a knife with eight blades, and there's not a blade among you all that's more highly polished. This knife's a case of instruments in addition to the blades. Here's a corkscrew, a button-hook, a file, and a picker. For this capital knife and first-rate pair of scissors, I ask one shilling. Well, well, you've no more conscience than a lawyer. Here's something else, a pocket-book. This book no gentleman should be without. It contains a diary for every day in the week, an almanac, a ready reckoner, a tablet for your own memorandums, pockets to keep your papers, and a splendid pencil with a silver top. No buyers? I'm astonished, but I'll add another article. Here's a pocket comb. No young man with any sense of decency should be without a pocket comb. What looks worse than to see a man's head in an uproar? Some of you look as if your hair hadn't seen a comb for years. Surely I shall get a customer now. What? No buyers? Well, I never. Here, I'll add half a dozen of the very best Britannia metal teaspoons, and if you don't buy... You must be spoons yourselves. Why, you perfectly astonish me. I really believe if I was to offer all in the shop, myself included, I should not draw one shilling out of you. Well, I'll try again. Here, I'll add a dozen of black lead pencils. Now then, look at these articles. He spreads them out, holding them between his fingers to the best advantage. Here's a pair of first-rate scissors that will almost cut of themselves. This valuable knife, which comprises within itself almost a chest of tools. A splendid pocket-book, which must add to the respectability and consequence of any man who wears it. A pocket-comb, which possesses the peculiar property of making the hair curl and dyeing it any colour you wish. A half-dozen spoons, nothing inferior to silver, and that do not require half the usual quantity of sugar to sweeten your tea and a dozen beautiful pencils, at least worth the money I ask for the whole lot. Now, a reasonable price for these articles would be at least ten shillings and sixpence. I'll sell them for a shilling. I ask no more, I'll take no less. Sold again. The opposition these men display to each other while pursuing their business is mostly assumed for the purpose of attracting a crowd. Sometimes, when in earnest, their language is disgusting, and I have seen them, says an informant, after selling, try and settle their differences with a game at fisticuffs, but this occurred but seldom. One of these men had a wife who used to sell for him. She was considered to be the best chaffer on the road. Not one of them could stand against her tongue, but her language abounded with obscenity. All the cheap Johns were afraid of her. They never undersell each other, unless they get in a real passion, 
this but seldom happens but when it does they are exceedingly bitter against each other i cannot state the language they use further than that it reaches the very summit of blackguardism they have however assumed quarrels for the purpose of holding a crowd together and chaff goes round intended to amuse their expected customers he's coming your way to-morrow they'll say one of the other mind and don't hang your husband's shirts to dry ladies he's very lucky at finding things before they're lost he sells very cheap no doubt but mind if you handle any of his wares he don't make you a present of a scotch fiddle for nothing his hair looks as if it had been cut with a knife and fork the irishmen in these displays generally have the best of it indeed most of their jokes have originated with the irishmen who complain of the piracies of other cheap johns for as soon as the joke is uttered it is the property of the commonwealth and not unfrequently used against the inventor half an hour after its first appearance a few of them are not over particular as to the respectability of their transactions i recollect one purchasing a brick at sheffield the brick was packed up in paper with a knife tied on the outside it appeared like a package of knives containing several dozens the cheap john made out that he bought them as stolen property the biter was deservedly bitten a few of the fraternity are well-known fences and some of them pursue the double calling of cheap john and gambler keeping gambling tables at races however the majority are hard-working men who unite untiring industry with the most indomitable perseverance for the laudable purpose of bettering their condition i believe the most successful in the line have worked their way up from nothing gaining experience as they proceeded i have known two or three start the trade with plenty of stock but wanting the tact they have soon been knocked off the road there is a great deal of judgment required in knowing the best fares and even when there as to getting a good stand and these matters are to be acquired only by practice in the provinces and in scotland there may be one hundred cheap johns or as they term themselves hand sellers they are generally a most persevering body of men and have frequently risen from small hawkers of belts braces and so on their receipts are from five pounds to thirty pounds per day their profits from twenty to twenty five per cent twenty pounds is considered a good day's work and they can take about three fares a week during the summer months i have known many of these men a man well acquainted with them informs me who would walk twenty miles to a fair during the night hawk the public houses the whole of the day and start again all night for a fair to be held twenty miles off upon the following day i knew two irish lads named blank and i watched their progress with some interest each had a stock of goods worth a few shillings and now each has a wholesale warehouse one at sheffield in the cutlery line and the other at Birmingham, in general wares. The goods the hand-seller disposes of are mostly purchased at Sheffield and Birmingham. They purchase the cheapest goods they can obtain. Many of the hand-sellers have settled in various parts of England as swag shopkeepers. There are two or three in London, I am told, who have done so. One in the Kent Road, a large concern. The others I am not aware of their locality. Their mode of living while travelling is rather peculiar, those who have their caravans sleep in them, some with their wives and families. They have a man, or more generally a boy, to look after the horse and other drudgery, and sometimes at a fair to hawk, or act as a button, a decoy, to purchase the first lot of goods put up. This boy is accommodated with a bed made between the wheels of the cart or wagon, with some old canvas hung round to keep the weather out. Not the most comfortable quarters, perhaps, but, as they say, it's nothing when you're used to it the packing up occurs when there's no more chance of effecting sales the horse is put to and the caravan proceeds on the road towards the next town intended to visit after a sufficient day's travel the cheap john looks out for a spot to encamp for the night a clear stream of water and provender for the horse are indispensable or perhaps the hand seller has visited that part before and is aware of the halting place after having released the horse and secured his forefeet so that he cannot stray the next process is to look for some crack note some dry wood to light a fire end note this is the boy's work 
he is told not to despoil hedges or damage fences cheap john doesn't wish to offend the farmers and during his temporary sojourn in the green lanes he frequently has some friendly chat with the yeomen and their servants sometimes disposes of goods and often barters for a piece of fat bacon or potatoes a fire is lighted between the shafts of the cart a stick placed across upon which is suspended the cookery utensil when the meal is concluded the parties retire to bed the master within the caravan and the boy to his chamber between the wheels sometimes they breakfast before they proceed on their journey at other times they travel a few miles first those who have children bring them up in such a manner as may be imagined considering their itinerant life but there are very few who have families travelling with them though in most cases a wife generally the children of the cheap john are stationary either out at nurse or with relatives some of the cheap johns have wagons upon four wheels others have carts but both are fitted up with a wooden roof the proprietor invariably sleeps within his portable house both for the protection of his property and also upon the score of economy the vans with four wheels answer all the purposes of a habitation the furniture consists of a bed placed upon boxes containing the stock in trade the bed extends the whole width of the vehicle about six foot six inches and many generally extend about five foot into the body of the van and occupies the farthest end of the machine from the door which door opens out upon the horse the four-wheeled vans are twelve foot long and the two-wheeled carts nine foot during business hours the whole of the articles most likely to be wanted are spread out upon the bed and the assistant either the wife or a boy hands them out as the salesman may require them the furniture in addition to the bed is very scarce indeed they are very much averse to carry more than is really necessary the pail the horse takes his corn and beans from i don't know why but they never use nose bags serves the purpose of a wash hand basin or a washing tub it is generally painted the same color as the van with the initials of the proprietor painted upon it and when travelling hangs upon a hook under the machine they mostly begin with a two-wheeled machine and if successful a four-wheeler follows the tables and chairs are the boxes in which the goods are packed a tea-kettle and saucepan and as few delf articles as possible and corner cupboard and these comprise the whole of the furniture of the van in the four-wheeled wagons there is always a fireplace similar to those the captains of ships have in their cabins but in the two-wheeled carts fireplaces are dispensed with these are mostly brass ones and are kept very bright for the cheap johns are proud of their van and its contents they are always gaudily painted sometimes expensively indeed they are most expensive articles and cost from eighty pounds to one hundred and twenty pounds the principal person for making these machines is a mr davidson of leeds the showman's caravans are still more expensive the last purchased by the late mr woomwell cost more than three hundred pounds and is really a curiosity he termed it as all showmen do the living wagon namely to live in it has parlour and kitchen and is fitted up most handsomely its exterior presents the appearance of a first-class railway carriage the front exterior of the van during the trading operations of the cheap johns is hung round with guns saws tea trays bridles whips centre bits and other articles displayed to the best advantage the name of the proprietor is always prominently displayed along the whole side of the vehicle added to which is a signification that he is a wholesale hardware man from sheffield yorkshire or birmingham warwickshire and sometimes an extra announcement the original cheap john i do not know any class of men who are more fond of the good things of this life than cheap john his dinner during a fair is generally eaten upon the platform outside his van where he disposes of his wares and invariably consists of a joint of baked meat and potatoes that is where they can get a dinner baked as little time as possible is occupied in eating especially if trade is good at a hill fair that is where the fair is held upon a hill away from a town a fire is made behind the cart 
the pot is suspended upon three sticks and dinner prepared in the usual camp fashion the wife or boy superintends this tea and coffee also generally find their way to their table and if there's no cold meat a plentiful supply of bacon beefsteaks eggs or something in the shape of a relish seem to be with cheap john indispensable his man or boy if john is unmarried appears to be upon an equality with the master in the eating department he is not allowanced neither has he to wait until his superior has finished get it over as quick as you can seems to be the chief object perhaps from the circumstance of their selling guns and consequently always having such implements in their possession these men when they have time on their hands are fond of the sports of the field and many a hare finds its way into the camp kettle of cheap john i need not say that they practise this sport with but little respectful feeling towards the game laws but they are careful when indulging in such amusement and i never heard of one getting into a hobble during the winter since the cheap john has been obliged to become a licensed auctioneer some of them take shops and sell their goods by auction or get up mock auctions i have been told by them that sometimes it's a better game than hand selling the commencement of the cheap john's season is at lynn in norfolk there is a mart there commencing the fourteenth of february it continues fourteen days after this there is wisbeach spalding grantham and other marts in norfolk and lincolnshire which brings them up to easter at easter there are many fairs manchester knott mill blackburn darlington newcastle and so on and so on the cheap johns then disperse themselves through different parts of the country hill fairs are considered the best that is cattle fairs where there are plenty of farmers and country people hirings for servants are next to them it may appear curious but sheffield and birmingham fairs are two of the best for the cheap johns business in england there are two fairs at each place during the year sheffield at whitsuntide and november birmingham whitsuntide and september nottingham derby leeds newcastle bristol glasgow in fact where the greatest population is the chances for business are considered the best and if i may judge from the number of traders in this line who attend the largest towns i should say they succeed better than in smaller towns if we calculate that there are one hundred cheap johns in london and in the country and they are more or less itinerant and that they each take four pounds per day for nine months in the year or twenty four pounds per week this amounts to two thousand four hundred pounds per week or about ninety thousand pounds in nine months supposing their profits to be twenty per cent it would leave eighteen thousand pounds clear income say that during the winter there are seventy five following the business and that their receipts amount to fifteen pounds each per week this amounts to three thousand five hundred pounds additional and at the rate of twenty per cent profit comes to seven hundred pounds making throughout the year the profits of the one hundred cheap johns twenty five thousand pounds or two hundred and fifty pounds a man the cheap johns seldom frequent the crowded thoroughfares of london their usual pitches in the metropolis are king's cross st george's in the east stepney round about the london docks paddington kennington and such like places end of section fifty five Section 56 of London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Street Folk, Part 56. The Crippled Street Seller of Nutmeg Graters. I now give an example of one of the classes driven to the streets by utter inability to labour. I have already spoken of the sterling independence of some of these men possessing the strongest claims to our sympathy and charity, and yet preferring to sell rather than beg. As I said before, many ingrained beggars certainly use the street trade as a cloak for alms-seeking, but as certainly many more, with every title to our assistance, use it as a means of redemption from beggary that the nutmeg greater seller is a noble example of the latter class i have not the least doubt 
i have made all due inquiries to satisfy myself as to his worthiness and i feel convinced that when the reader looks at the portrait here given and observes how utterly helpless the poor fellow is and then reads the following plain unvarnished tale he will marvel like me not only at the fortitude which could sustain him under all his heavy afflictions but at the resignation not to say philosophy with which he bears them every one his struggles to earn his own living notwithstanding his physical incapacity even to put the victuals to his mouth after he has earned them are instances of a nobility of pride that are i believe without a parallel the poor creature's legs and arms are completely withered indeed he is scarcely more than head and trunk his thigh is hardly thicker than a child's wrist his hands are bent inward from contraction of the sinews the fingers being curled up and almost as thin as the claws of a bird's foot he is unable even to stand and cannot move from place to place but on his knees which are shod with leather caps like the heels of a clog strapped round the joint the soles of his boots are on the upper leathers that being the part always turned towards the ground while he is crawling along his countenance is rather handsome than otherwise the intelligence indicated by his ample forehead is fully borne out by the testimony as to his sagacity in his business and the mild expression of his eye by the statements as to his feeling for all others in affliction i sell nutmeg graters and funnels said the cripple to me i sell them at a penny and a penny halfpenny apiece i get mine of the man in whose house i live he is a tin man and makes for the street trade and shops and all i pay sevenpence a dozen for them and i get twelvepence or eighteenpence a dozen if i can when i sell them but i mostly get only a penny apiece it's quite a chance if i have a customer at a penny halfpenny some days i sell only three some days not one though i'm out from ten o'clock till six the most i ever took was three shillings and sixpence in a day some weeks i hardly clear my expenses and they're between seven shillings and eight shillings a week for not being able to dress and undress myself i'm obligated to pay some one to do it for me i think i don't clear more than seven shillings a week take one week with another when i don't make that much i go without sometimes friends who are kind to me give me a trifle or else i should starve as near as i can judge i take about fifteen shillings a week and out of that i clear about six shillings or seven shillings i pay for my meals as i have them threepence or fourpence a meal i pay every night for my lodging as i go in if i can but if not my landlady lets it run a night or two i give her a shilling a week for my washing and looking after me and one shilling and sixpence for my lodging when i do very well i have three meals a day but it's oftener only two breakfast and supper and less of sunday on a wet day when i can't get out i often go without food i may have a bit of bread and butter give me but that's all then i lie abed i feel miserable enough when i see the rain come down of a weekday i can tell you oh it is very miserable indeed lying in bed all day and in a lonely room without perhaps a person to come near one helpless as i am and hear the rain beat against the windows and all that without nothing to put in your lips i've done that over and over again where i lived before but where i am now i'm more comfortable like my breakfast is mostly bread and butter and tea and my supper bread and butter and tea with a bit of fish or a small bit of meat what my landlord and landlady has i share with them i never break my fast from the time i go out in the morning till i come home unless it is a halfpenny orange i buy in the street i do that when i feel faint i have only been selling in the streets since this last winter i was in the workhouse with a fever all the summer i was destitute afterwards and obliged to begin selling in the streets the guardians gave me five shillings to get stock i had always dealt in tinware so i knew where to go to buy my things it's very hard work indeed is street selling for such as me i can't walk no distance i suffer a great deal of pains in my back and knees sometimes i go in a barrow when i'm travelling any great way when i go only a short way i crawl along on my knees and toes the most i've ever crawled is two miles when i get home afterwards i'm in great pain my knees swell dreadfully and they're all covered with blisters and my toes ache awful i've corns all on top of them 
Often, after I've been walking, my limbs and back ache so badly that I can get no sleep. Across my lines it feels as if I've got some great weight, and my knees are in a heat and throb, and feel as if a knife was running into them. When I go upstairs, I have to crawl upon the back of my hands and my knees. I can't lift nothing to my mouth. The sinews of my hands is all contracted. I am obliged to have things held to my lips for me to drink, like a child. I can use a knife and fork by leaning my arm on the table and then stooping my head to it. I can't wash nor undress myself. Sometimes I think of my helplessness a great deal. The thoughts of it used to throw me into fits at one time very bad. It's the Almighty's will that I am so, and I must abide by it. People says as they passes me in the streets, Poor fellow, it's a shocking thing, but very seldom they does any more than pity me. Some lays out a halfpenny or a penny with me, but the most of them goes on about their business. Persons looks at me a good bit when I go into a strange place. I do feel it very much that I haven't the power to get my living or to do a thing for myself, but I never begged for nothing. I'd sooner starve than I'd do that. I never thought that people whom God had given the power to help themselves ought to help me. I have thought that I am as I am, obliged to go on my hands and knees from no fault of my own. Often I've done that, and I've over and over again laid in bed and wondered why the Almighty should send me into the world in such a state. Often I've done that on a wet day, with nothing to eat and no friend to come anigh me. When I've gone along the streets too and been in pain, I've thought, as I've seen the people pass straight up with all the use of their limbs and some of them the biggest blackguards, cussing and swearing, I thought, why should I be deprived of the use of mine? And I felt angry like, and perhaps at that moment I couldn't bring my mind to believe the Almighty was so good and merciful as I'd heard say. But then, in a minute or two afterwards, I've prayed to him to make me better and happier in the next world. I've always been led to think he's afflicted me as he has for some wise purpose or other that I can't see. I think, as mine is so hard a life in this world, I shall be better off in the next. Often, when I couldn't afford to pay a boy, I've not had my boots off for four or five nights and days, nor my clothes neither. Give me the world. I couldn't take them off myself, and then my feet has swollen to that degree that I've been nearly mad with pain, and I've been shivering and faint, but still I was obliged to go out with my things. If I hadn't, I should have starved. Such as I am can't afford to be ill. It's only rich folks as can lay up, not we. For us to take to our beds is to go without food altogether. When I was without never a boy, I used to tie the wet towel round the back of one of the chairs and wash myself by rubbing my face up against it. I've been two days without a bit of anything passing between my lips. I couldn't go and beg for victuals, I'd rather go without. Then I used to feel faint, and my head used to ache dreadful. I used then to drink a plenty of water. The women's sex is mostly more kinder to me than the men. Some of the men fancies as I goes along that I can walk. They often says to me, why, the sole of your boot is as muddy as mine, and one on em is, because I always rests myself on that foot. The other sole, you see, is as clean as when it was first made. The women never seem frightened on me. My trade is to sell brooms and brushes, and all kinds of cutlery and tinware. I learnt it myself. I never was brought up to nothing, because I couldn't use my hands. Mother was a cook in a nobleman's family when I was born. They say as I was a love child. I was not brought up by mother, but by one of her fellow servants. Mother's intellects was so weak that she couldn't have me with her. She used to fret a great deal about me, so her fellow servant took me when she got married. After I were born, mother married a farmer, in middling circumstances. They tell me as my mother was frightened afore I was born. I never knew my father. He went over to Buenos Aires and kept an hotel there. I've heard mother say as much. No mother couldn't love a child more than mine did me but her feelings were such she couldn't bear to see me. I never went to mother's to live, but was brought up by the fellow-servant, as I've told you of. Mother allowed her thirty pounds a year. I was with her till two years back. She was always very kind to me, treated me like one of her own. Mother used to come and see me about once a year, sometimes not so often. She was very kind to me then. Oh, yes, I used to like to see her very much. Whatever I wished for, she'd let me have. 
if i wrote to her she always sent me what i wanted i was very comfortable then mother died four years ago and when i lost her i fell into a fit i was told of it all of a sudden she and the party as i was brought up with was the only friends as i had in the world the only persons as cared anything about a creature like me i was in a fit for hours and when i came to i thought what would become of me i knew i could do nothing for myself and the only friend as i had as could keep me was gone the person as brought me up was very good and said while she'd got a home i should never want but two years after mother's death she was seized with the cholera and then i hadn't a friend left in the world when she died i felt ready to kill myself i was all alone then and what could i do cripple as i was she thought her sons and daughters as i'd been brought up with like brothers and sisters would look after me but it was not in their power they was only hard-working people my mother used to allow so much a year for my schooling and i can read and write pretty well note he wrote his name in my presence kneeling at the table holding the pen almost as one might fancy a bird would and placing the paper sideways instead of straight before him End note. while mother was alive i was always foraging about to learn something unbeknown to her i wanted to do so in case mother should leave me without the means of getting a living i used to buy old bedsteads and take them to a man and get him to repair them and then i'd put the sacking on myself i can hold a hammer somehow in my right hand i used to polish them on my knees i made a bench to my height out of two old chairs i used to know what i should get for the bedsteads and so could tell what i could afford to give the man to do up the parts as i couldn't manage it was so i got to learn something like a business for myself when the person died as had brought me up i could do a little i had then got the means before her death i had opened a kind of shop for things in the general line i sold tinware and brasswork and candlesticks and fire irons and all old furniture and gown prints as well i went into the tally business and that ruined me altogether i couldn't get my money in there's a good deal owing to me now me and a boy used to manage the whole i used to make all my account books and everything my lodgers didn't pay me my rent so i had to move from the house and live on what stock i had in my new lodging i went on as well as i could for a little while but about eighteen months ago i could hold on no longer then i borrowed a little and went hawking tinware and brushes in the country i sold baking dishes dutch ovens roasting jacks skewers and gridirons teapots and saucepans and combs i used to exchange sometimes for old clothes i had a barrow and a boy with me i used to keep him and give him one shilling a week i managed to get just a living that way when the winter came on i gave it up it was too cold after that i was took bad with a fever my stock had been all gone a little while before and the boy had left because i couldn't keep him and i had to do all for myself all my friends was dead and i had no one to help me so i was obligated to lay about all night in my things for i couldn't get them off alone and that and want of food brought on a fever then i was took into the workhouse and there i stopped all the summer as i told you i can't say they treated me bad but they certainly didn't use me well if i could have worked after i got better i could have had tea but cause i couldn't do nothing they gave me that beastly gruel morning and night i had meat three times a week they would have kept me there till now but i would die in the streets rather than be a pauper so i told them if they would give me the means of getting a stock i would try and get a living for myself after refusing many times to let me have ten shillings they agreed to give me five shillings then i came out but i had no home and so i crawled about till i met with the people where i am now and they let me sit up there till i got a room of my own then some of my friends collected for me about fifteen shillings altogether and i did pretty well for a little while i went to live close by the blackfriars road but the people where i lodged treated me very bad there was a number of girls of the town in the same street but they was too fond of themselves and their drink to give nothing they used to buy things of me and never pay me they never made game of me nor played me any tricks and if they saw the boys doing it they would protect me they never offered to give me no victuals indeed i shouldn't have liked to have eaten the food they got after that i couldn't pay my lodgings and the parties where i lodged turned me out and i had to crawl about the streets for four days and nights this was only a month back i was fit to die with pain all that time 
If I could get a penny, I used to go into a coffee shop for half a pint of coffee and sit there till they drove me out, and then I'd crawl about till it was time for me to go out selling. Oh, dreadful, dreadful it was to be all them hours, day and night, on my knees. I couldn't get along at all. I was forced to sit down every minute, and then I used to fall asleep with my things in my hand and be woke up by the police to be pushed about and druv on by them. It seemed like as if I was walking on the bare bones of my knees. The pain in them was like the cramp, only much worse. At last I could bear it no longer, so I went to for Mr. Secker, the magistrate at Union Hall, and told him I was destitute, and that the parties where I had been living kept my bed and the few things I had for two shillings and sixpence rent that I owed them. He said he couldn't believe that anybody would force me to crawl about the streets for four days and nights, cripple as I was, for such a sum. One of the officers told him I was an honest and striving man, and the magistrate sent the officer with the money to get my things. But the landlady wouldn't give them till the officer compelled her, and then she chucked my bed out into the middle of the street. A neighbour took it in for me, and took care of it, till I found out the tin man, who had before let me sit up in his house. I should have gone to him at first, but he lived farther than I could walk. I am stopping with him now, and he is very kind to me. I have still some relations living, and they are well to do, but, being a cripple, they despise me. My aunt, my mother's sister, is married to a builder in Petersham near Richmond, and they are rich people, having some houses of their own, besides a good business. I have got a boy to wheel me down on a barrow to them, and asked assistance of them, but they will have nothing to do with me. They won't look at me for my affliction. Six months ago they gave me half a crown. I had no lodgings nor victuals then, and that I shouldn't have had from them had I not said I was starving and must go to the parish. This winter I went to them, and they shut the door in my face. After leaving my aunts I went down to Ham Common, where my father-in-law lives, and there his daughter's husband sent for a policeman to drive me away from the place. I told the husband I had no money nor food, but he advised me to go begging, and said I shouldn't have a penny of them. My father-in-law was ill upstairs at the time, but I don't think he would have treated me a bit better, and all this they do, because the Almighty has made me a cripple. I can indeed solemnly say that there is nothing else against me, and that I strive hard and crawl about till my limbs ache enough to drive me mad to get an honest livelihood. With a couple of pounds I could, I think, manage to shift very well for myself. I'd get a stock and go into the country with a barrow, and buy old metal, and exchange tinware for old clothes, and with that I'm almost sure I could get a decent living. I'm accounted a very good dealer. In answer to my inquiries concerning the character of this man, I received the following written communication. I have known C. Blank A. Blank twelve years. The last six years he has dealt with me for tinware. I have found him honest in all his dealings with me, sober and industrious. C. Blank H. Blank Tin Man. From the writer of the above testimonial, I received the following account of the poor cripple. He is a man of a generous disposition and very sensitive for the afflictions of others. One day, while passing down the borough, he saw a man afflicted with St. Vitus's dance shaking from head to foot, and leaning on the arm of a woman who appeared to be his wife. The cripple told my informant that he should never forget what he felt when he beheld that poor man. I thought, he said, what a blessing it is I am not like him. Nor is the cripple, I am told, less independent than he is generous. In all his sufferings and privations he never pleads poverty to others, but bears up under the trials of life with the greatest patience and fortitude. When in better circumstances he was more independent than at present, having since, through illness and poverty, been much humbled. His privations have been great, adds my informant. Only two months back, being in a state of utter destitution and quite worn out with fatigue, he called at the house of a person, note, where my informant occupied a room, end note, about ten o'clock at night, and begged them to let him rest himself for a short while, but the inhuman landlady and her son laid hold of the wretched man, the one taking him by the arms and the other by the legs, and literally hurled him into the street. The next morning, my informant continued, I saw the poor creature leaning against a lamp-post, shivering with the cold, and my heart bled for him, and since that he's been living with me. 
of the swag shops of the metropolis by those who are not connected with the street trade the proprietors of the swag shops are often called warehousemen or general dealers and even slaughterers these descriptions apply but partially warehousemen or general dealers are vague terms which i need not further notice the wretchedly underpaid and overworked shoemakers cabinet makers and others call these places slaughterhouses when the establishment is in the hands of tradesmen who buy their goods of poor workmen without having given orders for them on saturday afternoons pale-looking men may be seen carrying a few chairs or bending under the weight of a chiffonnier or a chest of drawers in tottenham court road and thoroughfares of a similar character in all parts these are small masters who make or as one man said to me no sir i don't make these drawers i put them together it can't be called making it's not workmanship who put together in the hastiest manner and in any way not positively offensive to the eye articles of household furniture the slaughterers who supply all the goods required for the furniture of a house buy at starvation prices the common term the artificer being often kept waiting for hours and treated with every indignity one east end slaughterer as i ascertained in a former inquiry used habitually to tell that he prayed for wet saturday afternoons because it put twenty pounds extra into his pocket this was owing to the damage sustained in the appearance of any painted varnished or polished article by exposure to the weather or if it had been protected from the weather by the unwillingness of the small master to carry it to another slaughter-house in the rain under such circumstances and under most of the circumstances of this unhappy trade the poor workman is at the mercy of the slaughterer i describe this matter more fully than i might have deemed necessary had i not found that both the small masters spoken of for i called upon some of them again and the street sellers very frequently confounded the swag shop and the slaughter house the distinction i hold to be this the slaughterer buys as a rule with hardly an exception the furniture or whatever it may be made for the express purpose of being offered to him on speculation of sale the swag shopkeeper orders his goods as a rule and buys as an exception in the manner in which the slaughterer buys ordinarily the slaughterer sells by retail the swag shopkeeper only by wholesale most of the articles of the class of which i now treat are brummagon made an experienced tradesman said to me all these low-priced metal things fancy goods and all which you see about are made in birmingham in nineteen cases out of twenty at the least they may be marked london or sheffield or paris or any place you can have them marked north pole if you will but they're genuine birmingham the carriage is lower from birmingham than from sheffield that's one thing the majority of the swag shop proprietors are jews the wares which they supply to the cheap shops the cheap johns and the street sellers in town and country consist of every variety of article apart from what is eatable drinkable or wearable in which the trade class i have specified can deal as regards what is wearable indeed such things as braces garters and so on form a portion of the stock of the swag shop in one street a thoroughfare at the east end of london are twenty-three of these establishments in the windows there is little attempt at display the design aimed at seems to be rather to crowd the window as if to show the amplitude of the stores within the wonderful resources of this most extensive and universal establishment than to tempt purchasers by exhibiting tastefully what may have been tastefully executed by the artificer or what it is desired should be held to be so executed in one of these windows the daylight is almost precluded from the interior by what may be called a perfect wall of pots a street seller who accompanied me called them merely pots the trade term but they were all pot ornaments among them were great store of shepherdesses of greyhounds of a gamboge colour of what i heard called figures allegorical nymphs with and without birds or wreaths in their hands very tall-looking shakespeare's i did not see one of these windows without its shakespeare a sitting figure 
and some pots which seemed to be either shepherds or musicians from what i could learn at the pleasure of the seller the buyer or the inquirer the shepherd or musician is usually seated under a tree he wears a light blue coat and yellow breeches and his limbs more than his body are remarkable for their bulk to call them merely fat does not sufficiently express their character and in some pots they are as short and stumpy as they are bulky on my asking if the dogs were intended for italian greyhounds i was told no they're german i alluded however to the species of the animal represented my informant to the place of manufacture for the pots were chiefly german a number of mugs however with the crystal palace very well depicted upon them were unmistakably english in another window of the same establishment was a conglomeration of pin-cushions shaving-brushes letter-stamps all in bone cribbage-boards and boxes including a pack of cards necklaces and strings of beads the window of a neighbouring swag-shop presented in the like crowding and in greater confusion an array of brooches note some in coloured glass to imitate rubies topazes and so on some containing portraits deeply coloured in purple attire and red cheeks and some being very large cameos end note timepieces with and without glasses french toys with movable figures telescopes american clocks musical boxes shirt studs backgammon boards tea trays one with a nondescript bird of most gorgeous green plumage forming a sort of centrepiece razor strops writing desks sailors knives hair brushes and tobacco boxes another window presented even a more miscellaneous assortment dirks apparently not very formidable weapons a mess of steel pens in brown paper packages and cases and of black lead pencils pipe heads cigar cases snuff boxes razors shaving brushes letter stamps metal teapots metal teaspoons glass globes with artificial flowers and leaves within the glass an improvement one man thought on the old ornament of a reel in a bottle peel medals exhibition medals roulette boxes scent bottles quill pens with artificial flowers in the feathery part fans side combs glass pen holders and pot figures caricatures of louis philippe carrying a very red umbrella marshal haynau with some instrument of torture in his hand while over all boomed a huge english seaman in yellow waistcoat and with a brick-coloured face sometimes the furniture of a swag shop window is less plentiful but quite as heterogeneous in one were only american clocks french toys large opera glasses knives and forks and powder flasks in some windows the predominant character is jewellery eardrops generally gilt rings of all kinds brooches of every size and shade of coloured glass shawl pins shirt studs necklaces bead purses small paintings of the crystal palace in burnished gold frames watch guards watch seals each with three impressions or mottoes watch chains and keys silver toothpicks medals and snuff boxes it might be expected that the jewellery shops would present the most imposing display of any they are on the contrary among the dingiest as if it were not worth the trouble to put clean things in the window but merely what sufficed to characterize the nature of the trade carried on of the twenty-three swag shops in question five were confined to the trade in all the branches of stationery of these i saw one the large window of which was perfectly packed from bottom to top with note-paper account and copy-books steel pens pencils sealing-wax enamelled wafers in boxes ink-stands and so on of the other shops two had cases of watches with no attempt at display or even arrangement poor things i was told by a person familiar with the trade in them fit only to offer to countrymen when they've been drinking at a fair and think themselves clever i have so far described the exterior of these street dealers bazaars the swag shops in what may be called their headquarters upon entering some of these places of business 
spacious rooms are seen to extend behind the shop or warehouse which opens to the street some are almost blocked up with what appears a litter of packing cases packages and bales but which are no doubt ordered systematically enough while the shelves are crammed with goods in brown paper or in cases or boxes this uniformity of package so to speak has the effect of destroying the true character of these swag storerooms for they present the appearance of only three or four different kinds of merchandise being deposited on a range of shelves when perhaps there are a hundred in some of these swag shops it appears certain both from what fell under my own observation and from what i learned through my inquiries of persons long familiar with such places that the litter i have spoken of is disposed so as to present the appearance of an affluence of goods without the reality of possession in no warehouses properly swag or wholesale traders is there any arranged display of the wares vended we don't want people here one street seller had often heard a swag shopkeeper say as looks about them and says how pretty what nice things he wants to sell and not to show he is all for business and be d blank d all of these places which i saw were dark more or less so in the interior as if a customer's inspection were uncared for some of the swag shop people present cards or circulars with prices to their street and other customers calling attention to the variety of their wares these circulars are not given without inquiry as if it were felt that one must not be wasted on one i find the following enumeration shopkeepers and dealers supplied with the following articles clocks american french german and english eight-day dials watches gold and silver musical boxes two four six and eight airs watch glasses common flint geneva and lunettes main springs blue and straw color english and geneva watch materials of every description jewelry a general assortment spectacles gold silver steel horn and metal frames concave convex colored and smoked eyes telescopes one two and three drawers mathematical instruments combs side dressing curl pocket ivory small tooth and so on musical instruments violins violincellos bows and so on flutes clarionets trombones ophoclides cornopeans french horns post horns trumpets and passes violin tailboards pegs and bridges accordions french and german of every size and style it must not be thought that swag shops are mainly repositories of fancy articles for such is not the case i have described only the windows and outward appearances of these places the interior being little demonstrative of the business but the bulkier and more useful articles of swag traffic cannot be exposed in a window in the miscellaneous or birmingham and sheffield shops however the useful and the fancy are mixed together as is shown by the following extracts from the circular of one of the principal swag houses i give each head with an occasional statement of prices the firm describe themselves as wholesale retail and export furnishing ironmongers general hardware men manufacturers of clocks watches and steel pens and importers of toys beads and other foreign manufactures table cutlery common knives and forks per dozen two shillings no pence ivory handled table knives and fork per set of fifty pieces twenty shillings no pence tables per dozen fifteen shillings no pence desserts per dozen eleven shillings three pence carvers per pair four shillings no pence fire irons strong wrought iron for kitchens per set two shillings to six shillings no pence ditto for parlours or libraries bright pans four shillings and sixpence to seven shillings no pence fenders kitchen fenders three feet long with sliding bar three shillings no pence green ditto brass tops for bedrooms one shilling eight pence britannia metal goods teapots and so on german silver goods teaspoons one shilling to two shillings per dozen and so on bellows kitchen each tenpence to two shillings no pence parlour ditto 
brass pipes and nails, two shillings and threepence to three shillings no pence. Japanned goods, brass goods, iron saucepans, oval iron pots, iron tea kettles, and so on, iron stew pans, and so on. The prices here run very systematically. One quart, one shilling and twopence, three pints, one shilling and sixpence, two quarts, two shillings, no pence, three quarts, three shillings, no pence, four quarts, three shillings, nine pence, five quarts, four shillings, no pence. Patent enamelled saucepans, oval tin boilers, tin saucepans, tea kettles, coffee pots. In all these useful articles, the prices range in the same way as in the iron stew pans. Copper goods, kettles, coal scoops, and so on. Tin fish kettles, dish covers, rosewood work boxes. Glass, brushes, tooth, hair, clothes, scrubbing, stove, shoe, japanned hearth, banister, plate, carpet, and dandy. Tools, plated goods warranted silver edges, snuffers, beads, musical instruments, accordions from one shilling to five shillings, and so on. Then come dials and clocks, combs, optics, spectacles, eyeglasses, telescopes, opera glasses, each tenpence to ten shillings, china ornaments, lamps, sundries. These I give verbatim to show the nature of the trade. Crimping and goffering machines from fourteen shillings, looking glasses, pictures, and so on, beads of every kind, watch guards, shaving boxes, guns, pistols, powder flasks, belts, percussion caps, and so on, corkscrews, sixpence to two shillings, nut cracks, sixpence to one shilling and sixpence, folding measures, each two shillings to four shillings, silver spoons, haberdashery, skates, per pair, two shillings to ten shillings, Carpet bags, each three shillings to ten shillings, egg boilers, tapers, flat and box irons, Italian irons and heaters, earthenware jugs, metal covers, teapots, plaited straw baskets, sieves, wood pails, camera obscurers, medals, amulets, perfumery and fancy soaps of all kinds, mathematical instruments, steel pens, silver and German silver, patent pencil cases and leads, snuff boxes in great variety. Strops, ink, slates, metal eyelet holes and machines, padlocks, braces, belts, congreves, lucifers, fuses, pocket books, bill cases, bed keys, and a great variety of articles too numerous to mention. Notwithstanding the specific character and arrangement of the circulars with prices, it is common enough for the swag shop proprietors to intimate to anyone likely to purchase that those prices are not altogether to be a guidance, as 35% discount is allowed on the amount of a ready money purchase. One of the largest swags made such an allowance to a street seller last week. The swag shops, of which I state the numbers in a parenthesis, are in Houndsditch, their principal locality, 23, Minories, 4, Whitechapel, 2, Ratcliffe Highway, 20, Shoreditch, 1, Long Lane, Smithfield, 4, Fleet Lane, 2, Holywell Street, Strand, 1, Tothill Street, 4, Compton Street, Soho, 1, Hatton Garden, 2, Clerkenwell, 10, Kent Street, Borough, 8, Newcut, 6, Blackman Street, 2, Tooley Street, 3, London Road, 3, Borough Road, 1, Waterloo Road, 4, in all, 101. But a person who had been upwards of twenty years a frequenter of these places counted up fifty others, many of them in obscure courts and alleys near Houndsditch, Ratcliffe Highway, and so on and so on. These outsiders are generally of a smaller class than those I have described. And I can tell you, sir, the same man said, some of them, well, I, and some of the big ones too, are real swag shops still. Partly so, that is, you understand me, sir. The word swag, I should inform my polite readers, means in slang language, plunder. It may be safely calculated, then, that there are 150 swag shops to which the different classes of street sellers resort for the purchase of stock. Among these establishments are pot swag, stationery swag, haberdashery swag, jewellery swag, and miscellaneous swag. The latter comprise far more than half the entire number, and constitute the warehouses which are described by their owners as Birmingham and Sheffield, or English and Foreign, or English and German. 
It is in these last-mentioned swags that the class I now treat of, the street sellers of metal manufactures, find the commodities of their trade. To this, however, there is one exception. Tins for household use are not sold at the general swag shops, but fancy tins, such as japanned and embellished trays, are vended there extensively. The street sellers of this order are supplied at the tin shops. The number of the wholesale tin men supplying the street sellers is about fifty. The principle on which the business is conducted is precisely that of the more general swag shop, but I shall speak of them when I treat of the street sellers of tins. An intelligent man who had been employed in different capacities in some of the principal swag shops told me of one which had been carried on by the same family from father to son for more than seventy years. In the largest of the swags about two hundred hands are employed in the various capacities of salesmen, buyers, clerks, travellers, unpackers, packers, porters, and so on and so on. On some mornings twenty-five large packages, some of small articles entirely, are received from the carriers. In one week, when my informant assisted in making up the books, the receipts were upwards of three thousand pounds. "'In my opinion, sir,' he said, "'and it's from an insight into the business, Mr. Blank's profit on that three thousand pounds was not less than thirty-five per cent, for he's a great capitalist, and pays for everything down upon the nail.' That's more than one thousand pounds profit in a week. Certainly it was an extra week, and there's the two hundred hands to pay, but that wouldn't range higher than three hundred pounds. Indeed, not so high, and there's heavy rent and taxes, and rates, no doubt, and he, note, the proprietor is a Jew, end note, is a fair man to the trade, and not an uncharitable man, but he will drive a good bargain where it's possible. So considering everything, sir, the profits must be very great, and they are mostly made out of poor buyers, who sell it to poor people in the streets or in small shops. It's a wonderful trade. From the best information I could obtain, I come to the conclusion that, including small and large shops, £3,000 yearly is the average receipt of each, or, as it is most frequently expressed, that sum is turned over by the swag shop keepers yearly. There is great competition in the trade, and much of what is called cutting, or one tradesman underselling another. The profit consequently varies from twenty to thirty-five, and rarely fifty per cent. Sometimes a swag shop proprietor is hung up with a stock the demand for which has ceased, and he must dispose of it as a job lot to make room for other goods, and thus is necessarily out of pocket. The smaller swag shops do not turn over five hundred pounds a year. The calculation I have given shows an outlay yearly of four hundred and fifty thousand pounds at the swag shops of London. But, said a partner in one of these establishments, what proportion of the goods find their way into the streets, what to the shops, what to the country, and what for shipping, I cannot form even a guess, for we never ask a customer for what purpose he wants the goods though sometimes he will say, I must have what is best for such or such a trade. Say half a million turned over in a year, sir, by the warehousemen who sell to the street people, among others, and you're within the mark. I found the street sellers characterise the swags as hard and grinding men, taking every advantage in the way of trade. There is, too, I was told by a man lately employed in a swag shop, a constant collision of clamour and bargaining not to say of wits, between the smarter street sellers, the pattering class especially, and the swagmen with whom they are familiar. The points in which the swag shops resemble the slaughter houses are in the traffic in work boxes, desks, and dressing cases. End of section fifty six. Section 57 of London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Street Folk, Part 57. Of the Life of a Cheap John. The following narrative, 
relative to this curious class who in many respects partake of the characteristics which i have pointed out as proper to the mountebank of old was taken from one of the fraternity it may be cited as an example of those who are bred to the streets my father and mother said he both followed a travelling occupation and were engaged in vending different things from the old brimstone matches up to clothes lines clothes props and clothes pegs they never got beyond these the other articles were thread tapes nutmeg graters shoe ties stay laces and needles my father my mother used to tell me was a great scholard and had not always been a travelling vagrant my mother had never known any other life i however did not reap any benefits from my father's scholarship at a very early age five or six perhaps i recollect myself a poor little neglected wretch sent out each day with a roll of matches with strict injunctions not to come home without selling them and to bring home a certain sum of money upon pain of receiving a sound thrashing which threat was mostly put into execution whenever i failed to perform the task imposed upon me my father seldom worked that is seldom hawked but my mother poor thing had to travel and work very hard to support four of us my father myself and a sister who is since dead i was but little assistance and sometimes when i did not bring home the sum required she would make it up and tell my father i had been a good boy my father was an inveterate drinker and a very violent temper my mother i'm sorry to say used to drink too but i believe that ill usage drove her to it they led a dreadful life i scarcely felt any attachment for them home we had none one place was as good as another to us i left my parents when scarcely eight years old i had received a thrashing the day before for being a defaulter in my sale and i determined the following morning to decamp and accordingly with my nine pennyworth of matches the quantity generally allotted me i set out to begin the world upon my own account although this occurred twenty-five years ago i have never met my parents since my father i heard died a few years after my leaving but my mother i know not whether she be living or dead i left my parents at dover and journeyed on to london i knew there were lodging-houses for travellers in every town some of them i had stopped at with my father and mother i told the people of these houses that my parents would arrive the following day and paid my twopence for the share of a third fourth fifth or even sixth part of a bed according to the number of children who inhabited the lodging-house upon that particular night my matches i could always sell if i tried but i used to play my time away and many times night has arrived before i thought of effecting sales sufficient to pay my expenses at the beggar's hotel broken victuals i got in abundance indeed more than sufficient for my own consumption the money i received for the matches after paying my lodging and purchasing a pennyworth of brimstone to make more the wood i begged at the carpenters i gambled away at cards yes young as i was i understood blind hooky i invariably lost of course i was cheated i remained in a lodging-house in mill lane deptford for two years discontinued the match-selling and having a tidy voice took to hawking songs through the public houses the sailors used to ask me to sing and there were few days that i did not accumulate two shillings and sixpence and from that to four shillings especially when i chose to be industrious but my love of pitch and toss and blind hooky always kept me poor i often got into debt with my landlady and had no difficulty in doing so for i always felt a pride in paying from selling the printed songs i imbibed a wish to learn to read and with the assistance of an old soldier i soon acquired sufficient knowledge to make out the names of each song and shortly afterwards i could study a song and learn the words without any one helping me i stopped in deptford until i was something more than twelve years old i had then laid the songs aside and taken to hawking small wares tapes thread and so on and in the winter season i was a buyer of rabbit and hare skins i kept at this for about three years sometimes entirely without a stock i had run it out perhaps gambled it away and at such times i suffered great privations i never could beg i have often tried but never could i have approached a house with a begging intention knocked at the door and when it has been opened i have requested a drink of water when i was about sixteen i joined in partnership with a man who used to make phosphorus boxes i sold them for him a piece of phosphorus was stuck in a tin tube 
the match was dipped into the phosphorus and it would ignite by friction i was hawking these boxes in norwich when the constable considered they were dreadful affairs and calculated to encourage and assist thieves and burglars he took me before the magistrate at the beak's own private house and he being equally horrified i was sent to prison for a month i have often thought since that the proceeding was illegal what would be said now if a man was to be sent to jail for selling lucifer matches in norwich prison i associated with the rest and if i had been inclined to turn thief i had plenty of opportunities and offers of gratuitous instruction the separate or silent system was not in vogue then i worked on the treadmill dinner was allowed to be sent in on the sunday by the prisoner's friends my dinner was sent in on the first sunday by the man i sold the boxes for as it was on the second third and fourth but i had lost it before i received it i had always gambled it away for there were plenty of opportunities of doing so in the prisons then on leaving the jail i received one shilling with this i purchased some songs and travelled to yarmouth i could do best among sailors after a few weeks i had accumulated about eight shillings and with that sum i purchased some hardware at the swag shop commenced hawking and cut the vocal department altogether still i gambled and kept myself in poverty in the course of time however i had amassed a basket of goods worth perhaps three pounds i gambled and lost them all in one night i was so downcast and unhappy from this circumstance that it caused me to reflect seriously and i made an oath that i never would gamble again i have kept it and have reason to bless the day that i made so good a resolution after losing my basket of goods the winner gave me articles amounting to a few shillings and i began the world once more shortly afterwards i commenced rag gatherer and changed my goods for old rags of course not refusing cash in payment my next step was to have some bills printed whereon i requested all thrifty wives to look out their old rags or old metal or old bones and so on stating at the bottom that the bill would be called for and that a good price in ready money would be given for all useless lumber and so on some months at this business realized me a pretty sum of money i was in possession of nearly five pounds then i discontinued the rag gathering not that the trade was declining but i did not like it i was ambitious i purchased a neat box and started to sell a little birmingham jewellery i was now respectably dressed was getting a living and had entirely left off stopping at common lodging houses but i confined my visits to small villages i was afraid of the law and as i was pursuing my calling near wakefield a constable inquired for my hawker's license i had none to produce he took me into custody and introduced me to a magistrate who committed me to prison for a month and took away my box of goods i endured the month's imprisonment upon the silent system they cut my hair short and at the expiration of the term i was thrust out upon the world heartbroken without a shilling to beg to steal or to starve i proceeded to leeds the fair was on at this time i got engaged to assist a person from whom i had been accustomed occasionally to purchase goods he was a cheap john in the course of the day he suggested that i should have a try at the hand selling i mounted the platform and succeeded beyond my own expectations or that of my master he offered me a regular engagement which i accepted at times i would help him sell and at other times i hawked with his license i had regular wages besides all i could get above a certain price that he placed upon each of the goods i remained with this person some fifteen months at the end of which period i commenced for myself having saved nearly twenty-five pounds i began at once the hand selling and purchased a hawker's license which enabled me to sell without danger then i always called at the constable's house and gave a louder knock at his door than any other person's proud of my authority and assured of my safety at first i borrowed an empty cart in which i stood and sold my wares i could chaff as well as the best and was as good a salesman as most of them after that i purchased a second-hand cart from a person who had lately started a wagon i progressed and improved in circumstances and at last bought a very handsome wagon for myself i have now a nice caravan and good stock of goods worth at least five hundred pounds money i have but little i always invested in goods i am married and have got a family i always travel in the summer but remain at home during the winter my wife never travels she remains behind and manages a little swag shop 
which always turns in at least the family expenses. The Street Sellers of Cutlery The cutlery sold in the streets of London consists of razors, pen knives, pocket knives, table and carving knives and forks, scissors, shears, nail filers, and occasionally, if ordered, lancets. The knives are of various kinds, such as sailor's knives, with a hole through the handle, butcher's knives, together with choppers and steels, sold principally at Newgate and Billingsgate markets and round about the docks, oyster and fish knives, sold principally at Billingsgate and Hungerford markets, bread knives, hawked at the baker's shops, ham and beef knives, hawked at the ham and beef shops, cheese knives with tasters, and ham triers, shoemaker's knives, and a variety of others. These articles are usually purchased at the swag shops, and the prices of them vary from twopence halfpenny to one shilling and a penny halfpenny each. They are bought either by the dozen, half-dozen, or singly, according to the extent of the street seller's stock money. Hence it would appear that the street seller of cutlery can begin business with only a few pence, but it is only when the swag shopkeeper has known the street seller that he will consent to sell one knife alone to sell again. To street sellers with whom he is unacquainted he will not vend less than half a dozen. Even where the street seller is known, he has, if cracked up, to beg hard, I am told, before he can induce the warehouseman to let him have only one article. The swag shops won't be bothered with it, say the men. What are our troubles to them? If the rain starves us out and makes us eat up all our stock money, what is it to such folks? They wouldn't let us have even a row of pins without the money for em. No, not if we was to drop down dead for want of bread in their shops. They have been deceived by such a many that now they won't listen to none. I subjoin a list of the prices paid and received by the street sellers of cutlery for the principal articles in which they deal. Reader's note. This table has four columns. Lowest price paid per half dozen, sold at in streets. Highest price paid per half dozen, sold at in streets, which will be abbreviated to lowest price, sold, highest price, sold. End reader's note. Table knives and forks, lowest price, one shilling and threepence, sold at two shillings, no pence. Highest price, five shillings, no pence, sold at seven shillings and sixpence. Ditto, without forks, lowest price, no shillings, nine pence, sold at one shilling and threepence, highest price, four shillings, no pence, sold at six shillings, no pence. Pocket knives, lowest price, one shilling, no pence, sold at one shilling and sixpence, highest price, four shillings, no pence, sold at six shillings, no pence. Pen knives, lowest price, one shilling and nine pence, sold at two shillings and sixpence, highest price, two shillings and sixpence, sold at three shillings and ninepence. Razors, lowest price, one shilling and ninepence, sold at two shillings and sixpence, highest price, five shillings, no pence, sold at seven shillings and sixpence. Scissors, lowest price, no shillings, threepence halfpenny, sold at no shillings, sixpence, highest price, one shilling and ninepence, sold at two shillings and sixpence. Their usual rate of profit is 50%, but rather than refuse a ready sale, the street cutlery seller will often take much less. Many of the sellers only pursue the trade for a few weeks in the year. A number of the Irish labourers take to it in the winter time when they can get no work. Some few of the sellers are countrymen, but these mostly follow the business continuously. I don't see as there is hardly one upon the list as has ever been a cutler by trade, said one street seller to me and certainly none of the cutlery sellers have ever been to Sheffield. They may say so, but it's only a dodge. The cutlery sellers are not one quarter so numerous as they were two years back. The reason is, I am told, that things have got so bad a man can't live by the trade. Mayhap he has to walk three miles now before he can sell for one shilling a knife that has cost him eightpence halfpenny, and then, mayhap, he is faint. And what's threepence halfpenny, sir, to keep body and soul together? when a man most likely has had no victuals all the day before. If they had a good bit of stock, they might perhaps get a crust, they say. Things within the last two or three years, to quote the words of one of my informants, have been getting much worse in the streets, especially in the cutlery line. I can't give no account for it, I'm sure, sir. The sellers have not been half as many as they were. 
what's become of them that's gone i can't tell they're in the workhouse i dare say but notwithstanding this decrease in the number of sellers there is a greater difficulty to vend their goods now than formerly it's all owing to the times that's all i can say people shopkeepers and all says to me i can't tell why things is so bad and has been so bad in trade but so they is we has to walk farther to sell our goods and people beat us down so terrible hard that we can't get a penny out of them when we do sell sometimes they offers me ninepence yes and often sixpence for an eightpence halfpenny knife and often enough fourpence for one that stands you in threepence three farthings a farthing profit think of that sir then they say well my man will you take my money and so as to make you do so they'll flash it before your eyes as if they knew you was a starving and would be sure to be took in by the sight of it yes sir it's a very hard life and we has to put up with a good deal a good deal starvation and hard dealing and insults and knockings about and all and then you see the swag shops is almost as hard on us as the buyers the swagmen will say if you merely make the remark that a knife they've sold you is cracked in the handle oh is it let me see whereabouts and when you hands it to em to show it em they'll put it back where they took it from and tell you you're too particular by half my man you'd better go and get your goods somewhere else here take your money and go on about your business for we won't sarve you at all they'll do just the same with the scissors too if you complains about their being a bit rusty go somewhere else they'll say we won't sarve you ah oh, sir that's what it is to be a poor man to have your poverty flung in your teeth every minute people says to be poor and seem poor is the devil but to be poor and be treated like a dog merely because you are poor surely is ten thousand times worse a street seller nowadays is looked upon as a cadger and treated as one to try to get a living for oneself is to do something shameful in these times the man then gave me the following history of himself he was a kindly-looking and hearty old man he had on a ragged fustian jacket over which he wore a black greasy-looking and tattered oilskin coat the collar of this was torn away and the green baize lining alone visible his waistcoat was patched in every direction while his trousers appeared to be of corduroy but the grease and mud was so thick upon them that it was difficult to tell of what material they were made his shoes or rather what remained of them were tied on his feet with pieces of string his appearance altogether denoted great poverty my father was a farmer sir he had two farms about eight hundred acres in all i was one of eleven ten sons and one daughter seven years before my father's death he left his farm and went to live on his money he had made a good bit at farming but when he died it was all gone and we was left to shift as we could i had little or no education my brothers could read and write but i didn't take to it i went to birds nesting boy-like instead so that what little i did learn i forgot i'm very sorry for that now i used to drive the plough and go a-harrowing for father i was brought up to nothing else when father died i thought as i should like to see london i was a mere lad about twenty and so i strolled up to town i had ten shillings with me and that with a bundle was all that i possessed in the world when i got to london i went to lodge at a public house the red lion in great wild street and while i was there i sought about for work but could not get any when all was gone i was turned out into the streets and walked about for two days and two nights without a bed or a bit to eat unless what i picked out of the gutter and eat like a dog orange peel and old cabbage stumps indeed anything i could find when i was very hard put to it i was coming down drury lane and i looked in quite casual like to ask for a job of work at the shop of mr bolton the needle-maker from redditch i told him as how i was nigh starving and would do anything to get a crust i didn't mind what i put my hand to he said he would try me and gave me two packets of needles to sell they was the golden-eyed ones of that time of day and he said when i had got rid of them i was to come back to him and i should have two packets more he told me the price to ask sixpence a paper and away i went like a sandboy and got rid of the two in an hour and a half then i went back and when i told him what i'd done he shook hands with me and said as he burst out laughing now you see i've made a man of you oh he was an uncommon nice gentleman then he told me to keep the shilling i had taken and said he would trust me with two more packets i sold them and two others besides that day then he says i shall give you something else and he let me have two packets of tailor's needles and half a dozen of tailor's thimbles 
He told me how to sell them and where to go, and on them I did better. I went round to the tailor shops and sold a good lot. But at last they stopped me, because I was taking the bread out of the mouths of the poor blind needle sellers what supplies the journeyman tailors at the West End. Then Mr. Bolton sent me down to one of his relations, a Mr. Crooks in Fetter Lane, who was a Sheffield man and sold cutlery to the hawkers, and Mr. Crooks and Mr. Bolton sot me up between them, and so I have followed the line ever since. I dare say I shall continue in it to my dying day. After I got fairly set a-going, I used to make, take good and bad, wet and dry days together, eighteen shillings a week. Three shillings a day was what I calculated on as the least, and to do that I was obligated to take between two pounds and three pounds a week, or about eight or nine shillings each day. I went on doing this for upwards of thirty year. I've been nearly forty years altogether in the streets selling cutlery. I did very tidy till about four years back. I generally made from eighteen shillings to one pound a week up to that time. I used to go round the country, to Margate, Brighton, Portsmouth. I mostly travelled by the coast, calling at all the seaport towns, for I always did best among the sailors. I went away every springtime, and came to London again at the fall of the year. Sixteen year ago I married the widow of a printer, a pressman. She had no money, but you see, I had no home, and I thought I should be more comfortable. And so I have been a great deal more comfortable, and so I should be now if things hadn't got so bad. Four year ago, as I was a-telling you, it was just after the railways had knocked off work. Things began to get uncommon bad. Before then I had as good as thirty shillings or forty shillings stock, and when things got slack it went away, little by little. I couldn't make profit enough to support me and my old woman. She has got the rheumatics, and can't earn me a halfpenny or a farden in the world. She hasn't done so for years. When I didn't make enough to live upon, of course I was obligated to break into my stock. So there it kept going, shilling by shilling, and sixpence by sixpence, until I had got nothing left to work upon, not a halfpenny. You see, four or five months ago I was took very bad with the rheumatic fever and gout. I got wet through in the streets, and my clothes dried on me, and the next day I was taken bad with pains in my limbs, and then everything that would fetch me a penny went to the pawn shop. All my own and my old woman's clothes went to get us food, blankets, sheets, and all. I never would go nigh the parish, I couldn't bring myself to have the talk about it. When I got well and out into the streets again, I borrowed two shillings or three shillings of my landlady, I have lived with her these three years, to get my stock again. But you see, that got me so few things that I couldn't fetch myself up. I lost the greater portion of my time in going backwards and forwards to the shop to get fresh goods as fast as I sold them. And so what I took wasn't enough to earn the commonest living for me and my missus. Since December we have been nearly starving, and that's as true as you have got the pen in your very hand. Sunday after Sunday we have been without a bit of dinner, and I have laid abed all day because we have had no coal, and then been obligated to go out on Monday morning without a bit of victuals between my lips. I have been so faint I couldn't hardly walk. I've picked the crusts off the tables of the tap-rooms where I've been to hawk my goods, and put them in my pocket to eat them on the sly. Wet and dry I'm obligated to be out. Let it come down ever so hard I must be in it, with scarcely a bit of shoe, and turned sixty years old as I am. Look here, sir, he said, holding up his foot. Look at these shoes. The soles is all loose, you see, and let water. On wet days I hawk my goods to respectable shops. Tap-rooms is no good. Decent people merely get insulted there. But in most of the shops as I goes to, people tells me, My good man, it is as much as we can do to keep ourselves and our family in these cutting times. Now, just to show you what I'd done last week. Sunday I laid abed all day and had no dinner. Monday I went out in the morning without a morsel between my lips, and with only eightpence halfpenny for stock money. With that I bought a knife and sold it for a shilling, and then I got another and another after that. And that was my day's work, three times threepence halfpenny or tenpence halfpenny in all, to keep the two of us. Tuesday I sold a pair of small scissors and two little pearl-handled knives at sixpence each article, and cleared tenpence halfpenny on the whole, and that is all I did. Wednesday I sold a razor strop for sixpence, a four-bladed knife for a shilling, and a small hone for sixpence. By these I cleared tenpence altogether. Thursday I sold a pair of razors for a shilling, clearing by the whole elevenpence halfpenny. Friday I got rid of a pair of razors for one shilling and ninepence, and got ninepence clear. I added up the week's profits, and found they amounted to four shillings and threepence halfpenny. That's about right, 
said the man. Out of that I shall have to pay a shilling for my week's rent. We've got a kitchen, so that I can leave you to judge how we two can live out of what's remaining. I told him it wouldn't average quite sixpence a day. That's about it, he replied. We have half a loaf of bread a day, and that, thank God, is only five farthings now. This lasts us the day with two pennyworth of bits of meat that my old woman buys at a ham shop, where they pare the hams and puts the parings by on plates to sell to poor people, and when she can't get that she buys half a sheep's head, one that's three or four days old, for then they sell them to the poor for a penny halfpenny the half, and these, with three farthings worth of tea and a halfpenny worth of sugar, a farthing for a candle, a penny of coal, that's seven pounds, and three farthings worth of coke, that's half a peck, makes up all we get. These items amount to sixpence halfpenny in all. That's how we do when we can't get it, and when we can't, why we lays in bed and goes without altogether. End of section 57「Section 58 of London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Street Folk, Part 58. Of the Blind Street Sellers of Tailors' Needles, etc. It is customary with many trades for the journeymen to buy such articles as they require in their business of those members of their craft who have become incapacitated for work either by old age or by some affliction. The tailors, the shoemakers, the carpenters, and many others do this. These sellers are perhaps the most exemplary instances of men driven to the streets, or to hawking, for a means of living, and they, one and all, are distinguished by that horror of the workhouse which I have before spoken of as constituting a peculiar feature in the operative's character. At present I purpose treating of the street sellers of needles and trimmings to the tailors. There are, I am informed, two dozen broken-down journeyman tailors pursuing this avocation in and around London. There may be more, said one, who had lost his sight stitching, but I get my information from the needle warehouse, where we all buy our goods, and the lady there told me she knew as many as twenty-four hawkers who were once tailors. These are all either decayed journeymen or their widows. Some are incapacitated by age, being between sixty and seventy years old. The greater part of the aged journeymen, however, are inmates of the tailor's almshouses. I am not aware, said my informant, of there being more than one very old man hawking needles to the tailors, though there may be many that I know nothing about. The one I am acquainted with is close upon eighty and he is a very respectable man, much esteemed in St. James's and St. George's. He sells needles and London labour under the London poor to the journeyman. He is very feeble indeed, and can scarcely get along. Of the two dozen needle-sellers above mentioned, there are only six who continue their rounds solely to the metropolis. Out of these six my informant knew two who were blind, beside himself. One of these sells to the journeyman in the city. There are other blind tailors who were formerly hawkers of needles, but being unable to realise a subsistence thereby, have been obliged to become inmates of the workhouses. Others have recently gained admission into the almshouses. Last February, I am assured, there were two blind needle sellers and two decrepit in St. James's workhouse. There are, moreover, two widows selling tailors' needles in London. One of these, I am told, is wretchedly poor being eat up with the rheumatics and scarcely able to move. She is the relict of a blind journeyman and well known in St. James's. The other widow is now in St. Pancras workhouse, having been unable, to use the words of my informant, to get anything to keep life and soul together at the needle trade. She too, I am told, is well known to the journeyman. The tailor's needle sellers, confining themselves more particularly to London, consist of, at present, one old man, three blind, one paralysed, and one widow. Besides these, there are now in the almshouses two decrepit and one paralysed, and one widow in the workhouse, all of whom, till recently, were needle-sellers, and originally connected with the trade. "'That is all that I believe are now in London,' said one to me. "'I should, I think, know if there were more, for it is not from one place we get our articles, but many.' and there I hear that six is about the number of tailors' hawkers in town. 
the rest of the two dozen hawkers that i spoke of go a little way out into the suburbs the six however stick to london altogether the needle sellers who go into the country i am told travel as far as reading westward and to gravesend in the opposite direction or brentwood in essex and they will keep going backwards and forwards to the metropolis immediately their stock is exhausted these persons sell not only tailors needles but women's needles as well and stay laces and cottons and small wear in general which they get from shepherds in compton street they have all been tailors and are incapacitated from labour either by old age or some affliction there was one widow of a tailor among the number but it is believed she is now either too old to continue her journeys or else that she is deceased the town sellers confine their peregrinations mostly to the parishes of st james's and st george's my informant was not aware that any went even into marylebone one travels the city while the other five keep to the west end they all sell thimbles needles inch measures bodkins inch sticks scissors when they can get them i was told and that's very seldom and beeswax basting cotton and many of them publications the publications vended by these men are principally the cheap periodicals of the day and two of these street sellers i am informed do much better with the sale of publications than by the trimmings they get money sir said one man to me while we are starving they have their set customers and have only to go round and leave the paper and then to get their money on the monday morning the tailors hawkers buy their trimmings mostly at the retail shops they have not stock money sufficient i am assured to purchase at the wholesale houses for such a thing as a paper of needles large tradesmen don't care about of selling us poor men they tell me that if they could buy wholesale they could get their goods one-fourth cheaper and to be obligated to purchase retail is a great drawback on their profits they call at the principal tailors workshops and solicit custom of the journeymen they are almost all known to the trade both masters and men and having no other means of living they are allowed to enter the masters shops though some of the masters such as allen in bond street curlwis jarvis and jones in conduit street and others refuse the poor fellows even this small privilege the journeymen treat them very kindly the needle sellers tell me and generally give them part of the provisions they have brought with them to the shop if it was not for this the needle sellers i am assured could hardly live at all there's that boy there said a blind tailor speaking of the youth who had led him to my house and who sat on the stool fast asleep by the fire i'm sure he must have starved this winter if it hadn't been for the goodness of the men to us for it's little that me and his mother has to give him she's gone almost as blind as myself working at the sank work note making up soldiers clothing end note oh ours is a miserable life sir worn out blind with overwork and scarcely a hole to put one's head in or a bit to put in one's mouth god almighty knows that's the bare truth sir sometimes the hawkers go on their rounds and take only tuppence but that is not often sometimes they take five shillings in a day and that is the greatest sum said my informant i ever took what others might do i can't say but that i'm confident is about the highest takings in the summer three months the average takings rise to four shillings per day but in the winter they fall to one shilling or at the outside one shilling and sixpence the business lasts only for three hours and a half each day that is from eight till half past eleven in the morning after that no good is to be done then the needle sellers i am told go home and the reason of this is i am told if they appear in the public streets selling or soliciting alms the blind are exempted from becoming recipients of the benefits of many of the charitable institutions the blind man whom i saw told me that after he had done work and returned home he occupied himself with pressing the seams of the soldiers clothes when his missus had sewed them the tailor's needle sellers are all married and one of the wives has a mangle and perhaps said my informant the blind husband turns the mangle when he goes home but i can't say another wife is a book folder but she has no work the needles they usually sell five a penny to the journeyman but the most of the journeymen will take but four they say 
We can't get a living at all if we sell the needles cheaper. The journeymen are mostly very considerate, very indeed, much more than the masters, for the masters won't hardly look at us. I don't know that a master ever gave me a farden, and yet there's some of them very soothing and kind in speaking. The profit in the needles, I am told, is rather more than one hundred per cent. But, say the sellers, only think, sir, we must get rid of a hundred and fifty needles, even to take three shillings. The most we ever sell in one shop is sixpence worth, and the usual amount is twopence worth. You can easy tell how many shops we must travel round to in order to get rid of three shillings worth. Take one shop with another, the good with the bad. They tell me they make about one penny profit from each they visit. The profit on the rest of the articles they vend is about twenty per cent, and they calculate that all the year round, summer and winter, they may be said to take two shillings a day or twelve shillings a week, out of which they clear from five shillings to five shillings and sixpence. They sell far more needles than anything else. Some of the blind needle sellers make their own beeswax into shapes, pennyworths, themselves, melting into and pouring into small moulds. The blind needle seller whom I saw was a respectable looking man, with the same delicacy of hand as is peculiar to tailors and which forms so marked a contrast to the horny palms of other workmen. He was tall and thin, and had that upward look remarkable in all blind men. His eyes gave no signs of blindness, the pupils being full and black, except that they appeared to be directed to no one object, and, though fixed, were so without the least expression of observation. His long black surtout, though faded in colour, was far from ragged, having been patched and stitched in many places, while his cloth waistcoat and trousers were clean and neat, very different from the garments of street sellers in general. In his hand he carried his stick, which, as he sat, he seemed afraid to part with, for he held it fast between his knees. He came to me accompanied by his son, a good-looking, rough-headed lad, habited in a washed-out blue, French kind of pinafore, and whose duty it was to lead his blind father about on his rounds. Though the boy was decently clad, still his clothes, like those of his father, bore many traces of that respectable kind of poverty which seeks by continuous mending to hide its rags from the world. The face of the father, too, was pinched, while there was a plaintiveness about his voice that told of a wretched, spirit-broken and afflicted man. Altogether he was one of the better kind of handicraftsmen one of those fine specimens of the operatives of this country, independent even in their helplessness, scorning to beg and proud to be able to give some little equivalent for the money bestowed on them. I have already given accounts of the beaten-out mechanic from those who certainly cannot be accused of an excess of sympathy for the poor, namely the poor law commissioners and masters of workhouses, and I can only add that all my experience goes fully to bear out the justice of these statements. As I said before, the class who are driven to the streets, to which the beaten out or incapacitated operative belongs, is of all others the most deserving of our sympathy, and the following biography of one of this order is given to teach us to look with a kindly eye upon the many who are forced to become street sellers as the sole means of saving themselves from the degradation of pauperism or beggary. I am forty-five years of age next June, said the blind tailor. It is upwards of thirty years since I first went to work at the tailoring trade in London. I learned my business under one of the old hands at Mr. Cook's in Poland Street, and after that went to work at Guthrie's in Bond Street. I belonged to the society held at the old White Hart. I continued working for the honourable trade and belonging to society for about fifteen years. My weekly earnings then averaged one pound sixteen shillings a week while I was at work, and for several years I was seldom out of work, for when I got into a shop it was a long time before I got out again. I was not married then. I lived in a first-floor back room, well furnished, and could do very comfortably indeed. I saved often my fifteen shillings or sixteen shillings in a week, and was worth a good bit of money up to the time of my first illness. At one period I had nearly fifty pounds by me, and had it not been for vacations and slack seasons, I should have put by more, but 
You see, to be out of work even a few weeks makes a large hole in a journeyman's savings. All this time I subscribed regularly to society, and knew that if I got superannuated I should be comfortably maintained by the trade. I felt quite happy with the consciousness of being provided for in my old age or affliction then, and if it had not been for that perhaps I might have saved more even than I did. I went on in this way, as I said before, for fifteen years, and no one could have been happier than I was. Not a working man in all England couldn't. I had my silver watch and chain. I could lay out my trifle every week in a few books, and used to have a trip now and then up and down the river, just to blow the London smoke off, you know. About fifteen years ago my eyes began to fail me without any pain at all. They got to have, as it were, a thick mist, like smoke, before them. I couldn't see anything clear. Working by gaslight at first weakened and at last destroyed the nerve altogether. I'm now in total darkness. I can only tell when the gas is lighted by the heat of it. It is not the black clothes that is trying to the sight. Black is the steadiest of all colours to work at. White and all bright colours makes the eyes water after looking at them for any long time. But of all colours, scarlet, such as is used for regimentals, is the most blinding. It seems to burn the eyeballs, and makes them ache dreadful. After working at red, there's always flying colours before the eyes. There's no steady colour to be seen in anything for some time. Everything seems all of a twitter, and to keep changing its tint. There's more military tailors blind than any others. A great number of tailors go blind, but a great many more has lost their sight since gaslight has come up. Candlelight was not half so pernicious to the sight. Gaslight is so very heating, and there's such a glare with it that it makes the eyes throb and shoot too if you work long by it. I've often continued working past midnight with no other light than that, and then my eyes used to feel like two bits of burning coals in my head. And you see, sir, the worst of it was, as I found my sight going bad, I was obliged to try it more, so as to keep up with my mates in the shop. At last my eyes got so weak that I was compelled to give up work and go into the country, and there I stopped, living on my savings, and unable to do any work for fear of losing my sight altogether. I was away about three years, and then all my money was gone, and I was obligated, in spite of my eyes, to go back to work again. But then, with my sight defective as it was, I could get no employment at the honourable trade, and so I had to take a seat in a shop at one of the cheap houses in the city, and that was the ruin of me entirely. For working there, of course I got scratched from the trade society, and so lost all hope of being provided for by them in my helplessness. The workshop at this cheap house was both small and badly ventilated. It was about seven foot square, and so low that as you sat on the floor you could touch the ceiling with the tip of your finger. In this place seven of us worked, three on each side and one in the middle. Two of my shopmates were boys, or else I'm sure it would not have held us all. There was no chimney nor no window that could be opened to let the air in. It was lighted by a skylight, and this would neither open nor shut. The only means for letting out the foul air was one of them working ventilators, like cockades, you know, sir fixed in one of the panes of glass, but this wouldn't work, so there we were often from five in the morning till ten at night, working in this dreadful place. There was no fire in the winter, though we never needed one, for the workshop was over hot from the suffocation, and in the summer it was like an oven. This is what it was in the daytime, but mortal tongue can't tell what it was at night, with the two gaslights burning away, and almost stifling us. Many a time some of the men has been carried out by the others fainting for air. They all fell ill, every one of them, and I lost my eyes and my living entirely by it. We spoke to the master repeatedly, telling him he was killing us, and though when he came up to the workshop himself he was nearly blown back by the stench and heat, he would not let us have any other room to work in, and yet he'd plenty of convenience upstairs. He paid little more than half the regular wages, and employed such men as myself, only those who couldn't get anything better to do. What with illness and all, I don't think my wages there averaged above twelve shillings a week. Sometimes I could make one pound in the week, but then the next week maybe I'd be ill and would get but a few shillings. It was impossible to save anything then. Even to pay one's way was a difficulty, and at last I was seized with rheumatics on the brain, and obliged to go into St. Thomas's Hospital. I was there eleven months, 
and came out stone blind. I am convinced I lost my eyesight by working in that cheap shop. Nothing on earth will ever persuade me to the contrary. And what's more, my master robbed me of the third of my wages, and my sight too, and left me helpless in the world, as God knows I am now. It is by the ruin of such men as me that these masters are enabled to undersell the better shops. They get hold of the men whose eyes are just beginning to fail them, like mine did, because they know they can get them to work cheap. And then, just at the time when a journeyman requires to be in the best of shops, have the best of air, and to work as little by gaslight as possible, they puts him into a hole of a place that would stifle a rat, and keeps him working there half the night through. That's the way, sir, the cheap clothes is produced, by making blind beggars of the workmen like myself, and throwing us on the parish in our old age. You're right, sir, they not only robs the men, but the ratepayers too. Well, sir, as I said, I come out of the hospital stone blind, and have been in darkness ever since, and that's near upon ten years ago. I often dream of colours, and see the most delightful pictures in the world. Nothing that I ever beheld with my eyes can equal them. They're so brilliant and clear and beautiful. I see then the features and figures of all my old friends, and I can't tell you how pleasurable it is to me. When I have such dreams, they so excite me that I'm ill all the next day. I often see, too, the fields, with the cows grazing on a beautiful green pasture, and the flowers, just at twilight-like, closing up their blossoms as they do. I never dream of rivers, nor do I ever remember seeing a field of corn in my visions. It's strange I never dreamt in any shape of the corn or the rivers, but maybe I didn't take so much notice of them as of the others. Sometimes I see the sky, and very often indeed there's a rainbow in it, with all kinds of beautiful colours. The sun is a thing I often dream about seeing, going down like a ball of fire at the close of the day. I never dreamt of the stars, nor the moon, it's mostly bright colours that I see. I have been under all the oculists I could hear of, Mr. Turnbull in Russell Square, but he did me no good. Then I went to Charing Cross under Mr. Guthrie, and he gave me a blind certificate, and made me a present of half a sovereign. He told me not to have my eyes tampered with again, as the optic nerve was totally decayed. Oh, yes, if I had all the riches in the world, I'd give them every one to get my sight back, for it's the greatest pressure to me to be in darkness. God help me, I know I'm a sinner, and believe I'm so afflicted on account of my sins. No, sir, it's nothing like when you shut your eyes. When I had my sight and closed mine, I remember I could still see the light through the lids, the very same as when you hold your hand up before the candle, but mine's far darker than that, pitch black. I see a dark mass like before me, and never any change everlasting darkness, and no chance of a light or shade in this world. But I feel consolated somehow now it is settled, although it's a very poor comfort after all. I go along the streets in great fear. If a baby have hold of me, I'm firm, but by myself I reel about like a drunken man. I feel very timid unless I have hold of something, not to support me, but to assure me I shall not fall. If I was going down your staircase, sir, I should be all right so long as I touch the banister. But if I missed that, I'm sure I should grow so giddy and nervous I should fall from the top to the bottom. After losing my sight, I found a great difficulty in putting my food into my mouth for a long time, six months or better, and I was obliged to have someone to guide my hand, for I used often to put the fork up to my forehead instead of my mouth. Shortly after my becoming quite blind, I found all my other senses much quickened, my hearing, feeling, and reckoning. I got to like music very much indeed. It seemed to elevate me, to animate me, and cheer me much more than it did before, and so much so now that when it ceases I feel duller than ever. It sounds as if it was in a wilderness to me. I can't tell why, but that's all I can compare it to, as if I was quite alone with it. My smell and taste is very acute. Note, he was given some violets to smell. End note. Oh, that's beautiful, he cried, very reviving indeed. Often of an evening I can see things in my imagination, and that's why I like to sit alone then, for of all the beautiful thoughts that ever a man possessed, there's none to equal a blind man's when he's by himself. I don't see my early home, but occurrences that as recently took place. I see them all plain before me in colours as vivid as if I had my sight again, 
and the people all dressed in the fashion of my time. The clothes seem to make a great impression on me, and I often sit and see in my mind master tailors trying a coat on a gentleman, and pulling it here and there. The figures keep passing before me like soldiers, and often I'm so took by them that I forget I'm blind, and turn my head round to look after them as they pass by me. But that sort of thinking would throw me into a melancholy. It's too exciting while it lasts, and then leaves me dreadful dull afterwards. I've got much more melancholy since my blindness. Before then I was not seriously given, but now I find great consolation in religion. I think my blindness is sent to try my patience and resignation, and I pray to the Almighty to give me strength to bear with my affliction. I was quick and hot-tempered before I was blind, but since then I have got less hasty-like. All other troubles appear nothing to me. Sometimes I revile against my affliction, too frequently, but that is at my thoughtless moments, for when I am calm and serious I feel thankful that the Almighty has touched me with his correcting rod, and then I am happy and at peace with all the world. If I had run my race and not been stopped, I might never have believed there was a God. My wife works at the sank work. She makes soldiers' coats. She gets one shilling and a penny for making one, and that's nearly a day and a half's work. Then she has to find her own trimmings, and they're a penny. It takes her sixteen hours to finish one garment, and the overwork at that is beginning to make her like as I was myself. If she takes up a book to read to me now, it's all like a dirty mass before her, and that's just as my sight was before I lost it altogether. She slaves hard to help me. She's anxious and willing, indeed too much so. If she could get constant work, she might perhaps make about seven shillings a week. But, as it is, her earnings are, take one week with another, not more than three shillings. Last week she earned five shillings, but that was the first job of work she'd had to do for two months. I think the two of us make, on an average, about eight shillings. And out of that there is three people to keep, our two selves and our boy. Our rent is two shillings and sixpence, so that after paying that we has about five shillings and sixpence left for food, firing and clothing for the whole of us. How we do it I can't tell, but I know we live very, very hard, mostly on pieces of bread that the men gives to me and my boy as we go round to the workshops. If he was any of us to fall ill, we must all go to the parish. If my boy was to go sick, I should be left without anyone to lead me about and that would be as bad as if I was laid up myself, and if anything was to happen to my wife, I'd be done clean altogether. But yet the Lord is very good, and we'd get out of that, I dare say. If anything was to drive me to the parish, I should lose all hopes of getting some help from the blind institutions, and so I dread the workhouse worse than all. I'd sooner die on the step of a door any time than go there and be what they call well-kept." I don't know why I should have a dislike to going there, but yet I do possess it. I do believe that any one that is willing to work for their bread hates a workhouse, for the workhouse coat is a slothful, degrading badge. After a man has had one on his back, he's never the same. I wouldn't go for an order for relief, so long as I could get a halfpenny loaf in twenty-four hours. If I could only get some friend to give me a letter of recommendation to Mr. Day's charity for the blind, I should be happy for the rest of my days. I could give the best of references to anyone who would take pity on me in my affliction. End of section 58。section 59 of London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew, volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Street Folk, part 59. The Public House Hawkers of Metal Spoons, etc. The Public House Hawkers are never so prosperous as those who confine their calling to private houses. They are often invited to partake of drink, are not the most industrious class of hawkers, and, to use their own language, are more frequently hard up than those who keep away from taproom selling. The profits of the small hawkers in public houses vary considerably. Some of them, when they have earned a shilling or two, are content to spend it before they leave the taproom, and so they lose both their stock and profit. I do not mean to infer that this is the case with the whole of the public house hawkers, for some among them strive hard to better their condition and occasionally succeed, but there are too many who are content to drawl out their existence by always suffering tomorrow to provide for itself. 
The man who gave me the routine of small hawker's business I found in a taproom in Ratcliffe Highway. He was hawking teaspoons, and all the stock he possessed was half a dozen. These he importuned me to purchase with great earnestness. He prayed of me to lay out a trifle with him. He had not taken a penny the whole day, he said, and had nothing to eat. "'What's much worse for such as me?' he added. "'I'm dying for a glass of rum.' I might have his teaspoons, he told me, at any price. If I would but pay for a glass of rum for him, they should be mine. I assured him some bread and cheese would do him more good, as he had not eaten anything that day, but still he would have the rum. With a trembling hand, he threw the liquor down his throat, smacked his lips, and said, "'That there dram has saved my life.' A few minutes afterwards, he sold his spoons to a customer for sixpence, and he had another glass of rum. "'Now,' said he, "'I'm all right for business. If I'd tuppence more, I could buy a dozen teaspoons, and I should earn a bob or two yet before I went to bed.' After this, he grew communicative and told me he was as good a hawker as there was in London, and he thought he could do more than any other man with a small stock. He had two or three times resolved to better himself, and had put in the pin, meaning he had made a vow to refrain from drinking, but he had broken out again, and gone on in his old course, until he had melted the whole of his stock, though twice it had, during his sobriety, amounted to five pounds, and was often worth between two pounds and three pounds. It was almost maddening when he came to his senses, he said, to find he had acted so foolishly. Indeed, it was so disheartening to discover all the result of his good resolutions dissipated in a moment that he declared he never intended to try again. After having drunk out his stock, he would, if possible, commence with half a dozen Britannia metal teaspoons, these cost him sixpence, and would sell for ninepence or a shilling. When one half-dozen were disposed of, he would procure another, adding a knife or a comb or two. If entirely destitute, he would stick a needle in a cork and request to know of the parties assembled in some tap-room if they wanted anything in the ironmongery line, though the needle was all the stock he had. This was done for the purpose of raising the wind, and by it he would be sure to obtain a glass or two of ale, if he introduced himself with his ironmongery establishment among the sailors. Sometimes he would manage to beg a few pence, and then he would purchase a knife, pair of braces, or half a dozen teaspoons, and begin to practice his trade in a legitimate manner. In answer to my inquiry, he said he had not always been a hawker. His father had been a soldier, and he had worked in the armory. His father had been discharged upon a pension, and he, the hawker, left the army with his parents. He had never enlisted while his father was a soldier, but he had since. His mother adopted the business of a hawker upon the receipt of his father's first quarter's pension, and then he used to accompany her on her rounds. With the pension and the mother's exertions, they managed to subsist tolerably well. Being the only child, I was foolishly spoilt by my parents, he said, and when I was a very young man, fifteen or sixteen, I became a great trouble to them. At eighteen, I enlisted in the Seventh Fusiliers, remained in the regiment three months, and then, at my own request, was bought off. My mother sold off most of her stock of goods to raise the money, twenty pounds. When I returned home, I could not think of trudging by my mother's side, as I had been used to do when carrying the goods, nor did I feel inclined to exert myself in any way for my own support. I considered my mother had a right to keep me without my working and she, poor thing, thought so too. I was not only supported in idleness, but my mother would give me many a shilling, though she could ill afford it, for me to spend with my companions. I passed most of my time in a skittle ground. I was not what you might term a skittle sharp, for I never entered into a plot to victimise any person, although I confess I have often bet upon the greenness of those who were silly enough to make wages that they could not possibly win. Sometimes after I had lost the trifle supplied me by my mother, I would return and be blackguard enough to assume the bully, unless my demands on her for a further supply were attended to. Poor thing, she was very meek, and with tears in her eyes she would grant my request. I often weep when I think how I treated her. Note, here the tears trickled down the man's cheek. End note. 
and yet, badly as I used her, in my heart I loved her very much. I got tired of the skittle grounds, in consequence of getting into a hobble relative to a skittle swindle. Some sharpers had obtained a flat. I was speculating in a small way, betting pennies and tuppences in such a manner as always to win. I was practising upon the flat, upon my own account, without having any connection with the others. They fleeced their dupe out of several pounds, and he made a row about it. The police interfered, and I was singled out as one of the gang. The principals were also apprehended. They got six months each, and I was accommodated with a month's board and lodging at the expense of the nation. I thought this at the time unjust, but I was as culpable as any of them, for at the time I only regretted I had not more money to stake larger wages, and envied the other parties who were making a better thing of the business than I was. When I came out of jail, my poor mother treated me as a martyr. She thought I was as innocent as a child. Shortly after my release from prison, my father died, and with him went the pension, of course. I was then obligated to do something for myself. A few shillings worth of goods only were procured, for my father's funeral and my extravagances had sadly crippled my mother's means. I behaved very well for a short time. My mother then was often ill, and she never recovered the death of my father. In about a year after my father died, I lost my mother. Our stock of goods had dwindled down to a very poor lot, and I was obligated to ask relief of the parish towards her funeral expenses. When all was over, the value of my goods and cash did not amount to twenty shillings. Ten years have elapsed since my mother's death, and I don't think I have ever been, during the whole period, sober for a month together. While I sat in this tap-room, I counted in the course of an hour and a quarter four hawkers of sheep's trotters who visited the place, three sellers of shrimps, pickled whelks, and periwinkles, two baked potato sellers, eight song hawkers, the same number with lucifer matches, and three with braces and so on. Not one of these effected a sale. Of the street sellers of jewellery. The jewellery now sold in the streets far exceeds both in cheapness and quality what was known even ten years ago. Fifty years ago, the jewellery itinerant trade was almost entirely, if not entirely, in the hands of Jews, who at any rate professed to sell really gold articles, and who asked large prices. But these traders have lost their command over this, as I have shown that they have over other street callings, as not a twelfth of the street jewellers are now Jews. A common trade among such street and country itinerant jewellers was in large watch seals, the bodies of which were of lead, more or less thickly plated with gold, and which were unsaleable even as old metal until broken to pieces, but not always saleable then. The street or itinerant trade was, for a long time afterwards, carried on only by those who were regularly licensed as hawkers and who preferred barter or swapping to actual sale, the barter being usually for other and more solid articles of the goldsmith's trade. The introduction of mosaic and other cheap modes of manufacturing quasi-gold ornaments brought about considerable changes in the trade, pertaining, however, more to the general manufacture than to that prepared for the streets. The itinerants usually carry their wares in boxes or cases which shut up close, and can be slung on the shoulder for conveyance, or hung round the neck for the purposes of sale. These cases are nearly all glazed. Within them the jewellery is disposed in such manner as, in the street seller's judgment, is the most attractive. A card of the larger brooches, or of cameos, often forms the centre and the other space is occupied with the shawl pins, with their globular tops of scarlet or other coloured glass. Rings, armlets, necklaces, a few earrings and eardrops, and sometimes a few side-combs, small medals for keepsakes, clasps, beads and bead purses, ornamental buttons for dresses, gilt buckles for wrist belts, thimbles and so on, constitute the street jeweller's stock in trade. The usual prices are from twopence to one shilling and sixpence, the price most frequently obtained for any article being threepence. It will be seen from the enumeration of the articles that the stock is such as is required for women's wear, and women are now almost the sole customers of the street jewellers. In my time, sir, said one elderly street trader, or rather, when I was a boy, 
and in my uncle's time, for he was in jewellery, and I helped him at times, quite different sorts of jewellery was sold, and quite different prices was had. What's a high figure now was a low figure then. I've known children's coral and bells in my uncle's stock. Well, I don't know whether it was real coral or not. And big watch keys with coloured stones in the centre on them, such as I've seen old gents keep spinning round when they was talking, and big seals and watch chains. There weren't no guards then, as I remember. And there was plated fruit knives, silver, as near as a toucher, and silver pencils. Note, pencil cases, end note and gilt lockets to give your sweetheart your hair in for keepsakes. Lord bless you, times is turned upside down. The disposition of the street stalls is somewhat after the same fashion as that in the itinerant's box, with the advantage of a greater command of space. Some of the stalls, one in Tottenham Court Road I may instance, and another in Whitechapel, make a great show. I did not hear of any in this branch of the jewellery trade who had been connected with it as working jewellers. I heard of two journeymen watchmakers and four clockmakers now selling jewellery, but often with other things, such as eyeglasses, in the street, but that is all. The street mass selling jewellery in town and country are, I believe, composed of the various classes who constitute the street traders generally. Of the nature of his present trade and of the class of his customers, I had the following account from a man of twelve years' experience in the vending of street jewellery. It's not very easy to tell, sir, he said, what sells best, for people begins to suspect everything, and seems to think they're done if they give thruttons for an agate brooch and finds out it ain't set in gold. I think agate is about the best part of the trade now. It seems a stone as is easy imitated. Cornelians, too, ain't so bad in brooches. People likes the colour, but not what they was, and not up to agates. But nothing is up to what it once was, not in the least. Sell twice as much, when you can, which often stands over till tomorrow, come never, and get half the profit. I don't expect very much from the great exhibition. They sends goods so cheap from Germany, they'll think anything dear in London if it's only at German prices. I think it's a mistake to fancy that the cheaper a jewellery article is, the more you'll sell of it. You won't. People's of opinion, at least that's my notion of it, that it's so common everybody'll have it, and so they won't touch it. It's Thames water, sir, against beer, is poor low-priced jewellery against tidy and fair-priced. But then the low-priced has now ruined the other sorts, for they're all thought to go under the same umbrella, all of a sort, one shilling or a penny. Why, as to who's the best customers, that depends on where you pitches your pitch, or works your round, and whether you are known, or are merely a upstart. But I can tell you, sir, who's been my best customers, and is yet, but not so good as they was, and that's women of the town, and mostly, for I've tried most places, about Ratcliffe Highway, Whitechapel, Mile End Road, Bethnal Green, and Oxford Street. The sailors' gals is the best of all, but almost all of them is very particular, and some is uncommon tiresome. I'm afeard, they says, this colour don't suit my complexion. It's too light, or it's too dark. How does that ring show on my finger? I've known some of the fat and fair ones, what had been younger but would be older, say, let me have a necklace of bright black beads. Them things shows best with the fat uns, but in general them poor creatures is bad judges of what becomes them. The things they're the most particular of all in is necklaces. Amber and pearl sells most. I have them from sixpence to one shilling and sixpence. I never get more than one shilling and sixpence. Cornelian necklaces is most liked by children, and most bought for them. I've trusted the women of the town, and trust them still. One young woman in Shadwell took a fancy that other week for a pearl necklace. It became her so, which it didn't, and offered to pay me sixpence a week for it, if I wouldn't sell it away from her. The first week she paid sixpence the second nothing, and next week the full tip, cause her jack had come home. I never lost a halfpenny by the women. Yes, they pays you a fairish price, but nothing more. Sometimes they've beat me down a penny and has said, it's all the money I has. It's not very long ago that one of them offered me a fine gold watch, which I could have bought at any price, for I saw she knew nothing of what it was worth. I never do anything that way. I believe a very few in my line does for they can't give the prices the rich fences can. 
It's common enough for them gals to ask any street jeweller they knows how much a watch ought to pop for or to sell for afore they tries it on. But it isn't they as tries it on, sir. They gets some respectable old lady or old gent to do that for them. I've had cigars and cavendish of them, such as seamen had left behind them. You know, sir, I've never given money, only jewellery for it. Plenty of shopkeepers is glad to buy it of me, and not at a bad price. They asks no questions, and I tells them no lies. One reason why these gals buy free is that when the jewellery gets out of order or out of fashion, they can fling it away and get fresh. It's so cheap. When I've had no money on a day until I has sold to these women, I've oft enough said, God bless em. Earrings is hardly any go now, sir. Nothing to what they was. They're going out. The penny jewellery's little good. It's only children what buys, or gets it bought for them. I sell most of brooches from threepence to sixpence, very seldom higher, and bracelets. They calls them armlets now, at the same price. I buys all my goods at a swag shop. There's no other market. Watch guards was middling sale, both silver and gold, or washed white and washed yellow, and the swags made money in them. But instead of a shilling, they're not to be sold at a joey now, watch guards ain't, if a man patters ever so. I am informed that there are not less than one thousand individuals who all buy their jewellery at the London swag shops and sell it in the streets, with or without other articles, but principally without, and that of this number five hundred are generally in London and its suburbs, including such places as Gravesend, Woolwich and Greenwich. Of these traders about one-tenth are women, and in town about three-fifths are itinerant, and the others stationary. One half or thereabouts of the women are the wives of street sellers, the others trade on their own account. A few swap jewellery for old clothes, with either the mistress or the maids. Four or five, when they see a favourable opportunity, offer to tell any servant maid her fortune. Buy this beautiful agate brooch, my dear, the woman'll say, and I'll only charge you one shilling and sixpence. A German thing, sir, costing her seven farthings, one street jeweller informed me and I'll tell you your fortune into the bargain. One old hand calculated that when a street jeweller could display fifty shillings worth of stock, he could clear all the year round fifteen shillings a week. People, said this man, as far as I've known the streets, like to buy of what they think is a respectable man, and seemingly well to do. They feel safe with him. Those, however, who cannot boast so large a stock of jewellery as fifty shillings worth, may only clear ten shillings instead of fifteen shillings weekly. One trader thought that the average earnings of his fraternity might be taken at twelve shillings a week. Another, and both judged from their own experience, thought ten shillings and sixpence was high enough. Calculating then at a weekly profit of ten shillings and sixpence, and a receipt of eighteen shillings per individual, we find £23,400 expended in the street trade, including the sales at Gravesend, Woolwich and Greenwich, where, both places being resorted to by pleasure-seekers and seamen, the trade is sometimes considerable. Watches, which are now almost unknown in a regular street trade, there forming an occasional part of it. Of the Peddler Jewellers I have heard a manufacturer of Birmingham jewellery assert that one pound of copper was sufficient to make ten pounds worth of jewellery. Consequently, the material to provide the unmanufactured stock-in-trade of a wholesale dealer in Birmingham jewellery is not over-expensive. It may be imagined, then, that the peddlers who hawk jewellery do not invest a very great capital in the wares they sell. There are some few, however, who have very valuable stocks of goods, peddlers though they be, this trade is principally pursued by Jews, and to a great extent, especially in a small way, by foreign Jews. The Jews are, I think, more attentive to the wants of their poorer brethren than other people, and instead of supplying them with trifling sums of money, which must necessarily soon be expended, they give them small quantities of goods, so that they may immediately commence foraging for their own support. Many of these poor Jews, when provided with their stock of merchandise, can scarcely speak a word of English, and few of them know but little respecting the value of the goods they sell. They always take care to ask a good price, leaving plenty of room for abatement. I heard one observe that they could not easily be taken in by being overcharged, 
for according what they paid for the article, they fixed the price upon it. Some of these men, notwithstanding their scanty knowledge of the trade at starting, have eventually become excellent judges of jewellery. Some of them, moreover, have acquired riches in it. Indeed, from the indomitable perseverance of the Hebrew race, success is generally the result of their untiring industry. If once you look at the goods of a Jew peddler, it is not an easy matter to get out of his clutches. It is not for want of perseverance if he does not bore and tease you, until at length you are glad to purchase some trifle to get rid of him. One of my informants tells me he is acquainted with several Jews who now hold their heads high as merchants, and are considered very excellent judges of the wares they deal in, who originally began trading with but a small stock of jewellery, and that a charitable donation. As well as Jews, there are Irishmen who deal in such commodities. The peddler generally has a mahogany box bound with brass, and which he carries with a strap hung across his shoulder. When he calls at a house, an inquiry is made whether there is any old silver or gold to dispose of. I will give you a full price for any such articles. If the lady or gentleman accosted seems to be likely to buy, the box is immediately opened, and a tempting display of gold rings, chains, scent boxes, lockets, brooches, breastpins, bracelets, silver thimbles, and so on and so on, are exposed to view. All the eloquence the peddler can command is now brought into play. The jewellery is arranged about the persons of his expected customers to the best advantage. The peddler says all he can think of to enhance their sale. He will chop and change for anything they may wish to dispose of. Any old clothes, books, or useless lumber may be converted into ornaments for the hair or other parts of dress. The Irish peddler mostly confines his visits to the vicinity of large factories where there are many girls employed. These he supplies with earrings, necklaces, shawl pins, brooches, lockets, and so on, which are bought wholesale at the following prices. Earrings and drops at from three shillings and sixpence to twelve shillings per dozen pairs. The threepenny earring is a neat little article, says my informant, and those sold at a shilling each, wholesale, are gorgeous-looking affairs. Many of the latter have been disposed of by the peddlers at one pound the pair, and even a greater price. Necklaces are from five shillings to one pound per dozen. Lockets may be purchased wholesale at from two shillings to ten shillings per dozen. Guard chains, German silver, are four shillings per dozen. Gilt, heavy-looking waistcoat chains, six shillings per dozen, and all other articles are equally low in price. The peddler jeweller can begin business, respectably, for two pounds. His box costs him seven shillings and sixpence. Half a dozen pairs of earrings of six different sorts, three shillings, half a dozen lockets, various, one shilling and ninepence, half a dozen guard chains, two shillings, half a dozen shawl brooches, two shillings and sixpence, one dozen breast pins, different kinds, three shillings, one dozen finger rings of various descriptions, three shillings and sixpence, half a dozen brooches at fourpence each, two shillings, one dozen necklaces, a variety at six shillings, three silver pencil cases at one shilling and ninepence each, five shillings and threepence, half a dozen waistcoat chains, three shillings, one silver toothpick at one shilling and sixpence. These make altogether two pounds. If the articles are arranged with taste and seeming care, as if they were very valuable, with jeweller's wadding under each and stuck on pink cards and so on, while the finger rings are inserted in the long, narrow, velvet-lined groove of the box, and the other valuables well spread about the little portable shop, they may be made to assume a very respectable and almost rich appearance. Many who now have large establishments commenced life with much less stock than is here mentioned. The Jews, I do not think, continues my informant, are the best salesmen, and the fact of their being Israelites is in many instances a bar to their success. Country people especially are afraid of being taken in by them. The importunities and appeals of the Hebrew, however, are far more urgent than any other tradesman, and they always wait where they think there's the slightest chance of effecting a sale, until the door is slammed in their faces. I believe there are not at the present time many, especially small traders, who deal exclusively in jewellery. They mostly add other small and light articles, such as fancy cutlery, side combs, and so on. 
There may, at a rough guess, be five hundred of them travelling the country. Half the number are poor foreign Jews, a quarter are Jews who have perhaps followed the same calling for years, and the remaining quarter a mixture of Irish and English, with a small preponderance of Irishmen. All these swap their goods for old gold and silver, and frequently realise a large sum by changing the base metal for the sterling article. Their goods are always sold as being gold or silver. If asked whether a particular article be gold, they reply, It's jeweller's gold. Is this ring gold? inquires the customer, taking one from the box. No, ma'am, I wouldn't deceive you, is the answer. That is not gold, but here is one, adds the peddler, taking up one exactly of the same description, and which cost the same price, which is of a similar shape and fashion, and the best jeweller's gold that is made. The profits of the peddler jewellers it is almost impossible to calculate, for they will sell at any price upon which the smallest amount of profit can be realised. The foreign Jews especially will do this, and it is not an unusual circumstance for one of these men to ask five shillings for an article which originally cost them threepence, and which they will eventually sell for fourpence. In London there are about two hundred hawkers of jewellery who visit the public houses, but few of these have boxes. They invite customers by displaying some chains in their hands, or having one or two arranged in front of their waistcoats, while the smaller articles are carried in their waistcoat pockets. The class of persons who patronise the public house hawkers are those who visit the taprooms of taverns, and countrymen in the vicinity of Smithfield upon market days. Note, one of the hawkers tells me that they succeed better upon the haymarket days than at the cattle sales, for the butchers, they say, are too fly for them. End note. Sailors are among their best customers, but the coster girls are very fond of drop earrings and coral beads. The sailors, however, give the best prices of all. I am told that the quantity of old gold and silver which the country peddlers obtain in exchange for their goods is astonishing, and there have been occasions on which a peddler has been enriched for life by one single transaction of barter. Some old and unfashionable piece of jewellery that they received for their goods has been composed of costly stones which have lain by for years, and of which the peddler's customer was unacquainted with the value. The more respectable jewellery peddlers put up at the better class of public houses, and, even after their day's travels are over, they still have an eye to business. They open the box upon the table of the taproom where they are lodging, and, under the pretense of cleaning or arranging their goods, temptingly display their glittering stock. The barmaid, kitchen-maid, the landlady's daughter, or perhaps the landlady herself, admires some ornaments which the peddler declares would become them vastly. He hangs a necklace upon the neck of one of them, holds a showy earring and drop to the ear of another, facetiously inquires of the girls whether they are not likely to want something of this sort shortly, as he holds up first a wedding ring and then a baby's coral, or else he exhibits a ring set with turquoise or pearls and small diamonds in a cluster to the landlady, and tries it on her finger and by such arts a sale that will cover his expenses is generally effected. There is one peculiarity these men have when bartering their goods. A worn-out ornament of jewellery is brought to them, and although it be brass, the peddler never attempts to undeceive the possessor if he finds it is considered to be genuine. Of course, he never gives cash for such articles, but he offers a large price in barter. I will take ten shillings for this ring, and allow you five shillings for the old one, says the peddler. It would never do to say the ornament was not gold. The customer bought it years ago for such, and no one ever disputed its being the precious metal. Should our peddler do so, he might as well shut up shop immediately. The lady would be angry and suspicious. Neither would she believe him, but rather suspect that he wanted only to cheat her. Consequently, the peddler barters, obtains the old ring or some other article, and five shillings for his commodity, and though the article he has taken in exchange is worth only a few pence, he very likely profits to the amount of two hundred per cent upon the cash received. 
the peddlers of lesser consequence put up at humble private or public houses and some of them at the common lodging houses those who have only small stocks confine their visits to farmhouses and villages end of section fifty nine